our panelist uh, or i'll hand over it to our chairperson dr ak grover and dr grover may i request you to please invite our first speaker i now hand over the virtual dais to you thank you good evening or afternoon or morning to everyone and i welcome our korean guests we are grateful on behalf of the all india ophthalmological society to the korean ophthalmology group for having joined us to give us a lot of prestige and give a lot of scientific value to our program we are, i would like to welcome my coaches dr m kim and dr choi and um, we have a very interesting session lined up today we have all the specialties represented we have oculoplastic presentations we have glaucoma presentations we have cataract presentations and we have important vitreo retina presentations so it will be a wonderful comprehensive session for our audience and i'm grateful to the korean ophthalmological <laughs> society for having participated in this strength with this strong scientific program i'll now hand over to my other co-chair persons to conduct the session and uh, to call the first speaker i just uh, want to welcome everybody especially from korean ophthalmological society for collaborating with all india ophthalmological society dr namrata is our uh, chief organizer she is the honorary general secretary of the all india ophthalmological society and she <laughs> has been the soul and heart behind this ent entire international ophthalmology and clave and has been working day and night with all her might for making this a great success thank you thank you sir and thank you all of you for uh, making this happen and for being a part of this uh, session thank you and thank you sir for being there so our first speaker will be dr chang q lee and i'll request uh, our uh, korean colleagues uh, who are chairpersons to kindly keep introducing the other speakers and uh, calling them on thank you very much dr uh, chang uh, lee please uh, start your screen share okay hello my name is chang yu lee i'm working for ulsan university hospital Uh, it's a really honor for me to give my speech at AIOS. Today, uh, I want to share my idea about a uh, rising area of glaucoma surgery in Korea, especially mixed gen. This is my disclose. Recently, there is a global tendon and movement of K culture like this picture. K-music, K-drama, and so on. So, I want to introduce K-glaucoma surgery mix today. First of all, let's talk about history of glaucoma surgery. In 1960A, Keynes first did a standard technique for filtering surgery, modern trabeculectomy. So, in uh, 2018, there was a 50th anniversary lecture of trabeculectomy in European Glaucoma Society. In case of Sean Topi, in 1969, Anthony Molteno described the first glaucoma drainage tube device, Molteno 3. These uh, conventional glaucoma surgery were used of 50 years as standard surgery, though this surgery have many different kind of uh, complication which can affect to success rate of surgery and life of quality of patient. So many scientists and eye doctors try to develop new glaucoma devices which can low IOP effectively but have less post-operative complications. This is what we call minimal invasive glaucoma surgery mix. In the beginning of mix, there was three unique characteristics. Mix should be performed via parasynthesis 
and mixed should be done uh, our internal approach and conjunctiva should not touch but as time goes by there were some modulations and in 2015 mix was introduced a type of low IOP using an outflow mechanism with either on our internal or our external approach and associated with little or no scleral dissection and minimal or no conjunctival manipulation. There are four uh, main target sites of mix, Schlumpf's kernel, uh, subconjunctiva, ciliary body, and supracolloidal space. Mix using supracolloidal, ciliary body as target site uh, as a follow, and using subconjunctiva and enhanced Schlumpf's kernel as target site are also follow and especially uh, I want to speak about Gen because this is mainly using mix device in Korea. Now I will introduce Gen implantation. Someone said Gen is out of glaucoma surgery using by harnessing the principle of fluid dynamics. It is made by 6 mini porcin de derived gelatin. In the beginning of invention, there are three different sizes of lumen. Now only 45 micrometer lumen of gen is available to use in clinical field because 45 lumen of gen can be kept IOP between 6 to 8 mm mercury. Let's see the video how I do gen surgery. Max on uh, superior nasal conjunctiva 2 mm apart from limbus and side port incision was done uh, 60 and 90 degree apart from main incision. After then main incision was done at implantemporal side. Check the inject and uh, I usually uh, inject 0.02% mitomycin as subconjunctive space and advanced t inject to angle and I try to position tip of inject to non-functional trabecular meshwork and check it using gonial lens. When tip of inject was positioned at ideal side, then I advanced gently inject to subconjunctiva space. Meanwhile, left hand pulled eye to expose surgical uh, field widely. When Chen was located, I can control length of gen with smooth forceps. And this video came from Professor Kim who is working for Seoul National University and one of my colleagues. And this video shows how to do our internal gen surgery. Let's see the movie. A dissect and open conjunctiva with vesicle scissors and peel up with Mitomycin goes and 2 mm apart from limbus injected was moved forward to anterior chamber and gently forward then finally picks the tip of gen with Likely. As you see, Gen surgery is very fast and very short post-operative measurement period. When we compare surgery time, trabeculectomy, and Gen, the total time of Gen was 16 minutes, but the procedure of trabeculectomy at 60 minutes was just sclerotomy. And total time of trabeculectomy was 16 minutes. 
And one paper which compared result between gene and trigeminectomy showed there was no significant difference of success rate between two groups. But later post-operative complication was low in gen group compared to trabeculectomy. Let's see the, my case. My patient was a 34 male person. He already two, two times trabeculectomy at other hospital. And he was treated with maximum medical treatment. But IOP of his eye was so high, especially right eye. And there was no healthy conjunctiva except just the supranasal area. So I decided to do gen surgery. After that, IOP of right eye was under 10 millimercury over 6 months and nice blab. Therefore, uh, mix can be uh, minimal or microinvasive glaucoma surgery. And it has a safety profile and rapid recovery and minimal trauma to target tissues. So currently, it is indicated in mild and moderate glaucoma patient. But uh, there are several considerations because uh, there are some argument about ideal position of Jan until now. And there may be clinical problem because blab after Jan uh, sometimes was formed huge and superficial and just nasal side. Uh, for the small woman, uh, sometimes the tube obstruction with the material can be a problem. And other reports also said same issues. Superficial located gen tip made some serious clinical problem to be exposed, and this can cause endophthalmitis. Due to inevitable limit of mix, we uh, recommend put uh, mix and match use and modulate itself. And we are also need long-term randomized uh, clinical trial result of mix. In summary, it's true that mix is raising area in glaucoma uh, surgery in Korea, and we should fully understand gen itself. And Surgery should prepare backup procedure as the next step. Thank you for your attention. Sir, may I request you to please invite our next speaker, please? Dr. Ashok. I think uh, Dr. Grover is probably nearby. Uh, meanwhile, if I may invite the next speaker, our Thank next Dr. speaker Dr. would be Dr. Jihun uh -huh, uh, from Korea. She'll be speaking about epiretinal membrane. Uh, when should we operate? Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank AIOS once again for inviting us and especially uh, Professor Sharma for putting together this wonderful symposium. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ji Yunan from Borame Medical Center. Today, I will be talking about epiretinal membrane. When should we operate? Epiretinal membrane is a common macular disorder and essentially cellular proliferation on the inner retinal surface. It has been called various names in the past, such as premacular fibroplasia, macular pucker, cellophane maculopathy, and premacular gliosis. The overall prevalence has been reported to be between 7 to 11.8 percent in large-sized population studies such as the Beaver Dam Eye Study and Blue Mountains Eye Study. 
Increased use of OCT has understandingly contributed to the increased detection of ERM. A systematic review published in 2017 reported age standardized prevalence of ERM to be about 9.1%. This table shows the prevalence broken down into different subgroups, demonstrating there can be some differences according to the analysis setting. The major risk factor for ERM is increased age, since PVD, the main etiology for ERM, is known to increase with age. Cataract surgery is also a well-known risk factor, since cataract surgery itself can induce PVD. A meta-analysis was done for various risk factors. Increased age and female sex were significant risk factors, whereas surprisingly smoking showed decreased risk. The main pathology underlying ERM is not clear, but pathological vitreo retinal separation and ensuing cellular proliferation are suspected to be the main instigators. Collagen fibers making up the vitreous cortex are adhering to the internal limiting membrane, also the basement membrane of the Mueller cells. When PVD occurs, some remnant cortex and hyalocytes are activated on the retina surface and Mueller cells migrate through small tissue defects and also proliferate, all forming ERM. On separation of the vitreous, the collagen fibrillae realign to form the posterior hyaloid membrane. Some of the vitreous cortex may remain adherent to the basement membrane and become activated with hyalocytes to form a membrane. A clinical grading system of ERM was proposed by GAS based on color fundus photographs. Grade 0 was no underlying retinal distortion. Grade 1 was irregular wrinkling of the inner retina. And grade 2 was obscuration of underlying retinal vessels with marked full thickness retinal distortion. The evolution of spectral domain OCT has enabled us to obtain high-resolution cross-sectional images of the retina. Many investigators have looked at changes in retinal morphology on OCT and its correlation with visual acuity. One study broke down retinal morphology into the presence of any abnormalities in the cone outer segment tip, the IOS-OS junction, the ELM, ILM, and the presence or absence of a foveal bulge and pit. They found that on multiple regression analyses to determine independent predictors of visual acuity, the factors representative of outer retinal morphologic changes were the significant factors. Recent studies have shifted their focus to changes occurring in the inner retina with a new term of ectopic inner foveal layers, or EIFL, defined as the presence of a continuous hypo-reflective or hyper-reflective band extending from the inner nuclear layer and inner plexiform layer across the foveal region and visible on all OCT scans centered on the fovea. One study proposed a new staging system with the incorporation of EIFL as one of the main differentiating factors. Investigators have reported EIFL staging to be predictive of visual outcome after surgery, saying earlier EIFL stages are associated with better visual outcome and that when post-operative anatomic improvements were analyzed, those in the earliest stages showed anatomic improvement at one year, whereas those in stages 3 and 4 showed less improvement demonstrating the majority of patients to remain in the same anatomic state even after surgery. The natural history of ERM has also been studied, with the Blue Mountains Eye Study showing ERM progression in 29%, stable in 39%, during five years of follow-up using color fundus photographs. 
In the era of OCT, about 17 to 39 percent have been reported to show progression. This table shows a summary of the natural course of ERM. The majority demonstrate relatively good visual acuity of over 2040, and 16 to up to 43 percent worsened anatomically. 8 to 24 percent of patients were converted to surgery with spontaneous resolution in 6 to 26 percent. As we all know, the mere presence of ERM does not mean surgery is necessary. Traditional indicators for the need of surgical intervention have been reduced visual acuity or the presence of metamorphopsia and anisoconia. The development of small gauge vitrectomy and technical and instrumental improvements are a few factors which may induce surgeons to be more active towards surgery in ERM patients. Factors which have been reported to be predictors of surgical intervention are higher baseline central macular thickness, presence of external limiting membrane and ellipsoid zone disruption, loss of foveal contour, and metamorphopsia and visual symptoms at presentation. I would like to share two cases before I wrap up. The first is a 71-year-old female patient who was referred to me from a glaucoma colleague at my hospital. The patient had moderate degree cataract with visual acuities between 0.6 and 0.7 in both eyes. Fundus examination had revealed mild epiretinal membrane in the nasal paraphobia with hardly any changes in the foveal contour. So I recommended that he go ahead with just the cataract surgery. After six months, there was mild increase in central macular thickness. And after one and a half years, her visual acuity remained excellent with mild thickening of the ERM area. The second case is a 60-year-old male who presented with decreased visual acuity in the left eye. His visual acuity was 0.6 in his left eye, and he had only mild cataract. Fundus examination and OCT showed ERM over the macular area with loss of the foveal pit, disrupted retinal layers, presence of the ectopic inner foveal layer, but relatively intact outer retinal morphology. Cataract removal, vitrectomy, ERM peeling, and intravitreal triamcinolone injection were done. Over the course of two years, retinal thickness decreased and retinal layers became more visible. His visual acuity improved to 0.9. Now to wrap up, ERM is a common macular disorder common in the elderly due to the increased incidence of age-related PVD. High-resolution imaging using OCT has contributed to not only increased detection of ERM, but also the identification of various prognostic biomarkers predictive of visual outcome. Timing of surgical intervention still remains a topic of debate. The surgeon should consider the patient's subjective symptoms, assess visual function, not just visual acuity, and obtain objective analysis of changes in retinal morphology using OCT imaging, and also discuss with the patient in detail the benefits and limitations of surgery before making a decision. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, Professor An. Now we move on to next speaker. Our next speaker is Jin Wu Han, who is currently working in Gangnam Separate Hospital, Yonsei University. His topic is Phobia Hypoplasia, How to Differentiate the Codes. Dr. Han, please.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank all India Ophthalmological Society and Korean Ophthalmological Society for allowing me to present this talk. Today, topic is phobia hypoplasia, how to differentiate the cause. Phobia is 1.5 millimeter area in the center of the retina, which is composed of packed cone cells. This area is so important because it has central role in sharp vision. Abnormal development of phobia can be caused by several inherited eye diseases. Patient with phobia hyperplasia has reduced visual acuity, and most of patients with phobia hyperplasia have infantile nystagmus. These representative images are normal morphology of the phobia. Normal phobia has dark phobia reflex at the center of the retina. And you, when you look at the OCT, uh, there is a small group which is called as phobia pit. And there is extrusion of inner retinal layer in the center. And there is outer nuclear rail widening and outer segment lengthening is shown here. The development of phobia is continuous process which begins early mid gestation to age of 8 to 12 years. Uh, when you get image here and uh, at the birth, the outer nuclear ray is small. And when the age increases, the outer nuclear widening is uh, more evident. Well, several inherited eye diseases cause phobia hypoplasia. First, you must rule out phobia hypoplasia caused by extreme prematurity. And ocular albinism and ocular cutaneous albinism are most common cause of phobia hypoplasia. And paxis related phenotype is also common cause. Rarely, SLC38A8 fonda and FRMD7 related infantile nystagmus also cause phobia hypoplasia. This is classic presentation of phobia hypoplasia caused by extreme prematurity. And retinopathy of prematurity was well treated by intravitreal avastin injection. And we got an OCT scan when the patient is 8 years old and he had grade 1b phobia hypoplasia. Phobia hypoplasia means maldevelopment of the phobia. Fundus examination is the first step to diagnose this patient. Dilated fundus examination by indirect ophthalmoscopes or fundus photography revealed both of phobia reflex. This is OCT image of phobia hypoplasia. You can see here there is no phobia pit and Extrusion of inner retinal layer is absent, and no outer nuclear widening was noted, and outer segment lengthening is lost in this patient. And wide fundus photography is also a valuable tool to detect phobia hypoplasia. When you look at the images taken by infrared reflectance, optus wide fundus photography. There is concentric ring marks, which looks like fingerprint. And this sign is called concentric macular ring sign. Uh, this sign is evident in all patients with phobia hypoplasia. Phobia hypoplasia can be graded into four categories from grade one to grade four, based on the presence or absence of these four features. In patients with grade one phobia hypoplasia, only absence of extrusion of inner plexiform layer was found. If there is no phobia pit, it can be classified as grade 2. If outer segment lengthening was lost in addition to above findings, it is grade 3. And if there is no outer nuclear layer widening, phobia hyperplasia is graded as 4. Uh, this is a recent paper published by International Phobia Hypoplasia Investigator Group, including our country. 
among 907 patients with confirmed molecular diagnosis. Most common causes of foveal hypoplasia were albinism, followed by POX6, SLC38A8, FRMD7. Oculocutaneous albinism and POX6 had wide variety of phobia hypoplasia from grade 1 to grade 4. However, in patients with Hermansky Prudrach syndrome, ocular albinism, SLC38A8, only grade 3 and grade 4 phobia hypoplasia was found. Genetic diagnosis is an essential part of investigation. Uh, before pursuing genetic analysis, uh, you must rule out the genetic cause of phobia hypoplasia. Uh, so if patient ha with phobia hypoplasia had history of prematurity or received any radio protocolation or cryotherapy due to ROP and genetic testing should be avoided. And most of patients with POXIS variant had an iridia or partial absence of iris. So clinical diagnosis is very easy. And in this patient, variable degree of phobia hyperplasia is almost accompanied. Patient with ocular albinism had normal skin color. Only fundus had depigmentation. This condition is inherited as X-linked and this diagnosis is found in most of cases. Now, this is 9 years old girl. Her best best corrected visual acuity was 20 to 100 in the right eye and 20 to 160 in the right eye. She had infantile nystagmus and deep pigmented fundi and phobia hypoplasia. Uh, molecular diagnosis revealed by allergic SLC is 45A2 pathogenic variant and diagnosis of cutaneous albinism is hard to miss. Before diagnosing oculocutaneous albinism, syndromic oculocutaneous albinism should be always considered. Uh, this patient had uh, coagulation of normality and immunodeficiency, and some patients with Hermansky Pudrak syndrome uh, eventually progressed to pulmonary fibrosis. So uh, it is really important to distinct this. Uh, distinguish this condition from non-syndromic non oculocutaneous albinism. Uh, lastly, SLC38AA, uh, Fonda, Phobia hypoplasia, optic nerve decussation, and anterior segment dysgenesis is autosomal recessive inherited eye diseases. Most patients with biallelic SLC38AA variants had grade 3 or grade 4 phobia hypoplasia. Uh, in minor cases, some anterior segment dysgenesis was noted. To summarize, phobia hypoplasia is one of the important causes of childhood blindness. Uh, most patients with phobia hypoplasia had infantile onset nystagmus. To make a differential diagnosis, recognition of skin color, iris configuration, fundus pigmentation, and grade of phobia hypoplasia hypoplasia is important. Although some cases are easy to diagnose without genetic testing, but accurate molecular diagnosis is usually needed. Moreover, diagnosis of syndromic ocular cutaneous albinism is, is really important because they have tendency to bleeding and some patients with Hermansky Pudrak syndrome eventually lead to pulmonary fibrosis. Thank you. Well, thank you for the nice presentation of Prof Professor Han. Actually, the, the Ovier hypoplasia is very rare condition, so it is hard to meet those kind of patients in our daily clinic. Based on your excellent presentation, we learn a lot from uh, about the phobia hypoplasia. Our next speaker is the <clears throat> Wan Gyeong Jo. She currently working in Daejeon Saint Mary Hospital Catholic University. The topic of the, her presentation is rescue drip droopy eye eyelid patient. Uh, 
Dr. Cho, please. Uh, before Dr. Uh, Hello, starts, can I uh, ask a question from Professor Han, please, if you don't mind? Sure. Yeah. Uh, excellent uh, presentation, Professor Han. Uh, as Dr. Uh, said, we learned a lot from your presentation. I had one question. You mentioned about the concentric ring sign uh, in patients with foveal hypoplasia on ultra wide field imaging. And do you think it is something to do with the hypoplasia per se, or it is due to the nystagmus which is present in these patients? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, patient with foveal hypoplasia without nystagmus, uh, this concentric macular ring sign is seen. So it is not due to nystagmus. It may be, it is uh, the mural cells and uh, not the mural cells, the helmet layer is radially uh, located, but uh, the inner retina is absent in normal phobia, but in, phobia, uh, in patient with phobia hypoplasia, inner retina is uh, present in the central phobia. So, it may be related to uh, this uh, high biorefrigence of the Hanla layer in the phobia area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, from the panelist or from the others, is there any other question or comment for our three previous presenters? Or can we move on to the next speaker? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Kim, we can move on to the next speaker, please. Thank okay. you. Okay. Dr. Joe, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Viviana Wong Kyung Cho from Kathleen University of Korea. Thank you for having us as speakers today. I hope our friendship between Korean and All India Ophthalmological Society keep last for a long time in the future. My presentation title is Rescue Droopy Eyelid Patients. We see various types of droopy eyelid patients in our clinic. Natural raising ptosis, asymmetric ptosis like in the middle photo, or even someone have difficulties in eye opening because of blepharospasm. Those patients progress their droopy eyelid symptoms slowly, so they are somewhat aware of their totic eyelid status. However, we are embarrassed when we encounter such a kind of sudden moonsetosis. Then, to rescue those droopy eyelid patients, we need to know what muscles and what nerves are involved to open our eyelids. Let's take a look at the muscle first. There are three kinds of eyelid retractor muscles for the upper eyelid opening. The main eyelid retractor is levator muscle. It arises from the sphenoid bone lesser wing at the orbital apex and passes forward parallel to the superior rectus above the eyeball. After it passes the Wittner ligament, the levator muscle is changed to upper neurosis and continues downward to its insertion near the marginal tarsal border. The levator is a skeletal muscle which you can voluntarily control. The second eyelid retractor is Müller's muscle. It is responsible for the involuntary upper eyelid elevation about one to two millimeters. The Müller's muscle is sandwiched between the conjunctiva posteriorly and the levator upper neurosis anteriorly, and it is a smooth muscle, which you cannot control voluntarily. The third eyelid retractor is the frontalis muscle. This muscle leaves the eyebrow and acts as a weak retractor of the eyelid. Next, let's take a look at the nerves. The third cranial nerve, oculomotor nerve, arises in the midbrain, passes the cavernous sinus. It enters the orbit from the cavernous sinus through annulus gene as two branches. The superior branch innervates the superior rectus and the levator muscle. The inferior branch sends fibers to the inferior rectus, medial rectus, the inferior oblique. And the sympathetic nerves innervates the mullous muscle. 
The annulus gene is a fibrous band continuous with periorbital, and four rectus muscle arise from the annulus gene. The annulus gene divides the superior orbital fissure into the superior and the inferior part. The red circle is the annulus gene, and you can see the superior branch and the inferior branch of the third cranial nerve, and the sixth cranial nerve pass the inferior part of the superior orbital fissure. The frontalis muscle is innervated by the temporal branch of the facial nerve. In summary, among the eyelid retractors, levator muscle is the main to lift the eyelid, innervated by the superior branch of the third cranial nerve, and it is a voluntary muscle. Mullous muscle is innervated by the sympathetic tone and can lift eyelid 1 to 2 millimeters, and it is involuntary muscle. The frontalis muscle is innervated by the facial nerve. It lifts the eyelid indirectly, and it is a voluntary muscle. To open our eyelids, you can see the different type of muscles are innervated by the different types of nerves. I'll show you some cases next. A 51-year-old male patient came to the clinic complaining of droopy eyelid of his left eyelid. He had DM for four years and his vision was 0.7 and 0.9. His pupil size of both eyes were normal. When he lifts his droopy eyelid, he sees double vision and had eyeball movement limitation to the medial, upper, and lower gaze. The brain CT and MRI was normal. The pupil was normal as well. As you most of guessed, the diagnosis was oculomotor nerve palsy. It is related with vascular disease such as microinfarction. Most of the patients are recovered naturally when the microinfarction reserved. However, you should check patient's pupil size. I'll talk about the region in the next case. One month later, the droopy eyelid came back with normal ocular movement without any treatment. Next case. I got a call from the ER because a 63-year-old female patient came to the ER for proptosis of her right eye. She had hypertension as underlying disease. As you can see in the photo, her right eyebrow goes higher than the left and the right eyelid is droopy than the left. Nine gaze photo shows exotropic deviation of the right eye and movement limitation to the medial, upper, and lower gaze. She took brain CT in the ER and it was normal, but her right pupil was dilated. Taken into together, her diagnosis was oculomotor nerve palsy with pupil involvement. Posterior communicating artery connects the internal carotid artery and the posterior cerebral artery. Parallel to the pecum artery, the third, sixth, fourth cranial nerves run into the cavernous sinus. If pecum aneurysm arises and compresses the third cranial nerve, it can cause third nerve palsy. Then why pupil is dilated? If third nerve palsy is present with pupillary involvement, there is a higher suspicion of compression because the pupillary motor fiber as well as their vascular component derived from overlying pia course along the superficial superior aspect of the oculomotor nerve. If you see this droopy eyelid patient with pupil involvement, send the patient to the ER within eight hours. That's very important. Actually, the patient had a coiling history due to pecum aneurysm eight years ago. Her proptosis might be pseudoexophthalmos due to hypoglotropia of the right eye. During the evaluation in the ER, her vital sign went unstable and the mental drowsy. The brain CT was retaken and ICH was confirmed. After emergency operation, she could save her life. 
It was truly lucky for her that she was in the ER at that time. The last case. 81-year-old female patient was referred to my clinic from GI part for binocular diplopia. She had severe headache and vomiting with anorexia. She complained about her droopy eyelid of her left eye. She had DM and hypertension over for 20 years and clot skin cancer operation history eight months ago. She showed total ophthalmoplasia, ROM to all direction and pupil dilation of both eyes. Here is her MRI scan. You can see her pituitary is swollen. Pituitary gland is located just underneath the optic chiasm within the cavernous sinus, laterally to the pituitary gland, third, fourth, sixth cranial nerve path. If swollen pituitary gland compresses these nerves in the cavernous sinus, total ophthalmoplasia can be caused. Pituitary apoplexy is a condition in which the pituitary tumor spontaneously hemorrhages. Main symptom is the worst headache of my life. Management is refer the patient to NS or endocrinology department. This is the last slide of take a message. Sudden ileitosis might be a symptom of third cranial nerve palsy. When you meet third cranial nerve palsy, check the pupil first. If third cranial nerve palsy patient has pupil involvement, do not hesitate to refer the patient to the ER. Then, even an eye doctor can rescue a patient's life. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, Professor Chu. Now, now from now, I hand to the chairperson role to in, uh, from the Indian, Indian Ophthalmology Society. I think the, the Korean side, uh, the presentation will finish their present, uh, yeah, presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Kim. Uh, uh, Mr. Lakhani, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm here very much here. Uh, so, Dr. Grover has requested that he would present at second last. No problem, so, sir. In that case, I am next in order. Yes, Should sir. I... Next in order, you can share your presentation. Okay. Is my presentation visible and am I audible? Yes, sir. Presentation is visible and you're loud and clear. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to be here amongst our Korean colleagues. Uh, and I thank All India Ophthalmological Society and Professor Namrata Sharma, who is our secretary, for pro providing me this opportunity to present uh, our work here amongst our Korean colleagues. So I'll be speaking on managing giant retinal tears. Uh, giant retinal tears, uh, we all know, are the tears which have greater than 90 degree or more than three clock hours of circumferential extent. And even in today's scenario, despite all the advances in uh, surgery equipment and uh, techniques, they manage uh, they pose management challenges. Use of perfluorocarbon liquids and wide angle visualizations have helped in achieving us better outcomes. And surgery itself may not be so difficult in today's scenario. In spite of all this, the prognosis remains guarded in these cases because of the high chances of proliferative vitro retinopathy and secondary glaucoma, which tends to occur in these particular patients. Now, uh, some of the common causes of giant retinal tears include high myopia, trauma, and they can be idiopathic. Even previous intraocular surgery may predispose to giant retinal tears. A special uh, uh, mention about pediatric GRTs, uh, many of them tend to be associated with syndromic uh, syndromes and are associated with hereditary vitreo retinopathy. They have high, a poorer prognosis and are associated with extremely high rates of PVR. In fact, uh, recently we published uh, this large series of around 100 eyes of pediatric GIT in uh, nature. And we found that 
uh, pediatric GRT related RRDs have poorer prognosis as compared to the adult GRDs. And especially the pediatric GRTs are often associated with hypotony and choroidal detachment. Now, vitrectomy is the uh, preferred mode of treatment in these patients. And few considerations include gauge of the surgery. At our center, we prefer uh, 25 gauge. And in fact, we have published a large study a few years back in Retina, where we found that uh, uh, results of 25 gauge surgery are as good as that of 23 gauge surgery. Uh, some people uh, like to combine vitrectomy with belt and buckle, but in first surgery, uh, usually we avoid uh, encirclage or belt buckle so as to prevent slippage. And we tend to have lower threshold for lens removal in such cases. And one thing to remember is that please do not preserve anterior capsule uh, in these eyes if you are choosing to remove the lens as it may and lead to posterior con uh, cavity, concavity of the iris, which can be problematic in later stages. And as far as possible, we try to uh, maintain the lens so that it preserve the anterior posterior barrier. Now I'll be talking about key steps of the uh, uh, vitrectomy. Vitrectomy is relatively easy in these eyes. And we first do vitrectomy in the areas of attached retina. In the area of giant retinal tears, retina is usually mobile and is saved for the last. And one has to remove vitreous as much as possible right up to the vitreous base and base shave is necessary in most of these patients. Now, by definition, PVD is present in all eyes with giant retinal tear, uh, but uh, in our experience, it is not always the case. For example, you can see here, uh, I did PFCL uh, assisted retinal flattening in this patient, but there are some retinal folds. So what I do is I went back and removed all the PFCL. And once the PFCL was removed, I injected triamcinolone. And to my surprise, PVD was not present. And once PVD was induced, I could flatten the retina with PFCL. It is important to remove even small islands of vitreous, which can later contribute to PVR otherwise. And I do not hesitate to, to peel ILM in selected cases to confirm PVD. Now, it is important to remove the anterior retinal flap, which is residual in these cases. It is usually functional, uh, functionless, and if we leave it behind, it is a part of ischemic, it is ischemic retina, and it can lead to proliferative vitroretinopathy and hypotony later on. So it must be removed with the help of cutter. One has to remove all the membranes. Uh, any membrane present previously may contribute to future membrane formation as well. Uh, anyways, GRT is a high risk for proliferative vitroretinopathy. It is best to stain. Usually I stain with tripen blue, and then one can peel under FPFCL or without the use of PFCL. And one has to peel these membranes from posterior to anterior and avoid circumferential peeling of these membranes. At times, intrinsic retinal shortening may be present, which may be difficult to handle in these cases. The edges may be rolled in uh, old uh, cases of giant retinal tear. Uh, these edges have to be excised and one may excise with or without cautery. But remember, if they're more posterior, they tend to bleed more. The anterior tears uh, or anterior retina tends to bleed lesser as we excise the edges. Uh, flattening of the retina is relatively easy with PFCL. Once we have removed all the traction, what we do is inject PFCL slowly in a bubble over the disc surface. If there is formation of fish eggs, one has to wait for the bubbles to coalesce. And once they have coalesced, then we can again uh, start injecting so that there is single bubble. And one has to fill whole of the vitreous cavity with PFCL to flatten as much as retina possible. Once the retina has been flattened, uh, five to six rows of uh, laser photocoagulation are provided to the edge of the GRT. It is important to laser the edge, otherwise it can roll on in the later uh, times and can lead to retinal detachment. And uh, one has to remember that over uh, overuse of laser photocoagulation can also lead to uh, PVR and redetachment. Uh, once the retina has been lasered, you can do either a direct PVFCL silicon oil exchange. The advantages is that there are less, less chances of slippage and one can use either bimanual method or a standard method where you are injecting from the infusion camera.
in cases one where you are uh, 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 intending to use gas as tamponade pfcl air exchange is the only method uh, the trick is to dry the edge before aspirating pfcl completely that will help us reducing the chances of slippage and uh, it is the only option where gas is planned as i told earlier silicon oil is preferred in most cases except in few fresh cases and superior gits where one can get away with gas and sometimes in patients pediatric patients where there are inferior gits pvr many people like to retain uh, pfcl for medium terms which can be later exchanged with oil or gas post operative management is important uh, the posturing is like any other like any other case after vitrectomy uh, there is high chances of inflammation so systemic steroids are recommended uh, one has to watch intraocular pressure closely and one surgery success rate usually ranges from 50 to 80 patient which must be told to the patient clearly before taking on the surgery and if there is re detachment we do not hesitate to put encircling band or buckle in addition to pre surgery now these are some of our cases you can see uh, the uh, eyes had grt which are nicely attached after gas and after silicon oil but picture is not uh, always rosy this is one pediatric grt which i had operated and in the post operative the retina just went to on to become a small bunch of mass at the optic disc so this is my last case this is a uh, middle aged male who uh, had a high myopia and had a corneal tear for which he had undergone repair he had unaided visual acuity of 66 and presented to us with aphakia corneal scar and a giant retinal tear uh, there was history of one day and there was period 210 degree grt this patient underwent uh, vitrectomy uh, uh, and after the initial vitrectomy was complete uh, the excise uh, the anterior flap of the retina was excised uh, carefully right up to the ora serrata and once the retina was excised entirely uh, pfcl was injected over the disc retina was settled uh, the pfcl was filled up to the brim laser photocoagulation was done and since there was no iris and lens in this particular patient i chose gas as a tamponade and this patient in fact did well and retained 6 by 6 vision and now we have up to 3 years follow up and the patient is doing well to conclude the set the settling of retina with pfcl is a relatively easy task in giant retinal tears one has to make sure that there are no residual membranes on the retina meticulous steps are necessary to ensure proper outcomes and real challenge is to limit complications which ensue in the post operative period and remember pediatric grts tend to have poorer prognosis than adult giant retinal tears thank you very much and thank you for your uh, patient listening dr kumar i have one question yes uh thank you for your excellent um presentation i have a question uh pre- question regarding the necessity of doing uh encircling as you mentioned um for adult patients uh, that may not be as necessary but for pediatric patients they have uh, systemic abnormalities as well as um abnormalities in the vitreous so for pediatric patients do you usually do encircling with vitrectomy uh, uh, not always uh, but if uh, uh, i have to do i do encircling after i have completed my surgery so that the chances of slippage are less so first i do the vitrectomy okay. part and then do the encircling plot uh, part but i never put the encircling band before vitrectomy in patients with giant retinal tears okay thank you we know that i have one question from you yeah uh, hi hi sir i i Uh, you said ki you always uh, take care anterior flap you uh, remove the anterior uh, giant retinal uh, flap of the retina in my experience what i have found i have whenever i have removed the anterior flap i leave a bare choroid and these patient landed up with hypotony and nvi post operatively so after that i left uh, uh, excising my anterior flaps so any experience and any comments about it uh, sir uh, uh, we have a very large series of around 100 eyes now uh, fortunately hypotony has never been an issue especially when we are excising the flap 
the problem occurs is if we leave some part of the flap behind then that is the part which rolls up and attaches to the ciliary body so what i do is if i am not able to excise right up to the ora serrata i always laser the residual anterior flap so that this is not contributing to the ischemia so uh, you uh, as in uh, dictum you remove the anterior flap till the ora serrata yes that was the thing i was not doing I was just cutting it, but I was not removing it till Laura. Yeah. Uh, so even if you leave a short stump, mm -hmm. that can cause problems later. Uh, I think if that is it, uh, we can go to our next speaker. And um, just. Sir, and and then, yes, Bhalla, I guess. Dr. Bhalla is our next speaker. Uh, he'll be speaking on recent advances in the management of medical glaucoma. Is Dr. Bhalla joined? Has Dr. Bhalla joined? Okay, I, I don't... We don't see Dr. Bhalla here. And Dr. Grover, is he back? Not yet. So I think... Uh, we can start with Dr. Avnindra. Dr. Av Avnindra Gupta to do the presentation. Sure, I'll uh, share my screen. Oh, can you see my screen and am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, you can yes. see your screen and you are loud and clear. Good to go. Uh, first of all, I'll thank uh, Korean Society and All India Ophthalmic Society for giving me this opportunity on an international platform to speak about surgical options in macular hole. Uh, macular hole is a defect of the foveal retina involving its full thickness from the internal limiting membrane to the outer segment or the photoreceptors. The cause is usually traumatic, uh, is traumatic. Usually it is idiopathic in 90% of cases. And many of the myopes will also have uh, myopic uh, macular holes. Uh, we, if we go for staging of macular hole, uh, then it is classified into four stage. And stage A, uh, one A is foveal detachment with macular cysts. Stage one B is donut shaped yellow ring. Stage two is full thickness macular hole, less than 500 microns. And stage three is greater than 500 microns. A full thickness macular hole associated with total PVD is stage four macular hole. OCT is the diagnostic tool and also helps in staging of the macular hole. Prognosis of the macular hole, uh, uh, also depends on various indices like uh, hole formation factor, macular hole indices, DHI, THI, and FHA. Uh, we are not going to discuss all this in detail because this is outside the preview of this talk. Uh, if we see the, this is uh, a stage three macular hole, the size is less than 400 micron and the vitreous is attached to the flap of the macular hole. This is stage four macular hole. You can see that there is a total posterior vitreous attachment. Uh, whenever you do surgery, you usually aim for a type one closure. Type one closure means there is a uh, uh, return of the foveal contour, and all the three layers in the OCT are joined together: the photoreceptor, the internal limiting membrane, and the outer layer are joined. And this we call as in type 1 closure. In type 2 closure, the edema goes, but the hole still remains and it's not closed. This is one of the patients with very large macular hole of 2000 microns. And we did a vitrectomy with ILM peel. And you can see almost uh, there is a closure of the macular hole. Coming to the treatment option, uh, the medical option, very small holes can close spontaneously. Uh, intravitreal oculoplasmin uh, was recommended initially, but not many people are using in our country because of the high cost and the success rate are less uh, to somewhere around 32 to 35 uh, percent. So most of us in India are using surgical option that is vitrectomy with island peeling. <clears throat> so I'll be discussing the techniques of doing macular hole. So this is my first video. Uh, there is a macular hole here. You can see there a tricot staining is done. 
and once the PVD is induced, BBG dye is introduced. You can see this uh, ILM is stained with BBG, but there is also a negative staining. So once you have a negative staining here, we realize that there is a big epiretinal membrane. And because of this big epiretinal membrane, you are not getting a blue stain here in this area. Uh, a diamond dusted uh, uh, scraper is used to create an edge and this uh, epiretinal membrane is removed in total. And once the epiretinal membrane is removed, we create an edge inferiorly. And then we go ahead and restain this uh, macular hole with BBG dye. And if you see, <coughs> The area which was not stained previously is now stained with BBG dye. And then island peel is initiated. A macular rexus is done. Always go tangentially, don't go antero posteriorly. A good flap is made. And I prefer to do a large ILM peel, even if the macular hole is small, because doing a large macular peel leaves all the traction within the arcades. And I prefer to do a large arcade to arcade ILM peeling. Once the large ILM peel is done, fluid air exchange is done. Post operatively, this patient did well. This is my second patient, you can see that there is a large uh, macular hole somewhere around 700 microns. PVD uh, is induced with the help of the cutter after tricot staining. The procedure should be gentle and you should use a high suction. You can use either cutter or you can use a soft tip needle. The vice ring comes and then a total vitrectomy is done. The ILM is stained with a BBG dye. And in this uh, case, I'll use a catalyst ILM forceps, which has a bigger uh, lip. And in this forceps, you can see uh, the edge catching hold of the ILM. The edge is, uh, my preferred technique is uh, scrape and then do a peeling. And so I create an edge uh, with the help of a diamond dusted uh, membrane scratcher or with a finished loop. Once the edge is created, I'll do a flower petal like uh, peeling because this is a large hole and I prefer an inverted flap technique in a large macular hole. <clears throat> the ILM is caught and I will not cross the macular area, the fovea or the macular hole and multiple petals of ILM is created. The advantage of this technique is that I don't have to stuff the ILM into the macular hole. Once I do a fluid air exchange, automatically all the petals will fall over the macular hole and there will be no communication between the vitreous cavity and the macular hole, thereby increasing the rate of success in these patients. Once the flap is created, I enlarge the ilum, my macular excess and as I told, I prefer to do an arcade to arcade ILM peeling. The reason behind it, it increases my success rate. And the flap is trimmed. You should be very careful while trimming the flap. The suction should be 50 millimeters of mercury. If you increase, then you can the uh, pole of the flap will come into the cutter and you'll lose this island flap. You can see this uh, cabbage-like appearance on the uh, posterior pole and the blood is then cleared and fluid air exchange is done.
and this is my last case uh, where uh, this is a case of a failed i did a uh, macular hole surgery and this patient fold, uh, failed and you can see the size of the failed macular hole is somewhere around 1800 microns so uh, was a difficult case for me i took the patient for surgery and uh, i planned to do an ilm flap with a macular detachment you can see you can see i have done in uh, staining here and you can see there is an arcade to arcade peel so i initiate uh, the ilm graft uh, beyond the arcades and I bring it to the nasal side, I can harvest a good ilum flap. It is important here that you don't pick this flap with the help of an ilum forceps because it will be very difficult to again place the flap over the macular hole. So a PFCL bubble is placed and then with the help of a membrane scratcher, this flap is dragged over the macular hole. It is gently brought into the center and the, you can see I am putting this flap into the macular hole. If you see, uh, I thought this flap is very small so I tried to harvest another flap from intranasal area and the flap is not very good. So I thought I'll use an, uh, it gets stuck into the membrane scratcher. I use a biomanual technique and I thought I'll hold with an uh, ilum forceps this flap and place it over the mat. You can see it's very difficult to place it over the macular hole because it doesn't go inside the PFCL bubble. And also you cannot dislodge with the help of the membrane scratcher or another instrument. So I lo lose this flap. Then I thought ki, this flap is more than enough. It's uh, what I do, I do a manual here. Since it's a constellation, I don't want the flow of the machine to uh, dislodge this macular uh, flap. So what I do with one hand, I remove the PFCL. With this cannula, what I do, I inject the BBG stained uh, viscoelastic. Once the viscoelastic, if you see this viscoelastic is injected, the flap doesn't move from the macular hole, the PFCL is removed. And since the size of the macular hole is pretty large and I don't want to land up into another failure, so I create macular detachment of the posterior pole to make the retina elastic. Once you can see the fluid traveling from the uh, subretinal space from the macular hole, the fluid air exchange is done. And this is a one week post-operative where you can see the macular hole is closed and this patient had 624 vision. So coming to prognosis, hole closure rate varies from 91 to 97% depending on the size of the hole. Prone position is reduced to three to four days. And usually I customize my patient with OCT. I do a OCT once the uh, uh, air or the gas bubble goes above the macular level. And once the hole is closed, I uh, tell my patient don't lie in home position. Visual acuity of 20 by 50 or better was achieved in 60% of cases with the duration of less than six months. And in 31% of cases with duration of six uh, months or longer. So to summarize, advancement in instrumentation has made macular hole surgery the most sought after surgery. Prone position is required only for three to four days. Result of macular hole surgery is between 90 to 97 percent. Visual gains are three to four lines. Thank you for, for your kind attention.
very nice presentation dr gupta uh, any questions yeah i have all, all one question thank you for a great talk um do you ever consider using um adjuvant in your sur surgery such as autologous platelet concentration to increase your surgical success rate and I i'm just wondering if you have any experience with the use of retinal transplantation for large, extremely large macular hole surgery? So the, my, I have not used autologous serum till date, but I have done an autologous transplantation only in two cases. And, but my experience was not very good with uh, retinal transplantation. And these patients, uh, okay, although you. I was, although I was able to achieve an closure, but the visual results were not good. So uh, what I find uh, doing uh, this technique uh, of detaching the retina and make it, making it, uh, it mobile, the visual results are better as compared to an graft uh, using an autologous graft in the uh, large macula. So what is the uh, usually uh, preferred technique in Korea? If I may ask. Well, yes. Um, personally, uh, for a primary macular hole surgery, I usually perform um, ILM peeling only for small to medium-sized macular hole. But if it's a very large macular hole, I would consider um, doing an ILM flap first, and then for any patients who come in with a failed primary macular hole surgery, that's when I would consider um, doing an autologous island flap uh, with or without the use of adjuvant autologous platelet concentration. Great, great, that's great. All right, so Dr. Vinod Kumar, we have Dr. Bhalla with us now. Okay, I think and Dr. Bhalla is a panelist also, so he can take over from now. I think his presentation is also there. So Dr. Yeah, Bhalla, yeah. you can share your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, can I share the screen, sir? Please, sir, please. So. Are my slides visible, sir? Yes, sir. Your slide is visible. If you can just go on the slide. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right, visible, sir. sir. Loud and clear, sir. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Good evening, uh, Dr. Harban, sir, Dr. Avnindar, uh, Dr. Vinod, and all the other speakers and panelists. Uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity. I'm going to talk on recent advances in pharmacotherapy for glaucoma management. And uh, we all know is a chronic progressive optic neuropathy leading to damage of optic nerve with loss of vision and the most common modifiable risk factor is raised intraocular pressure. Glaucoma is a growing concern and it's the leading cause of irreversible blindness globally. 80 million people have been affected by 2020 and this is increase of about 20 million since 2010 and this figure is expected to increase up to 112 million that is increase of by 2040. And this is going to majorly affect the Africans and Asians. So in what is the scenario in India? 12 million people affected, of which 1.2 million people are drained from the disease. And unfortunately, more than 90% of these cases remain undiagnosed. Let's talk about chronology of anti-glaucoma drugs. The first anti-glaucoma drug which made its appearance was way back in 1875, Pelocarpin. It took almost 100 years for beta blocker to make their entry in the form of Timolol. Then after that came carbonic anhydrase inhibitors in 1990s and then prostaglandin analogs. And the last drug which made its appearance was uh, prostaglandin analog was 2014 Taflucrost. And in 2017, we had drugs by the name of ROC inhibitors. So where is the need for newer anti-glaucoma drugs? One, to improve the health-related quality of life. We want drugs which also offer additional neuroprotection. And if the patients have known allergy or side effects to the existing drugs, we want drugs with longer half-life, which are more potent with lesser side effects. And there is a need for preservative-free drugs. Also, we need economical drugs and the drugs which also improve patient adherence and compliance. So we have some drugs by the uh, name of uh, latinoprostin bunod, we have ROC inhibitors, we have combination of ROC inhibitors with prostaglandin analogs. And if, if we may classify these drugs, 
like innovative high potency drugs in the form of rock inhibitors we have a1 receptor agonist small interferon uh, rna cannabinoids latin choline derivatives then we have some antioxidative agents we have neuroprotective agents and also in the pipeline are neurotrophic agents like uh, ciliary growth nerve factor and many other uh, trophic nerve factors besides gene therapy etc so what is if we talk on what is new in the uh, medical management there are publications on latincholine b which reduces intraocular pressure it comes in the percentage of 0.005% and this publication showed that it causes mean reduction in intraocular pressure of 34% almost as much as prostaglandin analogs then we have nitrogen monoxide donors see synthetase is mainly found in anterior segment a non pigmented epithelium of the ciliary processes nitrate uh, oxide donors they usually have do, uh, action in the form of increasing the outflow conventional outflow by relaxing the trabecular meshwork cells and they also increase the uveo scleral outflow besides increasing and promoting the retinal ganglion cell survival so latinoprostin bunet comes in the percentage of 0.024% and the iop reduction occurs as early as 1 to 3 hours after first dosage and the effect lasts for about 12 hours studies like lunar and apollo have demonstrated its non inferiority to beta blockers and another study like voyager has concluded that latinoprostin bunot had better iop reduction than prostaglandin latinoprost and uh, the prostaglandins we all are quite familiar with prostaglandins uh, the effect of prostaglandins was reported in the year 85 and the first prostaglandin which approved was approved by fda was latinoprost then came bimetoprost and trevoprost and uh, we have various receptors for prostaglandins nine types of receptors to be precise and these are pgfp receptor pge1 to 4 pgd1 to 2 and thromboxane a2 receptor pgfp and pge are two main types of receptors present in human eyes and so what do we have future developments in prostaglandin analogs the only drugs approved by fda uh, right now act on pgf2 receptors and current research strategies are focusing on developing compound that can also target pge2 and pgi2 receptors latinoprostin bunot i have talked about is a nitric oxide donating pgf2 analog sulprostone is pge2 receptor again prost and dinoprost are again pge2 agonist iloprost pgi2 and then we have drugs like de117 and ono9054 which are undergoing phase 1 and phase 2 trials respectively we have also drugs which are sustained release implants by uh, known as bimatoprost dorasta implant it uh, pre, uh, received fda approval in march 2020 and it del delivers drug over 4 to 6 months we also have trevoprost intracameral implant and this also has a longer duration of action so the uh, problem of patient adherence and compliance will be taken care of to great extent besides uh, promising the if a great efficacy of reduction of intraocular pressure by more than 30% we have the technology in the pipeline where we can detect apoptosing retinal ganglion cells and this is a novel technique which holds potential as a surrogate marker we right now have only pre perimetric uh, glaucoma diagnosis by various imaging techniques but if imagine if we have a technique where we are able to detect the apoptosing retinal ganglion cells then we can really initiate the treatment at a very early stage and prevent the apoptosis of retinal ganglion cell in these subgroup of glaucoma patients so the targeting apoptosis we interfering with the apoptosis cascade through exposure to genes or their protein products can have a neuroprotective effect and there is a mouse cell line expressing bcl2 which is a apoptosis inhibitor so trabecular meshwork is a favorite issue for gene transfer we have Uh, a glaucoma association of genes like caviolin 1 caviolin 2 angiopoietin like 7 uh, etc genes have been identified then increasing neurotrophic factors is also very important and these can have potentially play a great role in the management of glaucoma like neurotrophic factors for retinal ganglion cells and intravitreal injection of neurotrophin such as neurotrophin 4 is being studied then we what is the problem with iop lowering medication 
of the currently available medications address the underlying pathology that is increasing the outflow resistance. See, beta adrenergic antagonists and alpha 2 adrenergic agonists do not lower intraocular pressure during nocturnal period. Many patients are unable to tolerate. And even when all the four agents are used in combination, IOP lowering may not be sufficient with maximum medical therapy. So need of the R is to have an agent which have a novel mechanism of action which directed at lowering the main pathogenesis that is decreasing the outflow resistance and it is which is also effective equally effective during both diurnal and nocturnal periods and has additional pharmacological properties that support the retinal function and which is well tolerated with minimal side effects so that is how these rock inhibitors uh, appear to be very promising because rho is a group of small gtp binding proteins and uh, what is does is it increases the conventional outflow at a subcellular level. We are all familiar that how aqueous is outflow occurs through the various uh, parts of the uh, this thing uh, outflow channels. We have uh, the corneoscleral, jexacanalocular uh, pathway through which it goes into the Schlem's canal and through the aqueous veins. So ROC inhibitor has been, ROC signaling has been identified as the important regulator of trabecular mesial cord flow and ROC sensitizes smooth muscle in a calcium independent manner. What it does is the actin polymerization and actomyosin assembly, it causes the ROC uh, functions is it causes contraction, cell addition, and extracellular matrix organization. So ROC inhibitors are going to counteract all these contraction, cell addition, and extracellular matrix organization of the smooth muscle cells in the pathway. And so they act at subcellular level. Uh, how these act? This is the actin myosin assembly of the proteins. And by the contraction of this and localization at the tip of the trabecular network cell, you will find that the, this actin myosin complex assembly causes the trabecular network cells. And what it will does is it will increase the pore size of the outflow channels of the through the trabecular network pathway, thus decreasing the outflow resistance and increasing the outflow passages. To understand, we must know what are GTPSs. GTPSs are molecular switches, and it is considered on when it is bound, rho is bound to GTP, and off when it is bound to GTP. So, uh, rho, rho is activated by binding of GTP. It leads to activation of rho. So, role of ROC pathway in pathogenesis of glaucoma is now very well documented. They have been linked with the control of cytoskeletal dynamics, ectomyosin contractile forces, cell addition, extracellular matrix reorganization, and cell morphology. So, ROC inhibitors, besides decreasing outflow resistance, they also offer neuroprotection of the retinal ganglion cells and also increases the retinal ocular blood flow. You will find that by the uh, ROC action, they enhance intraocular pressure, they may cause scar formation, they may cause retinal ganglion cell apoptosis. But if you give ROC inhibitors, they will decrease, counteract these effects by uh, stopping increase of intraocular pressure. They may also modulate the scar formation and in fact decrease it and also increase the ocular blood flow and decreasing the retinal ganglion cell uh, uh, this thing, uh, apoptosis. So uh, these drugs are in the form of ripasodil and uh, netarsodil. And it has been found that these drugs offer us a now novel mechanism of action and also increases the possibilities and uh, more drugs for us in armamentarium to treat glaucoma. So future looks exciting. Currently, lowering of intraocular pressure remains the only treatment strategy. We now have sustained drug delivery system and we, for future personalized medicine that considers individual variability in genes, environmental and lifestyle factors for each person, and thus it holds a promise to predict optimal treatment and prevention strategies for individual glaucoma patients. Then we have drugs like cannabinoids, topical agents, which can lower intraocular pressure. We have drugs like melatonin, and in fact, topical agomelatin, ego, which has been found to lower intraocular pressure by 30%. We have connective tissue growth factors. We have adenosine, and so non-IOP dependent treatment strategy in the form of neuroprotection can also help us in the management and treatment of glaucoma. So. Neurotrophic factors, I will not go into the details where we have various types of neurotrophic factors and these all drugs can help us besides calcium channel blockers, nitric oxide synthetase inhibitors. And so these drugs can really help us. So the future of medical management of glaucoma 
seems very exciting. And uh, I, I'm not very sure, but if we really have all these drugs into our armamentarium, I don't know whether we'll really need feel the need of having surgical management of these glaucoma patients. Thank you, everyone, for your kind and patient attentive hearing. Uh, doc, Dr. Borla? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. I have one question. Uh, yes. when, we, yeah, when we use anti-glaucoma drugs, a cosmetic effect such as hyperemia, sunken eye can be big issues in Korea because it may exactly. affect to adherence of patient. But many of future drugs originate from prostaglandin as you talk and uh, modulate ocular vessels. So this commonly induced injection of eye. So I'm very welcome to new drugs, but I'm also concerned about cosmetic effect. How do you think this problem? I, I fully agree with you, sir. The main, although it has multiple modes of action, but the main problem which remains is the connectable hyperemia and subconnectable hemorrhage. And that holds true for both ripasudel and netasudel. Although it is much more with ripasudel and lesser with netasudel, but this really remains a problem. So we really have to take into account how much is this cosmetic hyperemia uh, a matter of concern and for the treating uh, physician also. So we really have to uh, really balance in a patient where surgery is not an option and where we have exhausted all other modalities of treatment in the form of beta blockers, prostaglandins, alpha agonists, carbonic and hydrous inhibitors. This becomes an, another uh, drug which can be added. So the definition of maximum medical therapy can really be expanded, yes. It is a matter of concern. And on top of that, if we have preservative-free drugs, that will also take care of ocular surface in these group of patients. <coughs> All right. So, uh, Dr. Bala, may yes, I request sir. you to now invite Dr. Ashok Grover. That will be his uh, presentation time. Yes, sir. Uh, it's my uh, pleasant duty to invite my uh, revered teacher, uh, Professor A.K. Grover. He needs no introduction. He's uh, uh, this thing. He has skill. Not only he's an excellent teacher, not only in anterior segment, and he's a brilliant oculoplasty surgeon, sir. Uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Grover, sir, all yours, sir. Please. Dr. Grover, sir, are you there? Hello? Yeah, we are also trying to... Uh, yeah. I think he is here, but I think he's away from his computer. Okay. I'll just call him, sir. Do you have any other uh, talk left, sir? If we can sir, take uh, We don't have any other talk left. Uh, okay, I'll Dr. just Grover call, sir. Wanted to reschedule himself to last. So what we can okay. do is, uh, we can continue with our discussion and if any questions, answers to be addressed or taken. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vinod yes, Kumar, is it possible we can call Dr. Grover? Uh, yeah, Dr. Bhalla was trying. Uh, I couldn't... Uh, meanwhile, can I have a, a question from Dr. Mm. Please, sir, you can Aan, take please. some questions. Yes, we can. Uh, wonderful doctor, uh, talk, Dr. Aan. So, I think epidectal membrane is something which has uh, eluded all of us over long periods of time. And generalized trend is to operate early in these patients because once uh, the retina becomes dysmorphic and distorted, it takes long time for retina to come back. Uh, even though we peel uh, the epidural membrane nicely. So what are your takes on uh, internal ILM peeling in these patients? Um, I usually do do ILM peeling, uh, okay. 100%, yeah, to oh, okay, prevent, prevent recurrence. Yes. Okay. Do, you, do you also perform, perform uh, ILM peeling? Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of ILM peeling. I almost peel in almost all of my vitrectomies, ILM. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, somehow in epiretinal membrane peeling, I feel uh, the uh, recurrences are actually not too many if we uh, do not peel ILM. Even then the recurrences are not. 
and what i feel especially in early cases where uh, retina is not that much distorted if you peel ilm then the distortion of the retina tends to remain for a longer period of time mm -hmm. while if you peel just epidermal membrane in the early cases uh, these uh, patients tend to have a nicer retinal contour as compared to uh, when ilm has been peeled Okay. Uh, we know that I have a contrary opinion about ILM peeling. I generally don't go in for an ILM peel in my epiretinal membrane because uh, I have a collection of somewhere around 25 cases ILM peel with uh, ERM removal with ILM peel and without ILM peel. And what I have seen in long term with ILM peel, there is a loss of ganglion cell layer. And uh, patient says, uh, initially patient is happy, but after uh, two to three years, he says ki his vision clarity is not uh, so much. Although uh, the opposition is perfectly fine, but uh, when I did a ganglion cell analysis of these patients, and over a period of time, uh, it tends to increase. And uh, that was one of the reasons why I found uh, the vision over a period of two to eight years and patient was not very comfortable, although patient had 6-6 six, six vision, but uh, he was not very comfortable with his vision. So I have stopped uh, doing an ILM peel in my ERM cases. And there is also a publication, uh, I think uh, uh, last month there is a publication comparing ILM peel uh, in ERM with uh, uh, and no ILM peel. And they have also stressed on this point that over a period of time, there is a loss of ganglion cell. Your opinion, Professor Han? Um, yes, I agree with all the comments. So I think we have to balance the benefits and limitations or, or, or complications, we may say, of ILM peeling. Because essentially, the reason why we peel ILM is to prevent recurrence. But as Dr. Gupta mentioned, and I think there has also been a concern for the loss of ganglion cells in the past. And there have been various studies using RNFL OCT to uh, prospectively, prospectively follow up the possible loss of ganglion cells. So I think uh, it remains uh, up to the surgeon, I think, and what he or she may have experienced. So. Yeah, I, I think so, because uh, all said and done, we have been peeling ILM for our macular hole cases. And yes. there we say that uh, you, th these are more of sequelae. And many microperimetric studies have actually yes. not been able to demonstrate any scotomas related to that of uh, dissociated optic nerve fiber layer. So mm -hmm. we really don't know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Dr. I think Grover Dr. Said Grover is there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's joined. Uh, we were waiting for you, sir. Please welcome. Uh, you can switch on your, uh, put on your slides, sir. Good evening, Dr. Bella, Dr. Vinod, and chairpersons. I apologize for joining in late for this talk as there was a concurrent BNB exam going on where I'm an examiner. Um, just finished that. I'll start my screen share and I'll be talking on management of deformities due to eyelid trauma. So the deformities, uh, I hope you can see my screen and hear my voice well. Can you hear my voice well? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. The deformities due to eyelid trauma result from either inadequate or delayed repair of the primary trauma. So it is important, therefore, that when the primary injury occurs, that is the best opportunity to give results that are as close to natural as possible, both structurally and functionally, and that opportunity is properly utilized. The kind of traumatic deformities that we often see are, can be grouped into the broad categories of either marginal misalignments, eyebrow malpositions, canthal displacements, traumatic telecanthus like the one that we see here, traumatic ptosis, 
eyelid defects and cicatricial ectropin. And these will be the broad categories that I will briefly address. Marginal misalignments often result in either causing ectropion or entropion, and they cause bad deformities, often affecting the integrity of the globe. Depending on when they present, they can either have a late primary repair or a delayed secondary repair. A, a misalignment like this one, where there are multiple misalignments, could be taken care of by late primary resuturing, giving results that were quite gratifying. Eyebrow malpositions like these occur because of poor alignment at proper at the primary surgery. And these can again be addressed by reopening those sites of incision or injury and realigning them. This can result in a fairly satisfactory repair and lymphedema takes care of itself over a period of time. Traumatic canthal deformities can be more difficult. They may be both due to soft tissue injuries and at times due to the injuries to the bones, most commonly with naso-orbitoethmoid fractures, which may be part of a polytrauma. These soft tissue deformities again require a number of different techniques for management, but the basic principle remains that the medial canthus must be repositioned. And the essential principle is that it must be fixated, the medial canthal tendon must be fixated to the region of the posterior lacrimal crest to give it the most natural appearance. And this can be done either by fixation to this region behind the sac by exposing from the medial canthal or canalicular region and fixating it with the help of uh, sutures which are permanent like proline sutures or stainless steel wires to the periorbita here or using some other bony structure with associated um, fixation using one of the devices that we will later speak about. So here we've taken a bite through the uh, periosteum behind and through the medial most part of the canthal tendon, aligned it, tied it, to get a good natural deep position of the medial canthus. Some of the clinical examples are uh, telecanthus here because of the disinsertion of the medial canthal tendon, both the anterior and the posterior crust, which we've been able to reposition at its proper position. So you often need a combined transcarancular approach and transcutaneous YV incision in order to get the right position. So here we have made a Y which has been converted into a V and also given a carancular incision to fixate the medial canthal tendon to get an appropriate position. Sometimes you have a downward displacement as well and a procedure like a Z plasty as we see here may be necessary to position the medial canthus at its appropriate position, shifting the medial canthal tendon in the lower wing of the Z to the upper one. Sometimes this may be a more significant one. So the, you decide on the position based on the distance from the center of the nose and do a Z plasty and do a good fixation here, which may require um, multiple kind of procedures. Here we've done a fixation with a proline suture, but we'll see other examples where bony repair is involved. Here there was a brow deformity, a scar, and a telecanthus. So we combined a revision of the wound with the repositioning of the medial canthus so that we could also reposition the brow, revise the scar, and restore the position of the medial canthus resulting in a good position so that later atosis can also be corrected. Bony deformities may require either transnasal wiring or low profile mini plates with just two to four holes and short three millimeter screws drilled superficially and then a proline wire may be fixated to these an example of microplating to correct telecanthus. 
this was a bad traumatic telecanthus with bony deformity where we needed to put in a small bone graft and do a stainless steel wiring to correct the position significantly. A bilateral traumatic telecanthus with chronic dacrysostitis which also caused traumatic nasolacrimal duct obstruction required a bicoronal approach with a plastic surgeon and doing a transnasal wiring and open sky dacrysostomy with correction of telecanthus and correction of the nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Lateral canthal displacements like these may require revision of the entire lateral canthal region, removal of all the scar, and stretching of the lower lid with the help of a posterior lamellar hard palate graft, which is taken like this. And this can restore the position of the lateral canthus as well. Traumatic ptosis needs to be assessed like any other ptosis, but based on the levator action and the severity of ptosis, you may be able to do any of these procedures, but very often an epineurotic repair or a sling procedure is needed. Lit colobomas need a different kinds of strategies based on the deformity. This patient had a, a canthus which was misaligned associated with the lit coloboma, so we had to open up and carry out a repair of the coloboma using a um, tensile repair after converting the defect to a pentagonal shape and we could restore back the lateral canthus and the upper lid by this repair. A defect like this, we could rotate the tarsus in position to complete the posterior lamellar defect and do a free skin graft for correction. Secretarial ectropion is the last entity which I'm going to discuss. The localized defects may be repaired by mobilization of tissue from the surrounding areas, like in this patient where there was a localized ectropion in the upper lid and in the lower lid where a Z-plasty and a VY-plasty could do the job for us. This is an example where there's a secretarial ectropion of the upper and the lower lid. Lower lid being more diffuse requires a skin graft, but the upper one can be repaired by a VY plasty. So this is the repair done with a graft and a VY plasty for lower and upper lid respectively. For the more diffused effects, you need skin grafts, either partial thickness or full thickness. Partial thickness grafts in conditions which are less favorable, like in this one, where there was a loss of one eye due to chemical burn and a gross secretarial ectropion in the other. Here, we found it increasing rapidly with a risk of exposure keratopathy to the more, to the better eye, the only seeing eye and we did an epidermal graft after adequate excision of the scar, and we could get the recreation of the upper lid with adequate closure of the eyelid, as we see here. Lower lid and the more severe ones like this may require a full thickness graft, as we've done in this patient, and restored back her correction. To conclude, the management of traumatic eyelid deformities is an extremely gratifying job and it can significantly improve the quality of lives of these patients and help them live life confidently. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much for that nice talk. Any questions, please? Uh, Dr. Grover, thank you very much for your wonderful cases. Uh, it's very tough cases. Um, I have a question. If you have any um, 
eyelid skin um, coloboma cases, which graft do you prefer? Um, I prefer, I usually prefer the opposite side eyelid skin. Uh, how do you use uh, the graft from where? So the, um, if it is a congenital coloboma and we are working at an early age, then we tend to avoid lid sharing procedures. But in those cases who are older and where the repair is being carried out at a later age where the risk of amblyopia is not significant, I often find the use of tarsoconjunctival grafts from the uh, tarsoconjunctival flaps from the lower lid to be very useful for the reconstruction of the posterior lamina. And then very often we can use either a flap from the forehead or a skin graft or a free skin graft for the upper lid. At times, you can even do an inverse cutler beard and it works well, where we are taking both the lamellae from the lower lid. So it usually would depend on the extent of defect. If it is a lateral defect and is probably less than one fourth, uh, uh, one third or something or half, tensils works very well in my hand. So it's a combination, it, it's just an assessment of an individual case have to have a plan A thought out, but you often need to use a, a second plan. So you all, always need to have a second plan in mind as well. So just taking care of the basic principles of oculoplastic surgery, you need to have an open mind to choice of the surgical technique, which is most appropriate based on the shape and size of the defect. Agreed. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Right, so we like have to time for uh, any discussions and questions. You can go on, please. Uh, yeah, gentlemen, if you would like a very to nice talk, uh, the speaker who spoke about uh, the droopy eyes, I would like to know her. Uh, approach to severe unilateral doses. Dr. Joe, I think uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Grover asked your approach to severe unilateral doses, what, oh. what you do. Yes. Oh. For surgery, um, it, if it is not origin from neurogenic uh, origin, uh, for uh, aging ptosis or congenital ptosis, the approach is different. But in Korea, the eyelid skin uh, usually um, puffier than uh, Western eyelid. So I usually approach uh, through skin, not the conjunctiva and Mueller and, um, and aponeurosis uh, resection. Yeah. So even levator in cases, resection is my favorite surgery. Okay. Even in cases with a uh, levator action as low as two or three millimeters, do you find the levator surgery is able to provide lasting results of correction? Uh, even uh, the levator function is more than four millimeters. I usually prefer because the cosmesis is the best, I think. And so if the elevator action is less than that, just two or three, what would you suggest? Yeah, silicon road. Oh, silicon road. Yes. Yeah, I think that has become the first choice now. Uh, when silicon road was not available and uh, we were doing fascia lata, we found uh, often a sling to be causing an undercorrection. With with elastics, we are able to stretch extra because of the elasticity and are able to get that good correction in the unilateral cases also. Thank you for your answer. So on a lighter note, uh, silicon has intruded ophthalmo ophthalmoplasty as well. It was right. there in retina. So now it has intruded into ophthalmoplasty as well. Absolutely, we know. Uh, then any more you. further questions? For any panelists, any speakers? All right. So. Uh, with your due permission, uh, can we call off the session now?
yeah i would like to thank on behalf of the all india of ophthalmological society to our korean colleagues for uh, this very illuminating session with such a wide spectrum of things thank you very much we look forward to continued cooperation with all india of ophthalmic society and the korean society of ophthalmology all right so now i'd like to take this opportunity to thank our chairpersons our moderators our panelists for joining this virtual dais and to all the korean uh, faculty i hope i'm not mispronouncing it but i can say hamsa hai yo your pronunciation is perfect yeah, yeah perfect so before we wind <laughs> the session we will Thank take you. a group photograph if you don't mind so can we have a lovely smiling face and uh, atul ji can you aap ek picture le sakte please yes sir and good to have namrata ma'am also on the frame namrata ma'am we are having a good group picture so a lovely smile and here we go atul ji photograph has been taken done sir done thank you so much ladies and gentlemen thank you thank you so much yeah. being thank on this you. virtual dais it was a pleasure having you here and once again to all our korean faculty for being here present hum sahayo namaste thank you very much namaste thank you namaste namaste thank you, namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone all right so uh, ladies and gentlemen here we go uh, towards the next uh, session of uh, hall b uh, i would like to acknowledge the presence of our chairpersons major general dr j k s parihar Dr. Pariyar, are you there with us? I don't think he's joined yet. Yeah, he'll be joining so uh, soon. Our co-chairpersons, Dr. Samar Basak and Dr. Radhika Tandon. Professor, uh, yeah, Professor Radhika is there. Good evening, uh, Professor Tandon. Good evening. How are you doing today? Welcome. I'm good. I hope you're good too. Thank you. Our convener for the uh, session is Dr. Ritu Arora and Dr. Rishi Mohan. do we have you here i think uh, both of them are not going to okay. join there is a there are there are some okay. unforeseen issues okay uh, our moderators for this session dr namrata sharma welcome ma'am namaste yeah she is here with us dr yeah. raj uh, sinha rajesh is going to join i think and dr swati tomar i don't see swati or... yeah dr swati tomar is here with us Yeah, hi. Yeah. Swati is there. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Namaste, Dr. Swati. Welcome on the virtual class. Thank you. Our panelists for this session is Dr. Rajib Mukherjee, Dr. Manisha Acharya, Dr. Rekha, and Dr. Rakesh Shah. Okay, you can move forward. Namaste. Welcome on the virtual class. Uh, Ma'am, we still have four minutes to go. So uh, I'm just wondering where the international uh, faculty is because uh, Rakhi. Sorry, ma'am. Ma'am Anna is here. Um, oh. um, I can see her here. Um, Kevin and uh, Pollock has pre-recorded uh, talks, which I have already provided to the admin. Uh, mm -hmm. Eric and Josie, I am just checking with them because oh. they were supposed to join. I'll just check with them. Okay. I'll just check with my AV team. Uh, we have Dr. Pollock's uh, recorded. I received, sir. I received. All right, and Dr. Kevin also. Yes, sir. All right, and then we have uh, followed with Dr. Anna Siaz. Anna is here. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Dr. Anna. Welcome on the virtual dais. Okay. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Namaste, Dr. Anna. Dr. Anna, your presentation. Would you like to share the screen? We have three minutes, so we'll you make use of the time. if you can share the screen we can be technically checked okay yeah followed with dr anna we have uh, dr erica hiller so she has to join so, can you go on the slide show mode ma'am perfect it work? yes sense? yes it's visible you can stop sharing the screen now thank you so much perfect eric is also here you can request him to check as well yeah dr eric he is just joined in yes dr eric namaste welcome the, on the virtual dais sir namaste thank you it's nice to be dr. here dr eric 
would you like to share your screen so we can virtual check your presentation, please? Certainly. Give me one second to get everything up and running. Dr. Noha has not joined us yet. Uh, and then we have Dr. Nilesh Mohan. Perfect, Dr. Arik. All right, and just make sure that everything's working when it comes yes. through. So we're seeing you can, everything. You can change some slides, yes. All right. All right, the slides Good. are visible, sir. You can stop sharing now. Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, I request all the uh, speakers who are going to do the presentations. We have 10 minutes of our time to do the presentation. And collectively, we'll have the discussions towards the end of the session. I hope that's fine with you. And uh, with the permission of our chairpersons, co-chairpersons, now I would like to uh, announce the beginning of our next session over here. So once again, I welcome everybody to IOC 2022 International Ophthalmologic Conclave. And I'm your time manager from Hall B, Hema Ilakani. Namaste and welcome to the virtual dais. Now I would like to hand over the virtual dais to our moderators and I'll hand over, it over to Dr. Namrata Sharma to take the event forward and invite the first speaker. The virtual dice is all yours, Dr. Namrata. You can go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, there is a, a small introduction of the uh, webinar and of, uh, of the uh, participants of the webinar. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Sinha is there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, uh, the uh, it is a pleasure uh, and we would be joining in soon by major general dr jks parihar the president of ibank association of uh, india and senior consultant and professor of ophthalmology head academic center for site new delhi rajesh uh, it's great pleasure to introduce uh, the co chairpersons dr samar basak past president ebi and director dishai hospital kolkata Professor Radhika Tandon, who is again past president EBAI, professor of ophthalmology at RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. The conveners, uh, both of them could not join because of unforeseen uh, circumstances. Uh, and so we mo uh, move on to my co-moderator, Professor Rajesh Sena, honorary treasurer of the IBank Association of India, as well as of All India Ophthalmological Society, professor of ophthalmology at RP Center, Ames, Delhi. And we have with us Dr. Swati Tomar, Founder, Director and Consultant, Swanitra Eye Hospital, Jaipur. Rajesh. And uh, we have with us the, our esteemed expert panel, uh, Dr. Rajiv Mukherjee, Dr. Manisha Acharya, Dr. Rekha Gyanchan, Dr. Rakesh Shah, Dr. Nilesh Mohan. We have uh, esteemed speakers, Dr. Graham Pollock, uh, who is the Director, Lion's Eye Donation Service Center for Eye Research Australia. University of uh, Melbourne, and he's going to be talking about adverse reactions and early graft follow-up, and Mr. Kevin Cor uh, Corcoran, President of iBank Association of America, who's going to be telling us about the status update of iBank Association of America. We also have uh, Dr. Anna Sells, who is uh, Research and Development and Quality Management, uh, uh, who is into Research and Development and Quality Management, DGFG, uh, Hanover, Germany. Uh, who will be talking about DGFG Network for Tissue Medicine, and Mr. Eric Hillier, who is Global Development Director, Eversight USA, who will be talking about need for sustainable eye banking in the face of tissue constraints. Uh, we will be joined in shortly by Ms. Josie Noah, who is uh, well known to all of us here in India, Chief Global Officer, SightLife USA, who would be talking to us about strengthening the continuum of care to eliminate corneal blindness. And Dr. Neeti Gupta, Associate Professor, Department of Ophthalmology, Ames Rishikesh, who's going to be talking to us about small changes in eye bank policies, which can have a huge impact on the HCRP program. And, and we also have Dr. Namrata Sharma, who is uh, Honorary General Secretary EBAI and uh, uh, of AIOS, and Professor of Ophthalmology, RP Center, Ames, New Delhi, who will be talking about eye banking in COVID times and beyond. And uh, Ms. Raki uh, Nathavat, who is uh, Head of Programs, South Asia, Motivation India. And uh, she'll be talking about advocacy and policy planning.
to target the goal of eliminating corneal blindness by 2030. So I think uh, with this, we will begin the first talk by Dr. Graham Pollock. Welcome Dr. Samar Basak, sir. Uh, can we play the talk by Dr. Graham Pollock, please? Uh, thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to speak on adverse reactions and early graph follow-up. I'm sorry I can't be in there in person today, but uh, I do hope that the meeting is going well. In the main, we generally consider that an adverse reaction is unique and our reporting systems are often predicated on this. But in other words, that it's a single donor or a single tissue issue, uh, often predicated that the adverse reaction indeed can be identified by the surgeon and that the adverse reaction is unlikely to be repeated again in the short term with another patient or, or another recipient. But from an eye bank perspective, um, we should consider that each adverse event is not an isolated event and that we should consider it in conjunction with other reported events that may come to us and consider the relevance and significance of those events. In that way, we can actually identify trends that can be acted upon or identify systemic problems that can be uh, corrected uh, in the short term. Adverse reaction reporting systems, whether they're active or passive systems, are notoriously slow responders. Surgeons working independently of one another have no ability in identifying trends and thus have difficulty in identifying that their issue may be related to a systemic problem. For example, whilst primary graph failure is rare, it is not necessarily unexpected and the reporting from the surgeons is therefore delayed. This delay results in a delay in corrective and preventative actions being implemented and can actually compound a systems issue. To illustrate this, consider this hypothetical graph failure timeline where it's assumed that all failures are related to the same systemic issue within the eye bank. The head of the graph represents the day of the transplant being performed and the end of the uh, Bar represents the day an issue is reported to the eye bank. However, the white circles illustrate the day an issue might be considered to be significant by the surgeon. Colouring the bars to represent transplants performed by different surgeons highlights the problem of associating seemingly independent events in identifying trends. The purple surgeon here is unaware of the blue surgeon's graft failure. And within the purple surgeon's own practice, uh, two graft failures have presented themselves differently. Early reporting of the issues with the grafts would have identified a trend, although the difficulty for the eye bank in this instance is identifying when does an issue become a trend? Is it a percentage of cases over time? Is it similar presentations and the significance of that? Is it the number of cases over time that presents? Or is it a group of consecutive instances in a, in a cluster? Whatever the case, in this instance, early identification of trends could have identified the problem, instituted early corrective and preventative action, and potentially avoided any further graft failures. With this in mind, within our iBank, we instituted what's called an early graft follow-up or GFU system. We sent an email to each surgeon two to three weeks post-operatively asking, are there any issues possibly attributable to the tissue? If the answer is simply a no, which is done by reply email, uh, there is no further action other than recording the no in the cornea's record. If the answer is yes, we institute a follow-up phone call with the surgeon uh, for a review of the tissue, uh, both from a doning and a processing point of view. A six week follow up uh, with the surgeon then follows where we ask, are there still issues possibly attributable to the tissue? It's important that the two week follow up is not there to identify an adverse reaction, but it's a, there to identify trends that may be an early warning indicator of a systemic problem. 
the six-week telephone follow-up is there to identify a reportable adverse reaction. Of course, the normal adverse reaction reporting system uh, continues to operate uh, within this system. This is some of the data that's been generated over a 12 month period, January to December 2021 from uh, our GFU system. Of the uh, 532 corneas that we followed, you can see that uh, 62 of these, we had no response. We actually had no opt-outs during this time. Most of these 62 corneas are actually corneas that were sent overseas. We still have in place a passive adverse reaction reporting system on these corneas, and we're, we haven't received any uh, reports of adverse events, so we're assuming that there's been no issues or problems in that group. Of the 470 uh, corneas that we did receive reports back on, there were a small percentage that had issues. None of these issues were related to any post-operative infections, so we saw no post-operative infections at all, keratitis or endophthalmitis. And they all of them related to either dislocations of DSEX or primary, possible primary graft failures. Upon uh, further investigation, uh, we provided an attribution of the possible cause of the issues. You can see that uh, there were no likely tissue factors involved in any of these. Most of them were uh, became under unknown possible cornea, uh, a possible donor code cornea, possible recipient, possible surgical factors, and uh, a smaller amount of 10 that were definitely attributed to be uh, surgical or recipient factors involved. Notably, uh, most of the issues reported to us related to DSEC procedures. You can see more clearly when the data is graphed, the issues uh, that dominated were those of DSEC. By May 2021, actually, we felt that we had a trend occurring here, and we did a thorough investigation to look at if there were any tissue factors involved in this trend, uh, but we found none. Instead, we found that the issues were uh, confined to a small number of surgeons, uh, and that the issue was potentially related to inadequate rinsing of the DSEC uh, donor material prior to transplantation. If we split the reporting periods into two halves of the year, from January to June 2021 and July to December 2021, you can see how the awareness of this issue actually changed outcome. Uh, so much so that we had no reports of uh, DSEC issues uh, in the second half of the year that couldn't be solely attributed to surgical and recipient factors. We believe that this is a very good example of our GFU reporting system identifying potential trends early, trends that may have otherwise gone unnoticed, being able to identify the problem and correcting the problem to provide better outcomes. So in summary, we believe it's important to understand that each adverse event is not necessarily an isolated event, but it should be investigated in conjunction with other reported events. And we've demonstrated that the graph follow-up system allows for an early detection of trends and the early corrective and preventative action uh, on those trends to provide a better transplant outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we would like to have a quick comment from uh, Dr. Radhika. If you have any comments on the uh, reporting uh, system, uh, 
Um, you like to, yeah. This is a very nice illustration of how uh, I, over the years, I banking has gone from a passive to sort of a more active role. Uh, it began with the concept of rather than passively waiting for donors to come forward and actively, you know, going for motivation. And this is at another level. Traditionally, mm -hmm. iBanks have had this form that you send out and you want the surgeons to send back the feedback. Uh, this is again, uh, realizing that often that doesn't happen. And uh, so it's a good idea to proactively um, you know, send, send the form with the tissue and then follow up with an email after two weeks as well as a phone call. And I think the phone call would probably be very uh, important that it's nicely taken up with the surgeon uh, with an interest of you know, uh, changing things. Um, so I think it's a very nice uh, idea. Yeah. Dr. Basar? Yeah, Radhika has already mentioned this. So there are two important factors. One is the primary graft failure. Another is uh, the graft infection. These are two and the uh, systemic diseases. So from eye banking point of view, see that the PGF, nowadays the tissue evaluation is so good, you should not expect PGF from, from eye bank side. You right. can expect the other things like infection is one of the, the yes. important role of follow-up is there and quick follow-up is important because the med tissue is important in that case. And regarding other that primary graft failure after two months, maybe surgeon's factor are there, new surgeon, there may be surgical problem itself. Other than the, the surgeon factor, the, it is a complicated case. Those issues are there, but follow-up is always necessary so that I bank can improve their, uh, I mean, whatever way they can help the surgeon, the upliftment of the eye banking services right. will all, always be there. Right. right. Yeah, right. Because as operating surgeons also, we need to understand that we have to report any adverse reaction that we see and it should be in a proper standardized format that comes with the tissue. So with this, we move on to our uh, next talk of the day. Status update of EBAA by Dr. Kevin. It is now my pleasure to provide a state of the association uh, to inform you of how the EBA board, staff, and volunteers have acted as stewards of your association. Uh, one year ago, about this time, we had started to dig out of the bottom as far as tissue placement is concerned. So when the newly elected 2020-2021 board met in July for its board orientation session, uh, we were comfortable planning projects and initiatives that would serve all our members and allow us to move the profession forward. Uh, we identified a number of areas where EBA could have a positive impact. These were major projects that were relevant to all the people we serve, both inside and outside the association. And I don't understand why I'm not able to move slides. So um, if we can move the slide. All right, my Zoom is freezing on me, so I'm going to wait for it to respond and see how many. But until then, sorry. Um, when the board thought about what EBA's greatest asset is, we quickly realized that the medical standards are probably our most significant contributions to eye banking and transplantation. Uh, they are functions that only EBA could undertake uh, because what other body has the ability to set standards for eye banking and what other organization enjoys the level of collaboration between eye bankers and physicians that makes our standards on our accreditation program universally recognized as the gold standard for patient outcomes. So next slide, please. Working with an outside PR firm, we developed our Safety First Innovation Always campaign. Beginning in October, we began sending a series of emails to over 2,000 corneal surgeons and ophthalmologists. These emails described how EVA's medical standards and accreditation program helped to ensure safe tissue for their patients. It highlighted how EVA member eye banks have been at the forefront of innovation within the profession from 1961 through to the present and they offered testimonials from trusted physician leaders. To date, this project has resulted in over 20,000 emails, and the campaign has been incredibly successful as we're seeing very high email open rates and click rates. Since March, we've also been buying targeted ads on Facebook and LinkedIn and seeing high engagement on those platforms as well. 
One of the most significant threats to nonprofit eye banking, both financially and culturally, is the rise of Corneagen, a for-profit entity that has raised tens of millions of dollars for the purpose of dominating the market for ocular tissue, and that has plans to launch an IPO to become a publicly traded company. Um, next slide, please. In 2019, EBA removed Corneagen from its membership, but soon thereafter, some individual member eye banks took matters into their own hands and launched legislative efforts to ban for-profit eye banking entities in their states. Leader in Florida Lions Eye Bank in Florida ran a bill in 2020, as did the Lions in Minnesota. Next slide. While those efforts didn't result in the passage of new laws, they, along with Miracles and Sight in South Carolina, made similar attempts in 2021, and they expect to do the same in the future. However, it was a different situation in Kentucky. Slide, please. Kentucky Lions Eye Bank, led by EBA's immediate past chair, Woody Van Meter, drafted legislation that was unanimously approved by Kentucky's House and passed the Senate with a single no vote. And on March 19th, 2021, Governor Bashir signed the bill, making Kentucky the first state to ban for-profit entities from directly or indirectly recovering, processing, or distributing ocular tissue. We're going to discuss this issue more in the House of Delegates next week, uh, but until then, I can say that EBA stands ready to provide support and resources to other eye banks that are interested in similar efforts in their states. Can you get the next slide, please? Eye Donation Month is our principal outreach campaign. And last year's theme, A Community of Compassion, recognized the contributions made by eye bankers, physicians, and all others involved in the donation and transplantation process, much as we're doing today. Um, next slide. Our campaign featured the stories of four-year-old Zoe and her nine-year-old daughter, Eolani. The, the video that we produced featured both families and drew thousands of views and helped put a very clear and relatable face on our work. Next slide. Responding to requests and suggestions from our members, we provided more tools and resources than ever before with talking points, infographics, media alerts, and a slew of electronic tools formatted for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other platforms. Um, next slide, please. Given the campaign success and the fact that we always rely on our partners in donation and transplantation, we're going to repeat our Community of Compassion theme for 2021 with new stories and updated graphics. And this year, we're hoping to produce as many as three videos so that iBanks can feature new content every week or so. Uh, we are very fortunate that UT Southwestern introduced us to Zoe and Eolani's family. Uh, and we would invite any iBank that has a compelling donor or recipient story to please contact us. We'd love to be able to feature you and, and these individuals in our videos going forward. So please uh, share that information with us, thanks. Um, this year has seen us all adapt to new technologies to help us work more efficiently and more effectively, and EBA was no different. Uh, we completed three technology upgrades this year and have another one waiting in the wings. eStatus is our online statistical reporting platform and was an upgrade from EBA Connect, which had served us for over a decade. This new tool has a more intuitive user interface it's got outstanding benchmarking and data analytics, and it's got reporting capabilities that are going to knock the socks off of your CEO or your board. So I encourage you to explore it and start taking advantage of everything that it can do for you. The Lens replaced our antiquated listserv system and provides our members a modern, easy-to-use communications and community platform. We've created over a dozen groups for everyone from QA staff to CEOs to medical directors. And because the Lens archives and stores files that you can search at any time, you can look back over past posts and get answers to questions you haven't even asked yet. And then finally, when we acquired a new association management system for our internal operations about two months ago, that meant we were also able to update our member portal, uh, replacing the hodgepodge of files and links with a new website that's easy to navigate and far more flexible for both posting and accessing content. Uh, the portal also will allow members to update their personal records, access your you know, history of CEUs and other content, and allows iBank CEOs to add and delete their staff from their membership automatically. So everybody has the benefit of membership as soon as they get started. So Tamika, talk to Tony, make sure he gets you loaded into uh, our new system. Uh, 
looking ahead to the next 12 months, we are planning a wholesale uh, overhaul of our website. This is going to be the first redesign of the website uh, since we rolled it out in 2015. Uh, and our goal is to be able to better target and communicate with all of our audiences, from iBankers and physicians to members of the public. So please watch for that. We're excited about that coming in the next couple of months. Next slide. As Noel mentioned, uh, eBay was founded in 1961, and this is our 60th anniversary. Uh, throughout the year, uh, we have and we will continue to celebrate the ways that the association and our members have made history through innovations and advances in both the science and the art of corneal recovery, processing, and transplantation. Uh, so please be sure to visit our website to see a timeline of our accomplishments, and feel free to use those tools in your own social media. Finally, this is just some of the initiatives that we've undertaken in the past 12 months, uh, and these are all designed to serve you better. It is our honor to work with you to restore sight to those in the darkness. On behalf of the entire board and staff, I want to thank you for your continued support and urge you to contact staff or board members if there's anything we can do to make your EBA membership more valuable. Thank you very much. Dr. Swati, you need to unmute yourself. I'm really sorry for that. No problem, ma'am. So uh, thank you, Dr. Kevin. And uh, I, we would like to have a quick comment from uh, Dr. Manisha Acharya, uh, because she has been uh, uh, doing a lot of, uh, you know, she's the, the iBank is pretty updated. And uh, uh, I see a lot of uh, things happening at your iBank at your level. So can you uh, enlighten us a little, Manisha? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Swati. Um, I think it was a very, uh, it was very nice to see the presentation and to understand what EBA in these difficult times of COVID has really come out and uh, used uh, this uh, crisis as an opportunity to uh, to develop new things. So we similarly, you know, I think in, in a lot of our Indian eye banking, we are seeing similar changes. We are also adapting to technology, and now it's uh, it's more like using more tissues, one tissue for more than one surgery, which was initially uh, not a um, standard practice being done. I think COVID taught us that. And a lot of ways which came up, uh, different protocols, which uh, a lot of eye banks have changed uh, because of the COVID crisis. And uh, I think a lot of changes in eye banking, we will see now that now we are coming back to normalcy uh, uh, within eye banking. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, because I think uh, we should utilize this as an opportunity. Uh, at this and uh, Dr. Radhika, uh, Dr. Basakia, please. So uh, I have just I always visit this restore dot com, and sometimes I wonder that some of the uh, uh, important thing, unless you become a member, you cannot access uh, the website. So. I request from EBI side that uh, EBA can do something so that we can collaborate and uh, we can have a good, uh, like uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology has very good collaboration with AIOS so that we can get the teaching material from uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology. Similarly, if EBI members, the members can have some access with some, uh, I think there will be some uh, uh, minimal yeah. charges uh, that will be very, very beneficial because EBA is our our standard of Thanks. medical standard of eye banking of EBA. I actually we have procured all the knowledge from EBAA, so it is request from EBA side that uh, Dr. Kevin uh, can do something or. EBA can do something for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that will be very nice. And um, a lot of uh, the standards that EBA have, we already have in, uh, incorporated, but we need to do a lot more. Uh, again, I think EBA and EBA are listening and uh, <laughs> they will work on it. Thank you, Dr. Basak. So with this, we uh, move on to our third talk of the day. That's a DGFG, a network for tissue medicine by Dr. Anna.
So I hope you can see my screen. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in that session. And it is an honor for me to present you today about our network for tissue medicine. And I would like to start with a situation in uh, Germany where we currently have tissues processed for in three, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. So currently tissues are processed by three national German multi-tissue um, facilities. And there's 22 bone banks with a distribution authorization. There's also about 130 local bone banks. And in Germany, we have 28 cornea banks. 11 of them are within our DGFG network. And there's also five cardiovascular tissue establishments, out of which two are part of our network. In the scheme on the right hand side, you can see that generally those tissue establishments can be either profit or non profit, or they are organized in a public or in a private way. The legal situation in Germany is that um, be following the Tissue Act that came into force in 2007. And that was the moment when tissue donation was separated from organ donation. And so the act is implemented by the Transplant Act, which regulates all the um, information rights and obligations, the consent for donation and the tissue trade prohibition. On the other side, there is the Medicines Product Act, which regulates the tissue procurement and processing and the allocation of tissue. In Germany, we have an opt-in system. So um, the consent for donation is based on either the known will that has been declared during lifetime, or it is made by the presumed will when the relatives decide according to the deceased will. And of course, this can lead to a rejection of a tissue donation or a general or limited consent for tissue donation. And in Germany, we always separately have to ask if the tissue can be used for research purposes. So who are we? DGFG stands for German Society for Tissue Transplantation. And we are an independent and non-profit company that is based in Hanover. We were founded in 2007 when the Tissue Act came into force. And today we are owned by four public university hospitals and one Protestant hospital. We are not regulated by the state. We are slowly in, solely independent. And our mission is the implementation of the tissue law to, and to ensure a need-based, a safe and a transparent and cost-effective supply of tissue transplants for our patients. We also want to expand the nonprofit work within the framework of a nationwide network. And so the five shareholders of the DGFG, they own some shares, but the operational business is independent and there's annual shareholder meetings, and there's no distribution of dividends to the shareholders. And if you look again at that scheme, so DGFG fits into the area of public and nonprofit. Our network is spread all over Germany. You can see the headquarter with a little circle around in Hanover, but we are present in 30 different locations. And we have 50 coordinators that take care of the donation and we work with more than 100 donation clinics. Our network contains 13 tissue banks. And for the cornea, we work with more than 120 transplant centers. We also have programs for cardiovascular tissue and for the provision of amniotic membrane. So what we do is the full process from um, getting the notification of a deceased person to coordinating the donation, to take care of the processing, and then to allocate the tissue throughout the country. The financing situation for tissue donation in Germany is that we are um, we finance ourselves only from the reimbursement rates from the distributed tissue. So all the expenses for donation, processing, storage, and allocation are covered by that reimbursement we get from the transplant centers. And they again receive the reimbursement through the health insurance company. Um, and all 
activities that go beyond the, the core process of donation, um, is, which is research and development activities, communication and public relation, that needs to be financed through fundraising and sponsoring. So the benefits that we see working in a network is that our donation coordinators and the medical staff are employed by the DGFG. So we are locally present at many locations and we have a shift system so we can work 24 seven and all the employees are qualified through regular trainings. And with this, the full donation process responsibility lies within the DGFG. And so the donation can happen independent from clinic resources. We have established reliable and compliant quality standards that enable an exchange between the tissue banks. And with this, we can optimally use the capacity of the tissue banks. We can also reduce some costs for the big tissue banks because we can centralized um, purchase the medium, for example. And with this, we can address challenges that you could have by having a surplus of tissue due to a low local demand on the one side or to have a high local demand for tissue transplants that cannot be met. And so the DGFG network enables flexibility and planning security for the transplantation centers and tissue banks. But also we learned in the last two years that it creates a resilient structure in times of a pandemic, for example. What you see here is our distributed corneas um, from 2007 till last year. And we have increasing numbers throughout the time. And today, half of all corneas that are processed and distributed in Germany come from the DGFG network. So what we do um, to support the core processes, we have a centralized quality management and we have public relation activities and also research and development activities. Speaking of those, we want to bring innovation to improve tissue transplants and to establish new scientific methods to finally transfer um, research into application. And we um, support research work. We do our own studies, but we mainly work in cooperation with national and international partners. And speaking about an international partnership, we currently have a cooperation project with the Dr. Schross Charity Eye Hospital in Delhi. And we receive funding for two years that will cover the travel costs, the equipment, and the training and education activities we're planning for the project. In, this is um, funded by the so-called hospital partnerships, which is under the umbrella of the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. The objective of the project is to increase the cornea donation numbers and enhancing the data management at Dr. Schroff's by establishing two new eye collection centers and by technically improving the data management of the eye bank and the cornea collection centers. And while we do this in our project, we are sharing a lot of knowledge about our processes and best practices in eye donation and banking. And this is really an exchange on at eye level where we learn that working in a multidisciplinary team and having diverse perspectives is a very positive thing when we speak about different conditions, regulations, and cultural aspects that can have an impact on cornea donation. This is definitely thinking outside of the box and it makes us grow together in diversity. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Anna, for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation because here we see, uh, I think we all should identify iBanking as a business model. Unless we are self-sustainable, uh, it is very difficult to you know, go ahead because uh, we are aware of a lot of community iBanks in India and uh, they are on, on this model only. So, uh, Dr. Manisha, uh, can, you, can we have a quick comment uh, from you uh, since you are... Um, associated with the the eye banking process here. 
Yeah, uh, I think uh, Anna has beautifully uh, told us and what we learned uh, when we had the collaboration was that uh, having a central center and having sent, uh, sort of eye collection centers a little remotely helps you sustain from different calamities which may be uh, in the form of uh, like a COVID pandemic which may have some sort of peak in one area and not having a peak at that particular point at another area. And that's something we learned. And obviously, the uh, the model of uh, having a centralized eye bank with eye collection centers is the need of the art, rather than mushrooming of a lot of eye banks, which are not uh, able to collect as much as uh, is needed to be a self-sustainable eye bank. Because sustainability remains the key for any eye bank uh, to uh, survive. And yes. that's been one of the learnings uh, we've had and we're trying to learn from each other. That's what we say. Learning from diversity is the most important uh, lesson I've learned through all these years. Dr. Radhika, a quick comment. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, it's a very nice presentation and this is a, a good initiative to sort of join forces and have a centralized uh, task force or a technical coordinating team which can help to maintain standards, improve collaboration and, uh, you know, rather than having, it's not like it's simply a consortium, it's kind of having a driving force centrally and then sort of spreading the wings and the network to give people a kind of a branded system that because you have a standard quality control and you can extend your reach so um, all these kind of models are the way we have to go for future yeah yeah thank you yeah so with this we uh, move on to our uh, next talk of today uh, need for sustainable eye banking in the face of tissue constraints um, eric uh, your turn thank you Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, uh, uh, last time I was here, uh, about a year ago, I believe, we talked a little bit about some of the things that Eversight had done in response to COVID, but this is a little bit more focused on some of the issues that we've come up because of the tissue scarcity with COVID. We'd like to start every one of our presentations with our mission statement, which is we restore sight and prevent blindness through the healing power of donation, transplantation, and research. So the gift of sight being a public health priority. This Eversight is one of the largest nonprofit eye banks in the world. And you can see that while we have a significant global impact, there's still a lot more blue than there is orange on this map. So the orange pins are where we actually place tissue and the blue is in areas that you know, still are underserved. And this is sort of the problem is that we're, we're looking at one country trying to provide tissue to a large audience in face of about 10 million corneally blind. And um, in these things like the pandemic have caused issues and constraints on that. Back that up, you can see the EBAA statistical reports. Now you can see right before the pandemic, everything's humming along just fine. We're seeing significant growth across the board. Uh, but then the pandemic hit and you'll notice that the gray bar, which is surgeries that are performed in the United States from US tissue, while lower is not nearly as low as invariance is the red bar, which is the tissues that are performed outside of the US from tissues that are recovered in the US. <clears throat> Put a number to that, we're just under about 30,000 per year prior to the pandemic from US recovered corneas. And then the next year, that number dipped down to almost half with just over 15,000. They are, the numbers are recovering and the, the unpublished 2021 data does show there's recovery, but still the recovery rate while in the United States for tissue that's staying in the US is very similar to what it was before. Now the tissue that's going outside of the US is still significantly hampered and is not at recovering at the same rate. So this again under, underlines the importance of, or it underlines the problem that US IBEC cannot, cannot be a source of tissues for the world. Again, 30,000 corneas a year versus 10 million corneally blind. So we talk about the global cornea health blindness problem. So millions of people around the world suffer, like I said, roughly about 10 million. It is the leading cause of preventable blindness. 90% of a hugely disproportionate amount are affected by lower income countries and with a wide variety of infectious and non-infectious diseases. 
capacity needs to be built because again, this is not sustainable. 53% of the world has absolutely no access to corneal transplants and very few countries are self-sufficient. Fewer still are in the position to be able to actually export tissue to help around the world. So we're really talking about importation as a short-term solution. And it's really even only to the fortunate few that are capable of finding an importation source. This eye banking infrastructure is lacking in most countries. And that's one of the biggest problems when you look at it. Substantial untreated corneal blindness throughout the world. I mean, I think that's, that's sort of an understatement when we look at this. And it's the most vulnerable are disproportionately affected. I mean, we're, we're looking at areas that, do, that need it the most are also the ones that don't have the means to provide it. The corneas are really, in most of these places, the barrier. The surgeons are trained well enough to be able to at least offset some of the, the vision loss if they had proper tissue, but they just don't have access to it. Um, so really effective eye banking systems are the only way to make, corneal, to make corneas available in curing global blindness. So as I said before, we've had a significant supply issue when it comes to COVID, but COVID's really only part of the story. I said we saw a decreased donor pool because of risk assessment, screening possibilities. There's additionally increased barriers to enter different countries. So a lot of countries, when they saw COVID, they started well, through a lack of understanding of how the process really worked from all over the world. They started shutting down different um, entry parts. So we things like would require COVID testing or other risk assessments that were not there before. So even if the tissue was available, there were some there were some processes put in place by the country that were preventing the tissue from even getting to the end user. Life expectancy is another significant issue. So you can see in 1992, and as a, as a statement here, a lot of the eye banks in the United States have a cutoff age limit of about 75. Well, back in 92, that average life expectancy was right there. So the population was, more of the population was falling into that. As medicine is getting better, we're starting to see that as right now, it's more like 79 years old. So the average life expectancy puts the average death to be outside of the 75 and under category. Now, other eye banks are increasing this to try and get more tissue supply, but you know, there's sort of a, a mixed bag as to where is the age limit, where's the break off where we're starting to see a declination in tissue quality and suitability. Projected estimates have in 30 years that that number will actually reach to almost 84 years old, which will put them well outside of just about everyone's recovery. So, <clears throat> so the other problem is that even countries, that there are some countries out there that through importation and have the means financially to sustain their programs in their country, they're now finding issues with the limited supply. So even places that have resolved this issue locally are now finding themselves in a position where they can't readily get the tissue as easily as they could before. One of the other huge problems that's happened is that, as I spoke before, areas that are um, underserved are disproportionately also the areas that are in lower economic status. Well, this pandemic with the decrease in tissue, and not only that, but cost in shipping has increased. The cost in shipping has not only increased to get the product to the end user, get the coins to the end user, but it's also the equipment necessary for the eye banks to do the recovery. So all of these little incremental costs are increasing the, cost, the price of the tissue. Additionally, flights are not as readily available. We're seeing significantly more delays in shipping from all sorts of sources, airlines, FedEx, DHL, UPS, we're all seeing increased uh, delays and an inability to get tissue into places the way that we had before. So with fewer available tissues, the lower fee out places that are underwritten by full fee outlets in, in other areas are now finding themselves in a more desperate need than they were before. And this is a significant problem. Um, it's basically, kind of, the increased costs are basically getting to the point that they're pricing out all of these underserved markets, the people that need it the most. So the question is, what do we do about it? Well, self-sustaining eye banking is the only long-term solution. There's really no way that we're going to ever get importation as a means to help out. The advantages that we have here, though, are that there are more cultures that are accepting of donation now than there ever have been work with organizations like MOTEP in the United States have increased minority donations to the same basic levels that we're seeing with other cultures. 
Muslim culture increase has been really accepting in the last five years. So that's a significant advantage considering how large the population of the Muslim world is in the world. Realistically, we've got to be prepared because you never know what's going to hit next. Could be another pandemic, could be something else that we have no idea about. Three years ago, not a person on this panel, I think, really thought that a pandemic of this nature could even exist in these times, much less shut us down in the ways that it has. Thankfully, we're recovering, but I think it's really taught us a lot of lessons. And the development project can be very, very lengthy, so it's never too soon to start. The other advantage that we really have in this day and age is that the social media campaigns are better than they have ever been. And the concept of social responsibility is at an all-time high with the current generations of people thinking in, in general around the world. So really, sustaining in your country is one thing. Sustaining in your city is great. Sustaining in the country is better. We need to look at regional and even global sustainability. And this means that collaboration across everyone. Not one person can do this. So we really need to get together and think through how we're going to pull this out. Um, integrate and align iBank development to have sustainable goals. Sustainability is really the key to all of this. We can't just go in there, start something, and then have it fall away. We need champions and leaders that are going to really push us forward and not drop the ball and make sure that it gets moving forward in every way. And then we need studies and codification of best practices for designing, implementing donation programs, specifically with cultural context. And the example that we have as an organization is our focus on the Muslim communities, the efforts we've put in to try and increase the donation in that area. With that, I uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak on this topic. And there's my email. You can always contact me if anything. And I encourage anyone to reach out if you have any questions or thoughts. Thank you, Eric. Uh, that was quite an enlightening talk. And uh, uh, Dr. Rekha, if you are there, we can have a quick comment from Dr. Rekha Gyanchan. OK, so Raki, would you like to say anything? Any questions uh, for Eric? Uh, Dr. Swati, uh, no questions as such, but very interesting presentation. And yeah. we look forward to more insights from Eversite and their global work, which they are doing. Absolutely. So, thank you Absolutely. for joining. That, that was an amazing talk, Eric. And uh, I hope uh, we reach to that level of, uh, because we had, um, during the COVID times, we, we did uh, saw a greater dip in India as compared to what you showed. The figures were really, really encouraging. And uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, Partly because uh, uh, we we were stuck uh, maybe a little more than others, and uh, that could be one reason. Dr. Radhika, a very nice talk, Eric, and uh, wish you all the best for uh, these endeavors to spread the you know concept of uh, sustained eye banking. And this is something which uh, everybody has to realize that. Um, you know, there is a cost involved in, you know, taking that gift of sight from the donor's family to the recipient. Uh, and one has to think of ways and means of doing that. And every person who is in a position to donate, the process has to be facilitated by having a good quality eye bank, either directly accessible or through a network. So there's a lot to learn. And I think um, with the US experience, uh, Europe's experience, India, Australia, all the experience coming together, I think we'll finally get there. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. So we, with this, we move on to the next talk uh, by Josie. And she's going to speak on strengthening the continuum of care to eliminate corneal blindness. Over to you, Josie. Thank you so much, Swati. And let me just... I apologize, I am not seeing an option to share, uh, if share my cover, presentation. Cover your cursor at the lower edge of the Zoom screen and then a little black uh, sort of bar will come up and then there'll be a green thing saying share screen. So just- Oh, there we go. Thank you so much, Radhika. Mm -hmm.
Excellent. Well, good evening to those of you in Asia and um, good good morning and, and good day to those of you from around the world. It is such a pleasure to join this evening and uh, following Eric's conversation and, and talk, um, really a, a little bit of a, a gear switch um, to talk just about our role in, in ensuring that all individuals who suffer from corneal disease have access to care. Um, and talking a little bit about some of the work that SiteLife has done in partnership um, with, uh, with eye hospitals um, in India and Nepal to really bolster the continuum of care. So according to the National Blindness and Visual Impairment Survey in India, corneal opacity is the leading cause of blindness for ages zero to 49 and the second leading cause overall. Um, it has a huge impact on working age population. And we see this in, in low and middle income countries around the world as well. Huge impacts on our youth, um, on those who are in their prime working age, and the impacts of, of blindness on that age group um, can be absolutely devastating, whether it is um, inability to get, get a job um, because of, of blindness or some type of scarring um, where people are discriminated against or lack of ability to go to school, get married, et cetera. Just massive impact. Um, and such a, such a huge impact on the working age and youth population. And when we drill into those causes of, of blindness, um, we, we understand too that in the infectious keratitis and trauma uh, account for a combined total of 68.6% of corneal blindness in India. And yet these causes are largely preventable. Uh, if you look at the same combination in China, it's over 80% of the cause of corneal blindness. Um, and if you contrast this with, um, with what we see in Western countries, we often see these numbers as less than 10 or even less than 5% of the need for transplantation. Um, while tissue supply has increased in, in the absence of, of the pandemic, and it has increased substantially in many low and middle income countries over the last 10 years, there remains a delta. And in general, we are also um, we are also using a lot of tissue supply um, and for, for causes of corneal blindness and disease that often don't have very good outcomes in transplantation as well. Um, and so as we look at this continued delta between tissue supply and tissue demand, and especially with the, the impacts of the pandemic over the last couple um, of years and huge tissue shortages at various periods of time as the waves of the, the pandemic have hit, there's more that we can do to ensure that only those who absolutely require transplants get them um, by really bolstering the continuum of care. Um, and, and historically in, in eye banking, we've really focused on the top of the pyramid. So if we think about the pyramid of, of care, um, we think about corneal surgeons and ophthalmologists providing that subspecialty care and that surgical management. And of course, only transplants are provided by corneal specialists. But we have an entire and an entire pyramid of eye and healthcare specialists that can really lean in to provide support and prevent progression to transplants, particularly in cases of, of eye trauma, where individuals may have a scratch in the eye um, and what they really need is access to topical antibiotics so that that does not progress to requiring a transplant. And so it's really important that we as a sector really focus on how we engage our community health workers, our ophthalmic nurses, our AOPs 
in corneal care, appropriate corneal care, um, to ensure that people are not progressing to corneal blindness. So a lot of this is about task shifting um, to other catters to ensure timely, affordable corneal care when patients need it. Um, this is a, an image of a general ophthalmologist in China who went through a multi-day training that, uh, that Site Life put together that was specifically targeted at medical management of corneal disease. So not looking at surgical interventions, but recognizing that in a, in a country like China, there are only about a hundred corneal specialists in the country and only about 40 trained corneal surgeons. So the, the mismatch in the population who need corneal care with those who have subspecialty training to care for corneal patients is, is vast. And in China, the catter that felt like the, the right opportunity to train for more of that medical management was general ophthalmologist. So really understanding too, in the context of the country, what, who is the right catter, what what can and should they do and working with corneal specialists to understand and design the training for whether it be general ophthalmologists, AOPs, optometrists, um, to really support in that medical management of care and particularly where there's um, early stage infection, are there individuals who can really help to uh, support the treatment of corneal disease? And so in China, we have targeted general ophthalmologists. Um, in Nepal, we are about to launch a training in collaboration with the National Association of Ophthalmic Assistants. Um, and, in, um, uh, and in Ethiopia, we'll be focusing on training ophthalmic nurses. Um, so really excited to begin building more capacity among different catters uh, at that primary at the secondary and primary care level for corneal care. But we can't forget about the, the importance of addressing this at the community level as well. And over the last five years, SiteLife has been working to translate research, a clinical research project from the Proctor Foundation, um, which trained community health workers to identify corneal abrasions and provide topical antibiotic ointment treatment um, if, if an abrasion was um, discovered. Um, and we have seen remarkable um, success in, in this program. Uh, currently, we're working in, in four districts in Nepal um, and in the Sitapur district in Uttar Pradesh, India. And in this time, um, we have our site life trained community health workers have provided first aid eye care to over 50,000 low resource neighbors in rural India and Nepal, ensuring that people don't have to leave their communities to get access to first aid eye care. But if they require more intensive care, they have a clear referral pathway to a tertiary level eye hospital that can ensure that they get the appropriate access to care. And this, this simple intervention um, has resulted in a 96% success rate in resolving corneal abrasions um, with a three-day course of antibiotic ointment um, via Aplicaps that the patients are able to, um, to administer after the identification of corneal abrasion um, and ensuring that those whose abrasions don't resolve are referred in to the appropriate level of care. Additionally, this year, this last year, we added uh, training to identify pediatric uh, corneal disease and ensure a focus. And we have seen a, an over a, a 10 times growth in the number of 
pediatric patients that are coming to be seen at the community health worker, um, at their local community health worker with ASHA, the ASHAs, um, and then be referred in to hospitals for additional treatment. Uh, so we're supporting the most vulnerable people who can't leave their communities um, and preventing our, our, our women and children um, and working age population from progression to corneal blindness. So, so what can we do? Um, one, work with work with our networks, with our partners to ensure that when we think about corneal care, we are integrating not only at the tertiary level, but also looking about how we provide training, um, appropriate level training at the secondary, primary, and community level. Um, Partner, partner with, with SiteLife, we are looking to expand these programs, looking for, for ways to grow um, this work. We believe it is critical to, to honor the loved ones um, who give their, their families corneas, as, as, um, as we heard earlier, um, and, and finally advocate. The only way can, we can truly integrate corneal care and eye care at the primary and community level is if it is integrated into the broader primary healthcare system. And so we need partners to advocate for that inclusion. Thank you so much and, and look forward to answering any questions there might be. Thank you, Josie. I think um, SiteLife has changed the scenario of eye banking, not only in India, but um, you know globally and um, we're really thankful for introducing to a lot of new things and a lot of new business models that came with the site life and uh, we all got adapted to it so it's actually um, congratulations to you for doing an immense uh, you know work globally all around so um, a quick um, uh, I think uh, Neeti is here and uh, Neeti, would you like to say something? Or Dr. Nilesh, you are here. Oh, yeah, Neeti, yeah, please. Neeti, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I would say that, yes, Site Life has done a, a, a like, mm -hmm. uplift the eye banks in India and it has actually uh, improved, helped in improving a lot of eye banks. And we are all now following the model uh, in collaboration with, like, uh, the public-private partnership model, which they have started, so it's very, very good. Yeah, Dr. Nilesh. Yeah, thank you, Swati. It was a very nice talk, uh, Josie. I mean, really, uh, SiteLife has been very closely associated with us also when we started things at our place, and uh, really, this model is now, I think, being followed, whether you are there or not. This kind of a model is being followed so that gives more of a productive uh, result and uh, more i would say utilizing the limited resource what we have so really it has been a great job and uh, i think we would look forward to uh, work in the way you had uh, partnered with us absolutely we all are looking forward to it <laughs> thank you dr Nilesh. thank you josie thank uh, you so much so we move on to our uh, next talk. Small changes in eye bank policies can have a huge impact on HCRP by Dr. Neeti Gupta. Neeti. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swati. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I would be talking about the changes in the eye bank policies, how they have impacted, like especially our model, which we have we have uh, started in at Ames Rishikesh. So uh, the eye bank model for India was given in 2010 by uh, Dr. Rao and the and Sangwan et al. of around one eye bank over 20 million population for the collection of two lakh corneas. And uh, this was uh, the study published by Nam uh, Sh Namrata Sharma et al. That, uh, where they studied around 12 best eye banks of India in 2013-14. And they saw that out of this 20,000 uh, eyeballs collected, basically most of the eye banks were still falling, were dependent more on voluntary donation, which has now improved over, uh, over the years. And the whole globe was uh, mainly the uh, 
type of retrieval mk media was the uh, most common uh, preservative media with a utilization rate of 50.5% and most of the uh, i banks in the west as well as in uh, the most popular i banks in india have shown us that most corneal retrieval through hcrp was of optical grade tissue and hospital cornea retrieval program is the way to go for the i banks and also uh, the similar thing has been shown by the rieb i bank at hyderabad as well as purva uh, the i bank in uh, west bengal when where they showed that when they started uh, on the hcrp program their uh, collection as well as the quality of the tissues they improved so with this background uh, we started a uh, i bank at aims rishikesh and aims rishikesh is a thousand bedded multi speciality hospital and we collaborated uh, with uh, uh, hans foundation as our financial financial collaborator and lv prasad as the technical guidance and uh, they built a state of art i bank at aims rishikesh where we had all these facilities which are needed for a good i bank and we got the hota on 20th august 2019 and we started functioning from 26th august 2019 so we had uh, four counselors who were trained at lv prasad and they used to work 24/7 with our post graduate of thalmology residents and we had two dedicated uh, phone phone uh, numbers to our i bank and we also obtained a noc from the for the mlc cases from the superintendent of police from dehradun for the medical legal cases so this is the overall performance of our i bank for two years and two months as we could not work for around 10 months because aims was also a covid facility so we were not uh, admitting other patients at our hospital so we had to close the i bank during these waves of covid so during this year we had collected 332 corneas out of which 75% was from hcrp and 46% were mlc cases and we did around 184 transplant uh, we are mostly we were doing penetrating keratoplasties and we distributed 34 corneas in the state of uttarakhand with a u total utilization rate of 53.11% so uh, i would divide this like initially when we started the i bank we were we uh, approached uh, we had the policy of approaching all deaths we adopted this policy uh, of approaching all contra, uh, all the cases irrespective of whether they were contraindicated or useful to use this opportunity uh, for increasing awareness among the public also sensitizing our hospital staff as the i bank was very new in the hospital and also to facilitate resident training program as we could use the contraindicated cases for medical education also we had a hcrp register at our i bank which was maintained by the i donation counselors and the counselors they used to write all the details of the deaths they were approaching who informed them then what was the reason cause of death in which ward or where they were uh, in, uh, they went for the call and what was the reason for no, uh, not donating or donation when it happened then most of the cases we uh, start we did in situ excision for all useful cases and we used to retrieve eyeballs for contraindicated cases also mk media was the main uh, media for the utilization and we also we were also using cornisol at that time and more than 12 hours we were considering as time lapse if the body was not refrigerated so in the pre covid era uh, the, uh, that is the first 7 months of our working we had collected 154 corneas 80% was hcrp mlc was only 27% and we did 76 transplant we distributed 12 corneas in the state so you can see the utilization rate of our i bank was 39.6% so we analyzed our um, work and we we had published this in igo and we found out the areas where we were weak so during the analysis we found out that around 12.63% of the deaths were just informed by the hospital staff although after very uh, so many awareness activities in the hospital still we our counselors used to get very less calls from the hospital staff and they used to identify most of the death during the rounds and so they uh, the the counselors they missed around 27% of the deaths this we recorded from the hospital death record as well as from the hcrp record so uh, uh, that, that this was the time when covid happened and uh, we came to we from the hospital authorities we came to know that all the deaths were informed to the security guards and they had a whatsapp group where they used to inform about the death so we included our i bank counselors name in that group so that they can get all the information about the death in the hospital 
then second thing which was very interesting was that around 46% of the cases were useful which were counsel counseled by the adcs and there were more contraindicated cases which were counseled by them so on uh, since uh, one of the performance indicators of the edc is the number of the cases they counseled on verbal communication with the counselors we came to know that they were very stressed when they were counseling useful cases as they were afraid that if the case does uh, like if this is not converted into donation then uh, it would affect their performance and when they were counseling contraindicated cases they were very cool and they were used to do it very uh, nicely because they were not afraid of the outcome so we changed our policy of from approaching all cases to only approaching useful cases then the third thing because of covid the guidelines had come and so we were preserving all of the all the corneal tissues in cornisol rather than in the mk media or we were transferring from mk media once we got the reports so the pres preservation time also increased to 14 days then death to preservation time also increased because all the bodies since aims was the covid facility so all the bo uh, bodies from the um, aims hospital were uh, transferred to the mortuary and our counselors were basically focusing on the mortuary so uh, for 24 hours we could uh, do the retrieval and you can see that a major part of the corneas were also were more than 12 hours and when we analyzed the optical quality of these tissue we saw that 64% were of good quality right they were optical grade so during the covid uh, if we analyze the covid data then we saw that the number of eye donors were the corneas which we collected during the covid time was 178 and this was again maximum was hcrp but the uh, major impact was that 65% of that was from the mlc cases and we did transplant most of them were therapeutic because we had to cater emergency surgeries during that time and we distributed around 22 cornea still in the state to other corneal surgeon and you can see that our utilization rate had increased to 66.29% so when we compared this thing that in the previous 7 months we had 154 corneas in the post covid 16 months we had just 178 corneas but the important thing is that we could get 65% from the medical legal cases and the uh, cornea for medical research or the corneas which we were discarding had decreased because we were approaching only useful cases so the utilization rate increased to 66.29% so to conclude uh, that while it is easy to start an eye bank it is essential to be aware of the trends and challenges one faces after the after the eye bank is set up and the challenges are uh, many but uh, they can be overcome by proper implementation of the strategies and we found out that approaching useful cases and also medico legal cases which is already known actually is the key to increase the utilization thank you thank you dr neeti for that elaborate and very effective and um, very informative talk we have paucity of time so we would take up questions if we have time in the end and uh, we move on to our next talk by uh, rakhi natawat on advocacy and policy planning to target the goal of eliminating corneal blindness by 2030 rakhi please is my screen visible yes yes yeah. so i think uh please remove your virtual background map i'm just removing that thank you so thank you aios and thank you ebi for providing me the opportunity to talk about advocacy and policy planning to target the goal of eliminating corneal blindness by 2030 So, just an introduction. India was the first country in the world to launch the national program for control of blindness in 1976, with the goal of reducing blindness prevalence to 0.3 percent by the year 2020. So, we were the pioneers, basically, when we talk about the NPCB. In 1999, the WHO launched Vision 2020, the right to sight, a joint endeavor with IAPB to eliminate avoidable blindness by 2020. significant evidence on the magnitude of blindness and visual impairment through large population based survey are available for india as well as on the south asia region if we look at the leading cause of blindness cataract still remains the same but in the past two decades we have seen improved cataract surgical rates and quality of the cataract surgery has uh, drastically improved 
if we talk about the eye care infrastructure and availability of the of the appropriate human resources we have a significant variance variance across the region talking about the adequate focus on health system strengthening boosting the primary eye care and monitoring and evaluation mechanisms will definitely be imperative for realizing the goal of eliminating blindness from the region in the coming years if we look at the data from the global distribution of blindness and visual impairment survey in by in 2010 india is a sec, is is the second highest number uh, china being the first in the visual impairment this is a world map showing the leading indication for the corneal transplantation if we look at the region india and the southeast asia the uh, infectious keratitis is the is the re main reason for the corneal blindness in our country this is again a latest survey from national blindness and visual impairment survey by the ministry of health and family welfare uh, which talks about that corneal opacity is a major cause of blindness in population aged 0 to 49 years if we talk about the sustainable development goals by united nations vision makes an important contribution to, to our 2030 agenda for sustainable development and it cuts across many of the sustainable development go goals if we talk about the poverty reductions talk about economic growth employment education gender reducing inequalities everywhere vision is very important it is therefore crucial that the countries adopt a whole of government approach to vision and we need to include eye health in the implementation of the sdgs at the national level as well if we talk about the SDGs in uh, specifically, if we see goal number one, which is no poverty, goal number two, which is zero hunger, and goal number eight, which is decent work and economic growth. Improved vision enhances the economic productivity, it raises the long-term household spendings, increases the household income, and therefore leading to an overall improvement and reducing the poverty, hunger, and promoting the growth. If we look at the goal number three, which is good health and well-being, it helps sustain the mental health and contribute to health targets on neglected tropical diseases, NTDs, financial pr protection, and health workforce. So it is therefore a significant driving force. And if we look at the target of SDG tag, which, is, which talks about uh, 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 reducing the number of global deaths and injuries from road traffic accident, vision plays a very important role there again. Talking about the quality education, Giving a child a pair of properly prescribed glasses can improve attendance and performance at equivalent to half a year of schooling, a big difference in, in not only in the life of the child, but in the total country's economy as well. If we talk about gender equality, reducing inequalities, blindness and visual impairment plays a very important role. So what is the problem basically? So the problem when we talk about eye care is, it is very poorly integrated with the health system. Problem is of availability, accessibility, and acceptability of eye care services. If we talk about the need, the need is greater in the rural areas, but services are often provided in hospitals in urban areas. So patient can't reach to the hospital at the right time and lack the uh, treatment. So coming to the main topic of policy changes favoring cornea donation, it's nothing new. We, are keep, we keep talking about these things and now is the time where we start enforcing again on these policy changes. First is the mandatory death notification, which talks about any death which takes place in a hospital should be mandatory notified to nearest eye bank for the eye donation counseling. If we still look at the THOTA Act, it still has the required request law, law, which talks about any death taking place in the ICU needs to be counseled for the organ and the eye donation but not many people are aware about it. Not many eye banks are aware about it. So we need to start focusing on that as well. Required request law typically mandates that hospital utilizes the accepted medical standards in articulating policies for identification of potential organ donors. So if these two laws are in place and we start focusing on them, the number of deaths notified to the counselors will increase, which will definitely uh, increase the number of cornea donations in the country. The, the, an, an, another very important change which can be brought is the first person consent. Currently, any person who is even pledging the eye or an organ, the first person consent is not allowed. 
It's only if the next of the kin agrees for the donation, the cornea or the organ can be donated. This one change can actually dramatically increase the number of donors in the country because then the pledges will actually convert into donations. Access to trauma centers, mortuaries, and the mandatory HCRP at large and medium mortality hospitals. We all have learned in past 10 years that HCRP is the way to go. Counseling the families at the right time by a trained counselor is the way to increase the cornea donation. So if by law, the eye banks can get access to trauma centers and mortuaries, this one single change can drastically improve the number of cornea donations in the country. Telephonic consent. Currently, the telephonic consent don't have a legal status in the country. But if the telephonic consent is allowed, we can start a call center approach, which can be used to counsel the family members, directly again impacting the actual number of cornea donation. Cost coverage of cornea donation. We all understand that cornea donation currently is not a self-sustainable activity and every improvement needs money. So the major hurdle in the professional development of iBank is the cost reimbursement of all expenses. Donations from philanthropists and grant from government is not sufficient to run iBank and make it self-sustainable. Government currently provides 1,000 rupees per cornea collection to the iBank, which is not actually uh, sufficient to sustain an iBank. So if cost coverage is legalized in the form of cornea processing fee, this will surely enhance the standards of iBanking all across the region. One of the, again, uh, when we talk about cornea, we all understand that based in, uh, dependent on the media which we are using, it remains viable for four to 14 days. Unfortunately, if there's not a demand of specific cornea with a certain time limit, it may get unutilized if the surgeons are not uh, taking that tissue in from that region. So it is beneficial that this cornea is made available to other recipients as well. Uh, CDS by Sight Life has played a very important role there while the tissue from North India was moving to South India, from South India moving to the Eastern part of the countries as well. But this also requires a framework for exchange of information. This can be conceptualized as a national waitlist registry, which can ensure that best use of every available cornea, reducing the wastage and smoothen the geographic disparity of cornea availability. And EBI in collaboration with NOTO and NPCB can be a nodal agency to maintain such a registry. The issue of tapping into opportunities provided by the pledged organ donation. We all know that eye banks go uh, do a lot of activities of the pledging of the eye to eyes, and we get uh, every eye bank must be getting 100 to 200 forms every month. But what actually happens once the person is filling up the pledge form? Because they, that doesn't materialize into an actual eye donation. So how will authorities dealing with life and death ever get this information that this person has pledged the corneas? The latest amendment in the Central Motor Vehicle Rules in 2018 is a laudable step in this direction because it mandates the capturing of this information and indicating it on the driving license. As per my information, this is currently applicable in Gujarat, uh, Rajasthan, uh, Punjab as well. Uh, and they, there the RTO is, uh, uh, has put this as a form where any person who is going for a driving license, uh, they have to uh, take this um, uh, option of that whether they want to donate or not. Raki, so, uh, the time is over. Oh, so, I just, uh, just, yeah, just wind up, yeah. In general, the Aadhaar card is the most frequently used document for identification, and this can de facto become a national donor registry. So this is something which we can talk about with the government as well. Um, this is the latest uh, guest editorial in the policy framework for advancing eye banking and corneal transplantation in IJO, which talks about a lot of policy frameworks. So request if you people can go and uh, read this article as well. Um, key factors for successful advocacy, as you all know, is generation of evidence, credible eye care leadership, engagement with the policy leaders, alignment with health and development agenda, and to have a media strategy and ambassador. And, uh, and I know that in, in the able leadership of Dr. Radhika, Dr. Basak sir, Dr. Namrita Sharma, we can start working on a successful advocacy program for eye banking and corneal transplantation. Um, conclusion, the potential of cornea donation and transplantation in the country has yet to be optimized. We have to control measures through existing policy exist, but need an enhancement through the policy changes. 
And to resolve the problem of corneal blindness, India needs to fast track the policy changes. In short, more organizations we can assemble together to say, we want this, the stronger will be the message to the government. So that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raki. Hime, uh, since everybody has joined in from the other session, uh, what do you think that we can have just two quick questions or we can have another one? Because Dr. Namrita is not here. And uh, uh, ma'am, uh, since people have already joined in, yeah. I would request that if we can kindly give them also their due time. Okay. Right, uh, right. Yeah. Okay. So, right. so thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, Thank you, our chairpersons, the panelists, and the speakers uh, for this. And uh, um, we, we hope to see you soon again. And thank you, everybody who has joined in from outside India at uh, different timings. Thank you so much. And we quickly take a group picture. Uh, Atul, uh, can you just do the needful? And while the group picture is being clicked. Yes, sir. All right. We all, all need to... Uh... Uh, face the camera and smile. Adul, picture is done? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the uh, picture and thank you. I thank everybody for being virtually present here. Uh, namaste. And we will get quickly uh, ahead with the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank uh, you. For the next session, uh, Dr. Rohit Saxena. Well, Welcome you on the virtual platform. We have our expert panel, Dr. Ramesh, mm -hmm. Dr. Sujata, Dr. Love, Dr. Elizabeth, and Dr. Jitender. Dr. Pradeep Agarwal. We have Dr. Sashikan Shetty, Dr. Shubhangi Bhave, Dr. Sunaina, Dr. Varsha Pandey, and Dr. Leela Mohan. I would li now like to hand over the virtual dais to our moderator, Dr. Rohit Saxena. And I request you to please uh, invite the first speaker. The virtual dice is all yours, sir. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Hamid. Uh, and thank you, AIOS, for uh, giving this uh, opportunity to our POS and experts from all over the world to be a part and of this wonderful conference, conference and conclave. And uh, I act and thank my expert panel who's here. We hope to take some interesting questions. Uh, and we, of course, have some outstanding speakers. So we'll start with uh, the talks and we will uh, discuss a little bit after every talk and hopefully have some time in the end to take on more questions. So my first speaker, Dr. Faru Kork, is the medical director for Quality Eye, uh, of Quality Eye Institute, University Hospital and Division Chief of Pediatric Ophthalmology, UH Rainbow Babies and Children Hospital. He's widely recognized for his clinical expertise and is listed in the best doctors of America since 2009, an outstanding achievement besides being listed among the top doctors and who's who of, uh, uh, of America. His research interests comprise almost all aspects of pediatric ophthalmology, and he has received numerous grants, awards, and holds a patent for a novel glaucoma device. He has several other patents on drug delivery, eye imaging, wound healing, and other therapeutic technologies. So uh, wonderful to have you talking to us about utilization of UBM in clinical practice. Thank you, Dr. Sasena, and, and I hope you can see my slides, and it's such an honor to be with you today. And, and again, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this fantastic organization. It's always a delight uh, to be with, with the family. So uh, namaste, and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and start uh, with that. Um, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about the utilization of the ultrasound biomicroscopy in clinical practice. Um, I do have, as you mentioned, some of them, some relevant financial disclosure, but they're generally grants um, and, and I do hold a patent on, uh, we do hold a patent on and some of the utilizations and acquisition that I'm going to discuss today. Um, before going into the UBM, maybe quickly uh, mentioning the ocular ultrasonography is, um, as a reminder, may not be a bad idea. And, and as you know, widely used uh, ultrasonography and the companies are increasing. So the technology is not going away and, and uh, we, we continue to utilize this fantastic technology and, and seems like it's evolving. Um, A-scan, which stands for amplitude, is widely used for uh, AC depth, the axial length, the eye wall calculations, and, 
and the B scan, the brightness um, uh, mode is, is fairly used. Uh, UBM is not a new technology. Um, it's been around um, uh, since 1990s, I would, I would say. And, um, and beyond that, there's color Doppler imaging. So these modalities are, are uh, maybe used a little bit more common in, in ophthalmology, but there are many other modes as C modes, M mode, pulse inversions, harmonic um, and contrast agents that, that are utilized in, in various different uh, disciplines. And, and, um, and I think we need to start tapping into those two for different various reasons. The ultrasound as we, as we use um, in the, um, the, the human body imaging um, ranges between the two and 100 and beyond megahertz. The lower the megahertz, the penetration is deeper. So for an abdominal ultrasound, you would actually use the two to four megahertz. The higher the megahertz, you have a lower penetration, but the resolution is higher. Um, hence the ultrasound biomicroscopy is 40 megahertz and beyond. A scenario like this, um, none of you are uh, um, unfamiliar with, with such a, so this is a patient with a trauma. Um, it may be high femur. In this case, there's fibrotic tissue in, in the AC. You have no idea what's going on in the back of the eye. So what do you do? The OCT would not um, help you. Um, direct visualization is impossible. CT scan MRI will, will not be really giving you that um, detail. Then, then we refer to the ultrasound as we use it. And that this is the B scan mode, as, as you all know. B scan is used for many things retinal detachments, tumors in the eyes, um, looking for calcium. And, and sometimes um, uh, strabismus surgeons like us they do use it to, to visualize the, the insertion of the muscle. And uh, that was eloquently kind of put by Dr. Stephen Kraft many, many moons ago, and many others. But UBM, the ultrasound biomicroscopy um, can um, allow better penetration through the iris and corneal opacities, as we mentioned, and um, especially to see the, the finer tissues like collector channels, um, apparently you do need even higher, like 80 megahertz or higher resolution or megahertz in that frequency. And what it looks like is, um, again, uh, there, this is, I think, a fantastic invention um, that you're seeing the clear scan that is put over the, uh, the probe itself, and it fits anything. I have no financial disclosure in that. Um, but it really allows you to, to uh, utilize the probe in any direction, and so in an upright or supine position. Um, I do, uh, though, uh, do deflate the, the, this balloon or uh, clear scan fairly much so, because if you have this tight... Um, configuration, uh, the balloon tends to push on the tissues and, and you will have um, uh, changes in the iris um, as well as the, the other tissues. And then you get an image like this on the right side. Um, and, and you can see the ciliary body, the processes, the iris, the cornea, the anterior chamber. So um, another example, this was a patient that was supposed to be an ROP examination for the first time I'm seeing this patient all of a sudden. Well, the, the patient is looking like this now, but uh, was opacified cornea. We didn't know what was going on. Well, UBM, um, as soon as we did it, it was a Peter's anomaly. Now we know um, what, what the condition is and how we deal with this. What you do is you do scan uh, the probe just like any other ultrasound back and forth to really understand what's going on. Uh, we do use the... Um, UBM in particular, uh, for every case that I do, intraocular surgeries or examiner anesthesias, if it's applicable. Um, but one thing we typically do is for um, particularly tube shunts. Um, whatever tube shunt you, you do utilize in, in, in glaucoma, you can actually really see where the tube is, where it's exiting, and, and the entire um, uh, traveling um, path that for the tube itself. Even you can look around the plate and, and see the differences. For example, this is a case that actually had a tube um, was, was exposed. You can see it. There is nothing magical about this portion. Uh, but as a habit, I did actually do a UBM. I said, well, I just want to see what else is going on. And it's, it's, this uh, is not a common thing that we see in pediatrics. Um, the, con the conjunctiva and the tenons tends to be a little more thicker. Um, and lo and behold, just underneath the tube, as you're seeing um, depicted in, in C1 and C1 there, uh, there was a scar tissue building underneath the area, uh, the, underneath the tube, and it was pushing the tube up. And if you didn't know that, um, probably you wouldn't understand exactly what the mechanism is, and just removing that really helped um, the pathology. 
it really helps us to really see, as in, in our case, I deal with pediatric population and, and we see them obviously grow. You put a tube, that the tube um, and, and the mechanism and, and the hardware does not grow, but the, but the patient does. Um, and really good to see uh, how we started, where we started and, and how the tube is. It's not uncommon as, as the eye does grow that the tube tends to kind of regress. And that's what we were seeing here. It's kind of regressing back, but we do see um, some uh, tube migration in, in, in different directions too. So you don't want it to be migrating uh, towards the eye and you wouldn't see this and you wouldn't know this un until you did a UVM. I, um, it really kind of shows you this detail in, 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 um, in good fashion. And also we've been uh, using um, to understand um, if the, after a tube shunt, um, if the glaucoma or the ILP is increasing, and we need to understand what the mechanism is, is the tube uh, not uh, functioning um, or other mechanism. One common thing that we do see is um, the, the, the bleb itself, the wall gets very thick. It really is a, a thick scar like a, a cardboard. And you can see how I'm mean, really cutting through this. And some of the, um, the, the, the scar tissue formation, so to speak, does grow into the, I, I use an Ahmed valve and it grows into this Ahmed valve too. So it really kind of shows you as you're seeing here, uh, what kind of a bleb that we're dealing with. And um, in the top left corner, you can see this very thick scar, again, depicted with C1. Um, and, and again, in the top right, you see this. In the lower one, um, the middle one in particular, you can see in the center, um, the, the Ahmed plate and a big, huge bleb around it with, with a relatively thinner um, um, uh, wall of the bleb itself. Uh, you can see that um, these two patients um, act and could act very differently. Um, for more adults, but we sometimes see this in pediatrics as well, but this was an adult patient. Uh, since I, um, I utilize the UBM quite a bit, um, the adult colleagues that do send many patients for me to image, so this is one patient that actually had this IOL haptic that had been in the partially in, or one haptic was, was in the sulcus itself and was rubbing against the iris. And, and you know exactly what's going on and, and the details. This is such another, another case, another UBM. This is again a sulcus lens. And in this case, again, the haptic itself was bent forward, uh, rubbing against the iris again, and, and then you can actually decide what you're going to do for the case. Um, it, it is actually fantastic in ultrasound um, in, in many masses, but particularly the angle, which is very tough to get to, um, as you're seeing here in the top left and the top right, um, that these are two different um, ways of scanning. Um, you can actually really define. This was a patient again in VA, um, an adult patient. They did actually see uh, serendipitously with a gonio examination, but the OCT didn't show any details. So we, we did a UBM. You can see exactly the, the internal reflectivity, the, the, the amount of or, and, and the extent of this tumor, and, um, and the patient was taken care of accordingly. Now, one step uh, beyond, and, and we do, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the um, three dimensional UBM. Uh, that we've been working in the last five years. Um, and you can see many things like iris cyst in the sense that uh, we are actually able to um, get uh, three dimensional images um, and these are two different cysts. Um, and the iris cyst com comes in, I'm going to go back to the 3D UBM in a, in a later slide, but just to show that the cysts and the cyst can come in, in a very different configuration. So actually this is not an iris cyst, but it was initially thought it was. And, and you're seeing this as kind of, uh, the, it was an epithelial downgrowth from a trauma, a corneal laceration that the patient had. And it caused this amazingly big um, cyst that was distorting the entire thing. And, and the UBM really kind of gives you the, the picture. And, and through that, we were able to remove it. And actually the patient did have one more surgery after this, and we did remove the lens as well and doing well with 20, 25 vision. Um, trauma. In trauma, it really, we utilize the UBM uh, very frequently. Obviously, you have to be careful and not to push on the eye, as, as we talked about, just like any other ultrasonography or any other modality. But um, this is if this is the actual normal eye um, of, the, of the same patient. And here we go. There's this uh, traumatic cataract, as you can see. I think it's very important to really see um, the extent of the trauma, that it really uh, affects uh, the 
um, anterior, where did it affect the anterior capsule? Did it affect the posterior capsule? Will allow you to plan the surgery accordingly and, and what kind of lens that you, you're able to put in the eye. And um, again, I'm going to talk about a little bit more, but this is our um, attempt on the 3D ultrasonography and I'll um, go a little bit more faster for the sake of time. Um, and we can zoom in, you can, when you have this NFOS image, you can actually turn it in any way and, and we really can see the details of the, the, the capsule and, and many other structures. And actually we did end up um, after removing the, the lens and uh, put a single piece IOL in the bag and because it allowed the, us to do it. And we, we could see that the capsule was intact and, and sure it was. Back to the three dimensional UBM that, that uh, we are lucky to be able to use. Um, we are getting thousand images and it, it could be 500, it could be 750, but we for some reason chose thousand images thousand images consecutively one after another um, through a devised um, model like this, and it could be really any kind of UPM. Then you put these thousand images together and you stitch it together and you just make this uh, one composite image. This is, was our first cadaver eye that we had imaged and, and, um, and, and, that's, uh, and you can see the details. And some of all actually does show a um, little bit more than the pieces that you see individually. For example, this this white ring that you're seeing is the scleral spur. You can see the details of, and I showed you the iris cyst, you can see the IOL um, inside the eye. You can even segment these uh, particular um, other devices as the IOL and really see the, the um, configurations around and, and the relationship of where, if there's a scar tissue around, if there is a, um, um, where the, does the haptic live and lie in, in a very better format. And we've done many validation studies. We've, we're doing iris segmentations. When you have a composite image like this, you can actually really look at the iris as a whole. And not only that, you can actually, um, we, we are able to look at the angle and calculate it. And if, if you have a 360 degree and, and composite image, then you have a heat map of the iris um, angle. And uh, we've been working on that and comparing with um, manual measurements as well. So AI is kicking in um, very significantly. And these are our attempts on looking at the ciliary body and processes, especially for um, uh, laser um, uh, cycloablation patients uh, to see the effect and potentially, or to see uh, different effects of different surgeries or the growth that, that is affecting on the eye. Um, and we are um, starting to measure volumetric um, uh, entities for, for, for various pathology as such. These are, again, um, some examples are of our validation. Um, we actually, um, just to kind of now, because we can do a volumetric measurement, so let's say I want to measure a volume of the tumor and to see if it's shrinking or is it uh, um, growing with, with treatments or just with time. Uh, but we have to start from somewhere. We said, well, anterior chamber um, is an is a easier place to start. And the ground truth, as you're seeing on the left eye, is the manual. So we had actually three, four um, people individually, pixel by pixel, defining the ground truth. And then we kick it to the AI, the deep learning. And the deep learning, as you can see, the difference was only two, uh, just three millimeter cube, uh, which is fairly remarkable. Um, the current technology that you're seeing so far um, has been utilizing the slow mechanical scanning. Um, I, I think the uh, ophthalmic ultrasonography is, is overdue to, to get to the next level because it is available. There, there are new technologies available that is not utilized in ophthalmology yet, uh, but it's going to be, uh, hopefully. And, and the new technology is actually can be 100 times more. There's no mechanical arm moving back and forth. It's just uh, the beam is, uh, the ultrasound beam is sent in a very fast fashion. And one more thing to kind of see is it does actually allow not a focused area, which actually is uh, defined by um, the, the settings of the ultrasound, the entire thing can be in focus. Then the next step could be maybe imaging the entire eye as is and, and, and then applying that. And these are uh, some of our attempts of applying the AI and deep learning. And the red one you're seeing on the left is the retinal detachment and the right is a foreign body in the eye and it can see these as well. And thank you. And, um, and again, one more time, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this session and, and, and namaste to all my colleagues. Thank you. Those were some uh, amazing pictures. The 3D reconstructions were great. Uh, we would have some strabismologists here on the panel. So uh, one question would be plaguing all of them. How good is the imaging of the extraocular muscles 
with a UBM, uh, uh, with the more advanced UBMs that we are having. We've struggled a bit with the conventional UBM that we have. And we've actually found an ASOCT better in trying to identify muscles position and whether they've been operated or not. So how would the yeah. more advanced UBMs compare? So you're absolutely right. Um, the First of all, the OCT, if you can utilize it, it's much faster. Um, there's no contact. Um, preparing the patient is much easier. Uh, you get actually more, um, again, scans per second unless you have a newer technology. So um, again, in any given time, I would probably go with that if you have the anterior segment OCT. Uh, but if you have an ultrasound that is portable, you can take it anywhere. Well, then the ultrasound takes over. Um, the resolution, I think it depends on what you're using. And, and um, so UBM is the, is the way to go. And, uh, but you can see very good detail. And, and um, especially if you can uh, composite this and, and take multiple images one after another, um, the resolution that we're getting with these 3D UBM in particular is, is down to 15 microns. So that's, that's fairly detailed. Great. Any any comments, uh, comment or two before we move on to the next speaker? That's one, Dr. Rohit. Uh, suppose if, if we, a small child, we leave that child a fake, and many times we see that there is a posterior synechia between the anterior uh, rec, uh, capsular rim and the iris. I would it be my thing? UBM would be a good tool to evaluate uh, for, before secondary IUL. Well? De definitely. And uh, I actually uh, routinely do this. Um, and uh, there are other slides that I didn't show. Um, you have to be careful. Um, I had a uh, few times that I thought I had enough space there. And, and when I looked with an endoscope, and I, that's another thing I try to do, um, to really kind of see one more time, if you have any hesitation um, to, to be 100% sure, but UBM does show you that. And it's so easy. And it really shows you where the scar tissue is. So you can actually even plan the incisions before you start. Um, and, and it's been extremely helpful uh, for, for any case, particularly uh, the secondary, secondary surgeries. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farooq. We'll probably come back. We'll go on to the next topic. Uh, and it's a pleasure to invite Dr. Saurabh Jain, who's a consultant of Thalmic Surgeon at the Royal Free Hampstead NHS Trust and holds an honorary appointment at the University College London Hospital. He has special expertise in all aspects of pediatric ophthalmology, adult strabismus, and cataract surgery, and has extensive research and publications, and is a regular speaker as most of the prestigious international meetings, places where I've had the frequent pleasure of uh, listening to him. He'll be talking to us about an extremely difficult condition uh, to manage, which is intra uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, and he'll be talking about transposition and strabismus secondary to INO. So... Uh, Dr. Sora, please. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Rohit, and to AIOS and APOS for kindly inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be with you all today and an excellent start for really amazing pictures. So my talk, like all Shabismus talks, is a lot more low tech. Okay, we're going to talk about what to do with people um, um, who have internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So this all started with this 59-year-old Caucasian woman I saw about five months ago, and she came to me with a progressive outward deviation of the left eye with associated double vision. She had MS, was diagnosed 10 years ago, but it was stable, so she uh, was off all treatment and was wheelchair-bound, and had a previous episode of left optic neuritis in uh, 2008, and since then she felt the vision had gone down in the left eye and was progressively turning outwards. Because of this new squint, she was now wearing a banger to foil, uh, given in another in another unit over her left eye to get rid of the diplopia. And this is what she looked like. This was her vision in Logma and in Snellen, essentially 615 in the right and 6 by 12 with a pinhole, but quite reduced 615 in the left with an associated uh, RAPD, loss of uh, color vision and pale disc, all of which you would see with previous optic neuritis. The right eye appeared. Um, to be better, although the vision was still not quite normal. And looking specifically now at her ocular deviation and motility, she had a right face turn with a head tilt and chin depression. She was finding it very difficult to read. And if you're wheelchair bound, you know, there's not a lot else you are going to be doing. You do need to be using your eyes for near, which is why it's so important that we give this lady the best possible ocular alignment we can. She had a large angle deviation, about 90 diopters for, uh, for near and, and a little bit less for distance, so much so that our orthopedist struggled to 
to measure it. And this is where really the, the challenge we had in front of us with this limitation of adduction in both eyes and this big exotropia, just to show you what she looked like. Uh, this is her looking to the right and you can see the abducting nystagmus in the right eye and looking to the left, you can see limitation of adduction in the right and the abducting nystagmus. So I'll just play this for you again. So here she is looking to the right. So you see the limitation of abduction in the left. And again, this big limitation of adduction in the right now looking to the left. And as I tell all my residents, there are very few things um, in an exam or in real life that give you loss of adduction only. And one of the things you should always consider is an INO. So just to show you what um, her motility looked like. So, you know, there you go. You see the huge limitation of adduction in both eyes, almost minus five really, and this adduction. So what do we do? What, what can we do for her to get rid of the diplopia? Well, the, the conservative treatment options, you'll be occluding one eye, she could continue doing that, but it's not great, especially if she's already has reduced vision in both eyes. You could use prisms, but it's too large a deviation, really. Anything more than 15 or 20 diopters, I find prisms can cause quite unacceptable uh, effects from the, from the edges. You could try toxin, but it's not a great treatment, I have to say. And if you toxin the LR, you will then also limit her abduction as well as her adduction, therefore actually reducing your field of BSV. If you're going to do something surgically, and we, you know, we don't always talk about surgery in things like myasthenia or INO, because there's a, there's a perception that a lot of these will get better. And yes, 50% of them do get better. But a stable INO with a large angle deviation would be perfectly reasonable to list for a surgical procedure. You could do a large recess resect. You could augment this with a uh, posterior fixation suture. You could maybe do a periosteal fixation to the anterior lacrimal crest uh, medially, but then again, to limit the motility of the eye, you could think of something like transposition. Those are things that sort of went through my mind. And because it was such a large angle deviation, there was almost no action of the MR at all. I carried out a transposition procedure. So, so modified, modified Nishida. So what I did was I transposed both the vertical recti uh, toward, towards the medial rectus. The way I do it is, is I use the rule of 10 and 10. So you take a bite um, in medially in this case from the vertical recta about 10, mill 10 millimeter behind that insertion, trying to avoid any vessels that you see. And you go to a point midway, super and infro medially towards the muscle where you want to move the eye towards. And usually use a non absorbable suture. I use a 5 or ethylene, which is what I have in in my uh, theater where you could use proline uh, if, you, if you prefer. This is what we did. And um, so this was, this was day seven. I haven't seen her since she came back. She was a lot happier. The amount of adduction is hugely improved from minus five to minus two, minus three, maybe. The deviation for near depends how much you decompensate her. It's gone on from a 90 to about 30, 40. And distance gone on to 20. So she's a lot happier after one surgery. And really all she's had is bilateral LR recessions and two sutures in the two vertical recta. So you still have a lot to play with. So we will hopefully in the second stage to uh, bimedial resections. But I thought this was a very uh, encouraging result and she she's a lot happier as a result. And this is really what got me thinking. So I want to present this case because some this is a condition we do see often in clinic, especially if, if you do neuroophthalmology, you see these patients who have either an ischemic or demyelinating pathology causing um, uh, causing damage to the middle long to fasciculus, and this internuclear damage causes the adduction weakness on the side ipsilateral and nystagmus and the abducting eye. Now it's thought that the abducting nystagmus is because of the um, increased flow of innovation as the eye tries to adduct. So, you know, the you know, increased innovation to the MR of that eye causes the LR on the other side to, to uh, go into this abducting nystagmus. They also have associated problems like skew deviation, something just to be aware of. So if you see a INO with an associated vertical deviation, it just usually presents like a, uh, with a hypertropia of the affected eye in abduction. So when they try and look towards that side, you see that eye is high, almost looks like an IR palsy, then do, do think of a skew deviation. And the surgical management is, is challenging because of significant adduction disturbance, which is, uh, which is why I found this case very interesting. Like all patients with um, acquired strabismus, what you want to do is you want to improve the alignment, eliminate all diplopia if you possibly can, restore the stereopsis, and take care of the abnormal head posture. There is a, a hypothesis that just resecting an MR in these cases can actually 
reduce the abducting nystagmus in the other eye because of the mechanism I just talked about. So I looked at the literature to see what other people have done. So the first uh, paper here um, is, is from the Jill Adams and John Lee group at, at Morphils in London. And they had 16 patients that used toxin and only a third of them really continued treatment, which just you know, underlines toxin is maybe not the best possible treatment. So paper of Jill Roper Hall, and they did a recess resect procedure. And Jill very strongly felt that doing an MR resection absolutely has to be key for all, uh, for all patients with INO, because that's what dampens the apatric nystagmus in the other eye. It's something I haven't experienced so, but I think that's very interesting. And of the eight, three required further treatment. Wendy Adams and Jonathan Holmes um, did a research research procedure. And again, one in three required a further procedure. The next paper by Nathan uh, NR and Sean Donahue, I have really tried very hard to get this paper. All I can get is the abstracts. If I see them at APOS next month, I will ask them what kind of trans, but they were the, this was the first paper with a transposition in INO and they got quite good results, but I'm not sure exactly what transposition they did. The next paper is an Iranian paper and they found they did one trans, they had one patient where they did a split tendon transposition and they had a reasonably good result, but they needed further surgery. It just underlines how difficult this condition uh, is to treat. When we talk about transposition, we always think about transposition and six nerve palsy, because that's where they are the common, commonestly, most commonly used. You can use a full, full tendon transposition, but you don't really want to do three tenotomies in one eye, which is why there were uh, other innovations such as the hummel skyme or Jensen's procedure. But even a Jensen's procedure, which avoids a tenotomy, can cause anti-segment ischemia. So in this scenario was this paper by Nishida 2003, and as an alternative to Jensen, they split the muscle and attached to the sclera adjacent to the LR, and therefore they took away the need to do a tenotomy of the transposed muscle, and they got quite a good result. So this is what people started to look at. And there was a further modification uh, by Nishida's group, which is the one I use here, in which all they do is they just uh, move the muscles, in this case laterally, in my case medially, to, to get the desired outcome. And this is quite a good procedure because you, if you do it carefully, you can avoid the muscular vessels. So you reduce the risk of uh, anti-segment ischemia. This, this is what I have used in this case. And this is the first um, uh, the first time I, I, um, I haven't found any other report of Nishida in INO. So I thought it was an interesting thing to use. And I find it's a very simple technique. In fact, my fellow did most of the surgery. It's very atraumatic. You can avoid the anticillary vessels. You can, you can also preserve the original uh, action of the muscle. Because that's why you do not want to create a problem when you're solving one problem. This is why I, I quite like this procedure. It's also one of my go-to procedure when it's a transposition for six nerve palsy. And that's it really, that's not really what I wanted to say. You know, I think the trope in INO is a very challenging surgical conundrum. Uh, the goal of surgery is the same as it is for most people with an acquired incompetent squint, but it's always good to consider associated findings. Toxin may have a role if you want to temporize the, uh, the situation, but I find that long-term they don't really do very well with toxin. And to, so do consider the transposition of the vertical recti as a possible option. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, very interesting uh, idea on managing an extremely difficult condition. So, uh, of course, uh, as you said, the modified, modified Nashida is uh, really uh, very interesting and I'm actually very popular now, uh, increasingly, uh, for a lot of uh, conditions which require transposition. So, uh, any comments from the panel? Uh, I, I, yes, I just had one question to ask. Dr. Saurabh, that if you moved the entire uh, vertical recti towards the medial rectus in your case, uh, didn't the superior actions get affected? Sure. And, you know, that's what we always worry about. And I found that if you do a full tenotomy, then that is a problem. But here, because all you're doing is just really pulling the muscle to the side. So I really did not induce any vertical incompetence. And all yes. it did was just improve the adduction. And that's why I like the Nishida so much because you're not inducing a vertical incompetence. Yeah, uh, because I had and, that. And, and anyway, you're doing it bilaterally. So, yeah. yeah, we sometimes may, you know, in an extreme gazes, we may sometimes, especially doing it for verticals, you may actually have a little in the extreme of gaze, but here you were doing it bilaterally. So, you know, that risk also is completely obviated. So, that's that, of course, helps. Yeah, that has been my experience as well. So, I just. Um, I'm, I'm going to underline everything that was said already. Case. Wonderful it, case. Yeah. What are yeah, the... Don't you have to add anything. Very nice uh, case. 
just would like to ask what is the long term i mean longest follow up in such cases is there any drift post operative drift again so i find the american studies have much longer follow up i read quite a few studies and you know people follow these cases up to, for up to a year year and a half in the uk i have to say i think because of the way the system is structured usually after 3 months we discharge most of our cases this lady um i have to say i'm going to see again and i think she'll end up with a bimedial resection in addition to what she has looking at the papers i think long term there is a drift sadly uh, towards exotropia again because you know we know that tightening a dead muscle is not going to do very much for very long and over time you do see a drift so i think it's very important to set people's expectations but the the thing is if even if there's a bit of a drift you can you can manage it with the prisms and toxim and it's small it's just when it's 90 diopter then you really do have to do something a bit more surgical so i think we'll uh, move on to the next talk uh, we'll try and have more discussions i know it's a very very interesting topic nishida is always a hot topic of discussion and it's been used in a variety of conditions but uh, Uh, now we'll be having the next talk uh, by Dr. Sehan Oskan. She is a professor and chief of pediatric ophthalmology at the Adnan Menderes University Medical School in Turkey. She is also the president of the Strabismological Society of Turkey, Turkish Ophthalmological Association, and is the past president of the International Strabismological Association. She is an outstanding speaker and has a large number of excellent publications in most areas of strabismus, but really has her greatest expertise. in tackling managing complicated strabismus so again uh, another difficult topic dr sian is going to talk on when and how to use botulinum toxin in reoperations welcome dr sian uh thank you dr saxena for this very kind introduction and just a very short correction i was the past president of the strabismus branch of turkish ophthalmological society so do you see my presentation in full screen mode yes, yes. i can see it okay thank you so dear moderator dear colleagues it's my distinct pleasure and honor to participate this aos meeting and in the apos symposium and i'd like to thank for the organizers for this kind invitation i have no potential conflict of interest to disclose so in reoperations uh, botulinum toxin may be used either instead of reoperations as an adjunct to surgery to increase the success of surgery or as a risk agent for reoperation failures so the uh, basic function of botulinum toxin is uh, known that uh, by alteration of mechanical contractile forces however in acute phase additionally botulinum toxin functions through soft tissue healing in desired position and somehow with a similar effect with traction sutures in chronic phase the additional effect is mostly through the central adaptive mechanism So when we look at the indication categories sorry uh, so when we look at the uh, previous literature reports there are two randomized control studies in infantile and acquired esotropia and the authors compared surgery and botulinum toxin in reoperations and they found that the effect was similar however in toxin group the effect was more when the injection is done uh, during the first 3 to 6 months of uh, post operatively and the elscott demonstrated that the results are almost similar with primary toxin injections and in consecutive iso deviation the success rate is around 70% however the success rate is higher in those who had fusion potential and this was reported by the morfields group so from now on i will go on with some demonstrative case examples this child has a cerebral palsy and parino syndrome and she underwent four horizontal recti supraplacement in combination with a small recessed resect in the right eye because of this moderate esotropia and postoperatively she was found to have a large consecutive exo deviation with limitation of adduction and i thought that the medial rectus muscle was disinserted so she was operated again and on first action test adduction was plus 4 positive there was nothing wrong in the medial rectus area so we recessed the resected lateral rectus muscle 
However, postoperatively, there was only moderate improvement and she still had this large exotropia with limitation of adduction. So apparently this child has a problem of abnormal muscle contractility, which is similar to the skeletal muscles in cerebral palsy cases. So we've injected toxin into the right lateral rectus muscle, and this is her appearance post-toxin third month, and she remains stable in that position. So there are some specific problems that may require toxin injection in reoperation patients. And these are excess advancement of stiff muscles, the excess scar tissue, excess re-resection, and adjustable sutures may not always solve the problems. This lady has a right consecutive exotropia with slipped medial rectus muscle in combination with stretch scar. So the stretch scar and the empty muscle capsule was excised with add some advancement and the lateral rectus muscle was recessed on adjustables. She was fine on adjustment. However, she came back with this uh, consecutive esotropia on the postoperative second week. So at this stage, we have injected toxin into the medial rectus muscle, and this is her appearance post-toxin first week, and my nine months afterwards, the result was stable and she was orthophoric. So the toxin balanced the contractile force in the early post-op period. And this lady was referred for a lost muscle, uh, the lateral rectus muscle was lost, and at presentation, it was post-op seventh day, there was very significant uh, inflammatory reaction and there was orbital fat tissue under the conjunctiva. So adherent syndrome was also uh, the, the problem. So at this stage, I didn't want to operate her, but we wanted to keep this eye in primary position while waiting. So toxin was injected into the medial rectus muscle. And one week afterwards, she was orthophoric with limited adduction and abduction. And six weeks later, she was operated and the lateral rectus muscle was found within the orbital fat tissue and it was reattached with some recession. And the final result was orthophoria with some limitation of both adduction and abduction because of the fat adherence problem. So what is the mechanism here? So we know that when there's a lost muscle, the unopposed contracture of the antagonist may develop as early as two weeks as demonstrated by Anthony Murray and the eye moves towards the, towards the other direction. And if there is additional adherence syndrome problem and this inflammatory adipose tissue attaches the globe at this position, causing a very significant limitation of motility. So if toxin is injected during the acute stage before these attachments developed, and the eye is kept in primary position, then all these attachments develop when the eye is in primary position. So that will cause a less limitation of ocular motility and enables an easier access to the uh, lost muscle area. So we know that uh, recurrent deviations are also a problem. This uh, gentleman was also referred for a lost muscle. The medial rectus muscle was lost and the muscle was found and reattached. However, he had this residual exotropy after two operations. So toxin was injected into the lateral rectus muscle and this is post-toxin second month. And uh, despite he had a secondary deviation, he was lucky enough to have a stable result. However, we know that some patients may have recurrent deviations despite they have multiple surgeries. So uh, from Morfield's group, a large series was reported and it was found that these patients have no binocular function. They require regular injections, but there's no upper limit for re-injection. And there's a tendency of uh, uh, the interval of the in injections to increase and the angle of deviation to decrease in time. So botulinum toxin may be used to rescue uh, over and under corrections in paralytic cases as well. And this lady has a, a superrectus contracture in combination with superoblique palsy. So she underwent superrectus recession on adjustables in combination with this inferior oblique disinsertion. She was fine on after adjustment, but she came back one month after surgery with this significant overcorrection with left hypotropia. So at this stage, we have injected toxin into her left inferior rectus muscle, and this is post-toxin first week. And you see the underaction in the inferior rectus muscle, and this is post-toxin four years. Nothing else was done for this patient, so uh, toxin rebalanced the overcorrection. And that lady has two previous operations, and she had a third nerve palsy in the left eye. And she also had intractable diplopia, which did not respond to prism therapy. 
So in this lady, uh, you can see the limitation of adduction here, and toxin was injected into the left later, uh, lateral rectus muscle, and after toxin injection, you see how the adduction improved and she started to fuse and uh, it was possible to obtain a permanent result as she started to fuse afterwards. And this lady has, this young lady had two previous operations and she had third nerve palsy. And uh, in this uh, patient, we uh, aim to uh, obtain an overcorrection in the early post-op period. So the right lateral rectus was recessed and the left lateral rectus muscle was re-recessed in combination with toxin injection and the medial rectus muscle was re-resected as much as we can. And this is post-op uh, overcorrection. The effect is similar with traction sutures. And here you see the below the post of eight months that the result was stable. And uh, this patient had a joint syndrome problem and he had two previous operations and he had this overcorrection and the presumed surgery was a medial rectus recession and vertical rectus transposition. And he had this large uh, abnormal head posture and he was highly bothered with that with large exotropia in primary position. So uh, in this gentleman, we have obtained, we have uh, performed a toxin injection into the right lateral rectus muscle. And despite this was a chronic case, a rebalance of the contractile forces was possible. And uh, here you, below you see the post toxin six months and it's been now one year afterwards and he's still stable. So there are some specific challenges and use of botulinum toxin in patients with reoperations. First one is excessively recessed antagonist muscle cannot take up the slack. So this is a problem for a permanent effect. And injection of recessed muscles require deep injection. Injection through scar tissue is challenging. There is a risk of globe perforation. And there's a difficulty to reach the target tissue. So EMG controlled injections should be performed. So the take home messages are, Toxin is useful in reoperations, either as primary treatment or as an adjunct to surgery. And timing of botulinum toxin injection is a critical decision for a per better permanent result. And consider toxin for those with no other chance for reoperations as a maintenance therapy for a better quality of life for those who had uh, multiple previous surgeries. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd like to remind you of the next ISA meeting, which is going to be held in Cancun, Mexico. And namaste. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was an excellent presentation um, and the, the uses of botulinum toxin were really mind boggling. So in a previously operated muscle, you would go with an EMG or uh, you could try without it because most of us do not have access to an EMG. Or would you actually expose the muscle to inject it uh, so that you're confident that you're able to enter the muscle? Uh, I always use uh, EMG guided toxin injection. So the equipment was, uh, previously it was more complicated, but I mean, uh, I still have uh, my very old uh, voice amplificator toxin uh, EMG, simple EMG machine. And some other companies also produce that kind of EMG machines just with voice control. Or if you don't have an access uh, for this, you can use the um, fully equipped neurologist's uh, EMG machine as well. And I always use it with EMG control because uh, when you do it without the EMG, the injection is always done uh, in an anterior part of the muscle. So you do not go through the bus muscle bulk itself. So it, it can be uh, satisfactory in medial rectus muscle, but especially for a lateral rectus muscle, which has a, a larger curve, or for inferior rectus muscle where there's a very uh, strict uh, adhesion with inferior oblique muscle and you need to go on with, uh, with an EMG. I only do the um, toxin injection without EMG in infants uh, for medial rectus injections. Otherwise, even in children, I do it uh, on the operating theater with uh, ketamine anesthesia. And uh, so when you do some um, voice signals and with some toys and so on, you can uh, make the child to look to, to a certain position. 
Thank you. Uh, any comment, one or two, before we go on to the next speaker? One. Yeah, Dr. Chubangi. I wanted to ask, ma'am, it was a very nice talk, ma'am. I wanted to ask whether you have tried uh, in a large angle desotropia along with horizontal muscle recessions. Uh, have you tried botulinum along with the recession in very uh, la yes. large angle desotropias? Yes, and we have, uh, uh, we have published a very early report uh, about the effect of uh, toxin for increasing the uh, effect of recession. And uh, our first report was on concomitant strabismus and, uh, strabismus, and we have found it very efficient for large angle deviations. And on the other hand, we also uh, use uh, botulinum toxin in combination with recession in very large angle paralytic strabismus cases and who had uh, additional fibrosis problems, who had uh, very long standing, very large angle six nerve palsy or in long-standing third nerve palsy. And in one of the patients that I've demonstrated who had the residual exodeviation with third nerve palsy, we have injected toxin in combination with lateral rectus recession. So that is uh, the main effect of injecting toxin uh, in combination with recession is to obtain an early overcorrection. So the effect is somehow uh, similar with traction features, yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Oskan. Uh, we, we come back, Dr. Okay, Leela. I okay, think okay. Uh, we have a couple of uh, more talks to go. So uh, okay. um, our next speaker is Donnie Sue, who is a professor and chief of pediatric ophthalmology in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of California at Irvine. He completed his pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus fellowship at the Wilmer Eye Institute, John Hopkins University. He's an active volunteer uh, faculty for Orbis. He's the chief editor for Medscape Online Reference since March 9, 2016, has over 100 published articles and chapters, and is currently involved in 20 institutional review board approved research projects. So Dr. Donnie Chu is going to be talking on artificial intelligence and current studies on abusive head trauma. Dr. Donnie. Uh, Dr. Donnie, you'll have to unmute, please. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Can you see my slides? Okay. Uh, no, your slides are not visible, although your screen is. Oh, okay. Just a second. I apologize. Yes. Uh, apologize. You'll have to reshare. I think you you uh, top share. I apologize for the technical. Dr. Su, go on your top, double click. Go on your presentation. Yeah, and now make it uh, slide uh, show. Is this okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. But you are. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, you are on uh, viewer screen. You're not on full screen at the moment. No. Uh, and he's on his last slide, I think. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes, now, now go to slide. Yeah, now just go to full screen. Full screen, okay. Yeah. Oh. No, no, no. No. Mm. So in the I'm display sorry, sir, can you share your screen, not your presentation, sir? Please share your screen. Donnie, in the display settings, after you go to the uh, presentation mode, um, yeah. if, if you hit that, it, just on the top, it says display settings. If you can click uh, that, next next to the show taskbar, there's display settings and end slideshow. Do you see that on the top? Here. Go, to, go, yeah. go to display settings. Yes. And, and and it should be swap presenter view to slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, great, great. Is this okay? Yeah, great, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I apologize, okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm truly honored um, uh, to be uh, giving a talk um, at the uh, 
at this prestigious um, uh, meeting, I, I realized that this is actually one of the oldest the, uh, ophthalmology uh, societies uh, since 1930s so with about 27,000 members. So I'm truly honored. Um, first, I would like to thank my co-investigators. Uh, Without their help, uh, this would not be possible. Uh, so for next uh, about nine minutes, I'll try to uh, make it quick. Uh, I would like to talk about the current research. So when we have a, a child that is not doing well for various medical reasons, with the retinal findings that look like this, um, we have to go through extensive differential diagnosis before we come up with a final diagnosis. And in terms of, uh, there aren't too many conditions that can result in a, uh, three layer retinal hemorrhages with a pre-retinal, intraretinal, and subretinal uh, in multifocal areas simultaneously. So there are only uh, the, uh, you could actually think about normal vaginal delivery, uh, induced retinal hemorrhages or retinal microaneurysms Person syndrome, and of course, finally, you have to think about trauma, uh, including abusive head cases. But the dilemma is that, as we have alluded to, normal vaginal delivery can result in significant retinal hemorrhages in up to 50% of the babies. And when you look at some of these pictures, they actually look somewhat similar to the abusive head trauma cases. And also, Accidental traumas with the, here's a um, retinal findings in a kid uh, that actually had a soccer ball injury. So these retinal hemorrhages can be uh, in one areas, but also it can be in multifocal areas. So how do you make an accurate diagnosis? Because as we all know, false negatives can be very dangerous to the child because you'd be putting the child in danger. False positives can also be just as detrimental to a family. And as a matter of fact, it can destroy the dynamics, as you can imagine. So finding the truth is important. Uh, so we as ophthalmologists play a very, very important role in helping to find the truth. In the quest for finding the truth, uh, one of the biggest questions that we always, that I have been asked as an expert witness is how much force is needed or generated during various traumas resulting in retinal injuries. So uh, we created a computer simulation model, uh, similar, something that's similar to like this, and also along with the retina uh, that actually has broken down into subretinal, intraretinal, and preretinal. And so we created about 300,000 different individual points, and we analyzed these indi each individual points um, by simulating the shaking of this computer simulation model, similar to the dummy doll model experiment. So we shake this simulation uh, uh, in a finite element, and we created these stress values in different parts of the retina in 300,000 different points. And what we found was that the pre-retinal, intraretinal, and subretinal layers actually had pretty similar forces, and there was statistically not significantly different. Then we went to the soccer ball uh, injury, and we in, uh, created a similar type of um, a injury where we collided the eyeball with the soccer ball, and we actually measured the force that the retina experiences. And as you can see, something that's very interesting is that as the force propagates pos posteriorly, it creates this vacuum, if you will. It's a negative pressure. Uh, so that there's an initial impact with a compressive force. And then as that force is, uh, moves anteriorly, it creates almost like a vacuum resulting in tractional force. And we're able to document and follow that force using a graph form. And as you can see, there's an initial impact and then it gradually decreases. <clears throat> Unlike the shaken baby syndrome model. And also, in a normal vaginal delivery, we actually created a similar type of model where as the baby transverses through this small canal, we wanted to see exactly what force is exerted on various parts of the retina. And so here, I want to show you. Here, as the eyeball, along with the head, transverses through that small canal, vaginal canal, and you can see the different forces that you can actually see in different parts of the retina in, 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 an, in a live fashion. And you can see the small peak initially, and then there's a bigger peak as the baby's uh, head is going through the vaginal canal and with the second peak. So 
when you look at these uh, <clears throat> when you look at these uh, graphs, they actually have a very different patterns depending on the, the 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 different types of forces that's exerted on the retina, and this probably explains the different types of retinal hemorrhage patterns in different models. And as you can see, um, just a quick but something that we should know is that here in the um, vaginal deliver babies, the greatest force is actually experienced in the pre-retinal layer compared to the sub-retinal layer. And now this is statistically significant. And that probably explains the greater number of pre-retinal and intra-retinal hemorrhages. And you rarely ever see actually sub-retinal hemorrhages in normal vaginal delivery. So, how can artificial intelligence help us with uh, with this information even further? How can, uh, what can we do to go even further? So the, uh, we're using an AI deep learning model where data is filtered through a cascade of multiple algorithms, layers, with each layers um, uh, using an output from the previous ones to improve the accuracy of the new results. So what this means is that at the I AI becomes more and more accurate and precise as they process more accurate, this is the important part, more accurate data. So what this means is something, so if you could just imagine, you have a group of residents or fellows looking at various patterns of strabismus, as we have just talked about INO. So looking at these patterns, and as they process and try to remember these, recognition, recognize these patterns, Initially, they may get these diagnoses wrong, but as, the, as they repeat these process multiple times, we're talking thousand, ten thousand, hundred times, a hundred thousand times, this is going to become better and better and better, and they're going to come up with a better outcome. So what we are doing at this point is that we are collecting images all over the world, and we are putting the accurate information, for example, shaking baby syndrome that is court case confirmed. Also, it's soccer ball injuries that actually had been well documented with the previous records. And also the normal vaginal delivery uh, with the babies that are with the pictures taken right at birth. So we're feeding these information into the AI along with other types of retinal hemorrhages uh, that actually may occur from anemia hypoxia, sickle cell. And then we're, we're asking the AI to interpret those images by counting the retinal hemorrhages along with the percentage of the retina and how what percentage of the retina is covered by retinal hemorrhage. And also it can measure the size of the retinal hemorrhages in a split of a second. And then also it will recognize the locations and the patterns and identify the retinal schesis, retinal folds, and heart exudates. Not just that. You can also identify, help us to identify the pre-retinal, intra-retinal, and sub-retinal hemorrhages. And of course, it would also include cardinal spots and disc edemas that may be a result of a papal edema with increase in intracranial pressure. And as of right now, we have, we have experts around the world that actually will help us with the quality control so that we may, so that we can um, be sure to uh, to uh, supply the most accurate information. And we continue to monitor for quality control so that we can, um, so we can actually have the best outcome, if you will. So when we have the outcome, uh, the output, it will give us a number. Uh, so in, in terms of what is the probability of these particular photo being induced by a medical condition? <laughs> or what is the probability of this retinal hemorrhage, hemorrhage resulting from a trauma? And if it's from a retinal hemorrhage from a medical condition, it can actually help us to identify the cause, like what actually caused these retinal hemorrhages. And if it's from a trauma, it can be created from one through nine. And um, based on those criteria that we just talked about. Um, so in summary, so AI results, in, it will be supplemented to the medical, family, and social history, uh, and the clinical findings and physical exam, and the blood and MRI findings, as well as, and it's gonna supplement the, the, uh, the input from various specialists to help us determine the truth, 
and hopefully they will help to save our children. Thank you. Any questions? Sorry for the technical difficulties initially. It's always Thank you, you, you. Uh, a, a wonderful talk and, and really a wonderful uh, ideas about how AI is going to actually help us in determining, diagnosing, and uh, you know understanding a lot of these injuries. Uh, excellent. Any any comment or questions before we move on to the next speaker, please? Um, Dr. Saxena, I, I, I would like to ask a question. Uh, Donnie, it's just amazing to see uh, the, the great work you're continuing to do. Uh, for the people who may not know, actually, Donnie um, came up with a, a simulator that actually uh, really simulated um, on, on how the shaken baby works. And he has actually taught a great deal in, in OBGYN uh, wards and many others just to kind of uh, really get, get this in a public situation. And this is fantastic. Uh, uh, Donnie, uh, what, what we see in different AIs in deep learning is um, there are things that the AI and the deep learning come up with but we, as we didn't even think of. Uh, for example, in the diabetic retinopathy, now the, the AI can even tell us if the patient is, is a female or male. I don't know if I can actually do that just by looking at the fundus. But, so yeah, similar to that, have you seen anything that the AI is looking different than the clinicians that actually may lead to a diagnosis? Yeah, Farouk, thank you very much. Uh, we just started this process and we have about 10,000 images. Um, and as we have talked about, more data that we have more accurate and more precise and additional information can be obtained. Um, so part of the reason I'm actually presenting this talk at this uh, uh, prestigious meeting is that I'm actually hoping for help to obtain more images. But as of right now, uh, we have not gone, uh, quite gotten to that point, but we are very excited about identifying additional things that we have, we uh, probably have missed in the past. Because when we look at these retinal hemorrhages uh, in these, uh, in any cases, um, it just, uh, you know, it's a pattern recognition for us. And we don't individually count the, the blood cells. We don't look for those rough spots and how many they are. So this computer, this using the AI, it will actually give us a number, like at a split of a second and, and, and identify what, uh, you know, what we just, uh, just kind of like uh, skim through but it's going to actually give us an exact numbers um, and then quantify and give us a probability. Again, you will not make a diagnosis of, of a piece of head trauma. That's impossible. I don't think that's possible, but it will give us an idea how much force was applied to create that type of retinal hemorrhages at that particular age. But Farouk, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Donnie. Uh, we'll now move on to the next uh, speaker. It's a pleasure to invite Dr. Suma Ganesh, who's head of the pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the Shaw Charity Eye Hospital. Extensive uh, experience in tackling pediatric ophthalmology disorders. And although she has expertise in a lot of areas, I have actually requested her to talk on her vast experience in management of strabismus in children with CVI. Dr. Suma, please. Thank you, Dr. Rohit, uh, for the kind introduction. And also, thank you. Uh, it is a real privilege to be here on the podium uh, and with such great, uh, all, all great strabismologists. I hope uh, I am able to uh, share something new. Um, I would be talking on uh, cerebral visual impairment, children with uh, cerebral visual impairment and how to manage their strabismus. Is it moving forward? No, it's not. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah now it is. Yeah. 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 So um, what is cerebral visual impairment? Basically, there is a deficiency in the function of vision. Something is wrong with the visual pathways or the processing centers in the brain, specifically those posterior to the lateral geniculate body. So here the eye works fine. The brain does not consistently understand and interpret what the eye see. So we do see a lot of children now coming because of the uh, good in, uh, neonatal care which is given to the children. And we do find them in the clinics uh, frequenting us with problems of vision, of uh, squinting, and also with refraction. So what is basically affected? It is basically the dorsal stream which is connecting the occipital area with the posterior parietal cortex. And that is the where 
and is also the ventral stream which connects the occipital and temporal lobe territories and uh, tells us about the what. So unique characteristics are, of course, the light gazing or non-purposeful gazes. So, so especially in the OPD, when we see that they, the vision is not collab, uh, collaborating with the age, we need to further investigate them. The other visual uh, preferences behaviors are basically the field effects which we see. Most of them, they have an inferior field effect. So it is imp important to test with the simple help of the toys to check which visual field is affected to help the rehabilitation expert. And also other characteristics are the visual latency. You have the child is very slow at looking at the object and there are difficulties in viewing in a complex environment and difficulties in distance viewing. There is a color preference, red and yellow may be the most commonly preferred colors. And it is important that uh, we, um, uh, we tell the um, uh, visual rehabilitator what the child is attracted to and which color the child prefers. So the vision assessment is done if the, we do it with the help of the TAC or with the LIA pedals if the vision is very poor. So we know that the LIA pedals is the age of a child in months is equal to the rating in the uh, cycles per degree in the LIA pedals. So we can measure the uh, vision in these children and uh, the LIA pedals helps us unilaterally and binocularly to tell us whether how much is the visual acuity in the child. It's also important for the visual rehabilitator to tell about to tell them about the contrast sensitivity. So we can use the hiding ID and tell them whether there's a 10% loss, 25% loss, or 100% loss. And this will help them to rehabilitate the child because they know that the contrast is also decreased in the children. Uh, cycloplegic refraction, of course, cyclo, uh, cyclopentolate should not be used, mainly it is atropin. And we need to correct the refractive errors before going in for any strabismus uh, surgery. Because we find that these children, even with high, small amount of hypermetropia and astigmatic glasses, they commonly do very well. It's also important to assess the accommodation in these children because most of them uh, have the lack of accommodation and we need to give more air in these children so that they can accommodate and they can, uh, so that they can be able to see better. So a dynamic retinoscopy is very, very important to check for the lack of accommodation. And this is how we uh, document it, that we say the CDS, like in this case, where there is a left gaze paresis that the child prefers to the right gaze. And there is, um, there is a light gazing, non-purposeful uh, gaze. And uh, difficulty with all uh, vision, like the visual latency is a problem. So all this if we document, and this could help the rehabilitation expert. So in the OPD, how to differentiate between an OBI and a CBI, where we find that the vision is uh, not accountable for, uh, has the other uh, parameters are normal. We need to do a simple LIA puzzle, uh, where we find that the child has difficulty in orienting the objects. There's difficulty in eye hand coordination. This is called as optic ataxia. This is the impaired visual guidance of movement. And this tells us there is small amount of brain damage. We can also use a Lear mailbox, like here the child is able to drop the card through the slot of the Lear mailbox. This is a small thing. And this is the child is able to demonstrate the orientation of the slot by turning the card in the correct position. And here we find that in a CVI child, the child is not able to orient the spot correctly. So this tells us that there is a small there is that this child requires further help by the special educator and the other, uh, and uh, also with the help of the occupational therapist. So other neural ophthalmic findings are basically we find there's a hypoplastic or large disc uh, and uh, it is important to differentiate them because most of the time these are children identified as glaucomas. Of course, we need to do MRI in these children. So the strabismus is found to be as high as 73% in these patients. Esotropia is most common type of strabismus and exotropia is also seen. The problem is the angle variability and the shifting patterns. And so we need to do stable, we need to repeatedly measure them and then only plan them for surgery. In periventricular leukomalacia, we found that the, uh, there, is a, uh, there is esotropia and exotropia and other vari varieties of strabismus also. We need, to, we need to look for them and we need to perform the surgery. In our paper published, we found that exotropia was seen more common than esotropia, the major cause being perinatal hypoxia. In another paper where we published, we found that our uh, motor evaluation revealed strabismus in 67.04% patients, and uh, most of it was exotropia. We also had associated uh, dissociated vertical deviation, and the mean angle of deviation was around 30 prisms for both eso and exotropia. There could be spontaneous resolution. That's why we need to have four stable measurements. Do not operate them if they have poor visual behavior or they have unstable deviation or a shifting pattern. 
measure at least four four uh, uh, different four different have four different stable measurements so the child with having similar problems like a just looks like an isotropia case but there is problem in focusing inward deviation it is a premature baby with a delayed milestones and with a right side hemiplegia did a atropine refraction found that there was no significant refractive error performed the surgery and the child did well but this the important point is after the surgery the child does require the role of vision rehabilitation and vision therapy we may need to use a peg board or to improve the saccades and also the other uh, things to other um, uh, therapies to improve the coordination so we can see that after the surgery and before the surgery and after surgery how the um, handwriting of the child has improved and we find that in children with cvi the learning difficulty is much more and strabismus is reported to uh, be there which is partly responsible for the learning difficulty and therefore we need to operate them as early as possible we found that the the there was a uh, published literature on long term results of isotropia surgery we did our own study comparing our results with uh, children with infantile isotropia with neurological impairment compared to normal children in most of our cases there was hi we found that our success rate was 61.23% in the neurological group with a follow up of 23.313 uh, months um, and uh, compare our come uh, we compared our study with dr with the study done at shankar netralaya and we found that the results were comparable but the sensory results we found that was not um, very gratifying so um, uh, we, it was a really major challenge it was a realistic goal if we could achieve uh, some amount of uh, sensory uh, fusion in these children so what we also found that you know, some of these children went into uh, conjugative exotropia so we there's an exaggerated effect of the bilateral medial rectus recession in these children we need to undercorrect them by around 30% that's what the review of literature showed so like these children who were operated earlier they went into consecutive exotropia over a period of time and for them we had to do, do a medial rectus advancement or an recession surgery so it is important that we follow up these children like uh, there's another child who was referred by a psychologist to me saying that i have treated this child for attention disorder and uh, her child also had a, a cvi with an attention deficit and the child was not able to write or falls down frequently with vision of only 618 with exotropia performed the surgery and the uh, psychologist informed me that the social maturity scale which he found the social quotient was had improved after surgery the developmental profile also which he measured after surgery improved and also the attention problems so this makes us more and more um, and it allows us to say that we need to operate these children and not say that we uh, these children may not improve with surgery they have problems in visual perceptual skills and maybe having dyspraxia so they may be associated with dvd and it is important that we tackle them as a routine as a strabismus surgery which we do for an exotropia with dvd and um, we do get good results there may be mixed deviations and uh, so the results are very gratifying we find that there is improvement in co communication improvement in cognition skills the child starts walking the child starts going to school we find there is an improvement in the uh, um, you know they, we could make these children go into integrated schools with the help of a special educator and uh, the and make the child perform very well so this is uh, our uh, you know it we know that cvi is a spectrum of disability we find that a lot of a lot of issues are there but of course with multidisciplinary services and with a combined approach we can definitely help these children thank you thank you suma uh, as i expected an outstanding talk with super insights and and, uh, and uh, amazing outcomes uh, a comment if anyone before we go on we are actually short of time yeah dr shubhangi you wanted to say great talk suma as usual uh, i just wanted to ask uh, would you approach uh, the cvi patient in the same way as other strabismus or plan it somewhat different and another thing is if there is associated cerebral palsy would you approach it differently i would more see for the stable deviations like basically if there is an isotropia i would try to intervene much much early rather than an exotropia of course if there's a large angle deviation i would intervene early uh, so um, i would wait what i have found that uh, you know that's why i did the study in fact to find out whether operating less than 2 years where other problems are more in these children whether there is a difference in the sensory outcome so now i found that there is no difference in the sensory outcome in these children because even after 2 years they do not develop any stereopsis or uh, so it is better to wait rather than causing consecutives and uh, you know doing resurgeries so it may be better to wait uh, for at least till they get their stable deviations 
and still they are able to fixate at least a little bit better uh, for our uh, better measurements. So maybe I would wait a little bit longer than normal sur strabismus surgery. So. Uh, could we could we go on to the next? Dr. Sian, you want to say something? Uh, uh, one comment and then we'll move. Very, yeah. very, very shortly. Congratulations, Dr. Ganesh. It was a great talk. I just want to learn your opinion about the use of botulinum toxin in this group of patients because we know that sometimes they may have very unstable deviations. And we have very impressive results by using toxin band because uh, the risk for... Um, uh, consecutive deviations is, is much lower compared to surgery. And I'd like to learn your experience on that. Uh, I have not done, uh, actually, because of the lack of the EMG machine, I have not, I'm not a big fan of, uh, sorry, uh, I do not do much of Botox, uh, botulinum toxin. But of course, uh, you know, I would say that botulinum toxin may be, is maybe a better approach, I feel also, because sometimes our measurements are so uh, we do not get good measurements and I always feel when there's a variable deviation and parents say that we want to correct the isotropia and I'm not getting the proper measurements, I feel that, okay, I could go in and give a Botox injections. So yes, maybe in these conditions, I would prefer a Botox uh, injections, but we do not have the EMG machines. But as in your talk, you said that for medial rectus in infantile isotropias, you do give them without the EMG. So I think uh, that would be a better, that would be a nice approach. I think I might consider in these children instead of, uh, you know, doing waiting for so long and, uh, you know, because parents are uh, asking like, okay, make it straight. So, um, yes, I do. I may consider in these cases. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Suma. Uh, we'll go on to the next talk, which is tips on management of congenital cataract. Dr. Kalpana Narendran was to speak. Unfortunately, she is busy and uh, we have a very able and competent replacement with one of her uh, co-faculty, Dr. Sasikala Elizabeth from uh, the Armandai Hospital Coimbatore. So Dr. Sasikala, if you could share screen and start your talk, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, is my uh, slide visible? Yes, go on. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening to all. Uh, thank you to AIOC and APOST. Dr. Kalpana Narendran sends her apology. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rohit sir, for this opportunity. I'm in fact uh, fortunate to share this session amidst the stalwarts of pediatric ophthalmology. I hope I'll be able to add some useful information to the viewers too. The global prevalence of congenital cataract is estimated to be 4.2 per 10,000 children. Just a minute, let me reduce my screen. Yes. And management of congenital cataract remains a challenging entity to the ophthalmologist. It's a rapidly changing field and requires a lifelong learning process. Cataract management per se in children is state of the art. So the next nine minutes, I would uh, take you through various as aspects of pediatric cataract in regard to evaluation, decision making, timing of cataract surgery, biometry, tips in performing uh, surgeries and also how to handle in difficult situations and handling challenging situations. So about etiology, in, a, in nearly 50% of uh, cases, the etiology is unknown in children. And it is hereditary in around 8.3 to 25% of cases in children less than one year of age. So an ocular examination, we need to remember to perform in the family members, the parents and the siblings to identify any undiagnosed lens opacities. So while evaluating the child, definitely attention has to be paid about the fixation behavior and preferential looking test that would add to the clinician a gross estimate about the vision of the child. Definitely Bruckner's test should be performed in all neonates as a screening tool to identify any cataract at birth. And any lens opacity that is centrally placed, posteriorly located, sizing more than three millimeters, with a reduction in vision, decrease in contrast sensitivity, and increased glare with loss of stereoacuity qualifies for a visually significant cataract. So when to place in an IOL, what is the timing? So IOL is not recommended, intraocular lens implantation is not recommended for children less than six months of age. A survey of ASCRS members, the vast majority of the respondents waited till the children were one or three year old in bilateral cataract cases. So better these children are left FAKIC in the primary surgery. IATS concluded that it did not demonstrate any visual benefit for implanting an IOL at the time of unilateral cataract surgery in infants younger than seven months of age. 
The in the bag placement of a single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens are ideally preferred. A three piece eye well can be placed in cases of inadvertent posterior capsular rupture. Monofocal eye well are preferred in children. Multifocal eye well in younger children is again a controversial topic. In older children, based on the surgeon's decision and case selection, multifocal eye well could be a choice. For clinician, many times there is dilemma about the decision making regarding the timing of cataract surgery. When operating on a newborn with dense unilateral cataract, as early as four to six weeks of age, the infant can be operated, and bilateral cataract, which are dense, surgery can be done as early as six to eight weeks of age. Again, the decision about placing eye well, it's the surgeon's decision and it's multifactorial. Generally, the protocol for unilateral cataracts more than six months of age, eye well could be placed, and bilateral cataracts more than one year of age, intraocular lens can be placed. Regarding the biometry, inaccuracy in axillant measurement can result in up to four to 14 diopters of error in the eye well power in pediatric eyes for every millimeter difference. So while performing contact A scan, the value with maximum anterior chamber depth should be chosen to offset the inadvertent indentation of the cornea. Older children, immersion A scan is considered as the gold standard method for axillant measurement. While performing biometry in children while doing the keratometry measurements, handheld keratometer, because of the lack of fixation and centration, can result in inaccurate errors up to 1.3 diopter. So it's preferable to perform it without eye speculum and obtaining multiple readings and recording the average can avoid errors. Axillant usually in children less than 20 millimeters of axillant, SRKT and holiday two formulas are preferred. I will formula which is best in children. Again, it's a controversial topic. In IATS by Wanderwell et al, he has shown that SRKT and holiday one have least predictive errors in infants. In older children more than two years of age with axial length less than 22 millimeters of a Q is preferred and axial length more than 22 millimeters Barrett's and SRKT formulas are preferred. Few tips on pediatric cataract uh, surgery steps. Generally, it's preferred in younger children to prefer a limbal or sclerocardial incisions. So it provides a good visualization for instrumentation. Also in older children, superior clear corneal triplanar incision can be considered. It is recommended to suture the wounds Whenever there is an wound leak, even the paracentesis openings have to be sutured in. While performing anterior capsular excess in situations like this with a white cataract and no red glow, trifan glue could be used in. Ideal size for the excess is 5 to 5.5. It should cover 0.5 to 1 millimeter of the eye well. It should be smaller than the eye well optic diameter. Many a times in this situation of an intumescent cataract, one faces a risk of runaway rexus. Always inspect the size and shape of the rexus. Whenever faced with the situation, frequently hold the capsulotomy tearing edge, re-grasp near the tearing edge, adjust the direction of the pull, use a pullback technique to rescue an extending rexus. While performing irrigation and aspiration in pediatric eyes, either we could use a co uh, coaxial or bimanual irrigation with an handpiece. It is advisable to avoid hydro dissection in cases of posterior polar cataracts and in cases with posterior capsular dehiscence. Irrigation and aspiration can be performed by lowering the parameters. In case like this, with a pre existing primary capsular dehiscence, better to place in a three piece eye well in the sulcus. So, injecting a single piece lens. Is, should not be attempted whenever there is a bigger anterior excess, discontinuity in the anterior excess and larger PC tear. I will can be implanted with an axial length more than 17 millimeters and whenever the corneal diameter is more than 10 millimeters. Single piece hydrophobic or a three piece I will could be placed in based on the situation. So for managing posterior capsule and anterior vitrectomy, it is generally advised to perform a posterior continuous capsular excess in all children aged less than six to eight years of age. It can be considered to be performed in children older than that whenever they have an associated nystagmus and developmental delay because they wouldn't be cooperative for a YAC capsulotomy if it's required to clear a posterior capsular pacification. The desirable size for PPC is one millimeter less than the optic size, preferably three to 3.5. Limbal approach is usually preferred. Usually it is safe to place in uh, the eye well and then perform the posterior capsular excess. As we know, the pediatric eyes are prone for more amount of inflammation post-operative period. 
So postoperatively, topical corticosteroids, topical antibiotics, topical cyclopelagic agents have to be used in any uncomplicated cataract surgeries. In the follow-up period, children should be provided glasses or contact lens. Focus should be provided to handle the amblyopia in a timely manner, especially in unilateral cases. Early initiation of patching therapy, amblyopia therapy have to be done. I would just like to take you through a couple of cases in challenging situation. This is one such child with congenital cataract with congenital rubella syndrome. In this situation, it is difficult to perform an anterior capsular excess because of the elasticity of the capsule and lack of uh, anterior chamber space and pupil being smaller in size. The cataractus material, it is usually nuclear in nature and also more of powdery ma material. So it poses difficulty during cortical wash. The posterior capsule is also thin and degenerated. So it is difficult to perform a manual capsular, posterior capsular excess. Usually vitrectomy can be used to perform a PPC. Similarly, another child with congenital cataract with a posterior capsular plaque. In children, it is essential for us to remove as much as cortical material as possible to prevent any visual access or pacification. So in this case, there is a dense posterior capsular plaque. The surgeon gently nibbles and peels the posterior plaque and uses one hour scissors to gently trim the edges and remove it. A three-piece eyeball is placed in the back later on. A posterior continuous capsular excess is initiated and completed with utratas and the remaining of the posterior plaque is gently nibbled and removed with a one hour scissors followed by anterior vitrectomy. So to conclude, cataract surgery done in the first six weeks of life in a child has better visual prognosis. Placing an in the bag IOL along with primary posterior capsular excess and anterior vitrectomy are essential in younger group. Doing a careful post-operative monitoring, recognizing posterior capsule opacification and performing a timely management of the PCO are the key to success. The battle could still be lost if inadequate attention is paid towards amblyopia therapy. So proper amblyopia therapy, glasses or contact lens compliance and a proper follow-up are the biggest challenges that decides the visual outcome for a child. Thank you so much for your patient listening. These are my reference. I thank my mentor, Dr. Kalpana Narendran, for her continuous support and this opportunity. Thank you. All right. Uh, may I request Dr. Rohit if we can take the next presentation? Uh, yeah, we will. I've, I've talked to Dr. Namrata. We have another 15 minutes, okay. so uh, not an issue. Sure. Uh, we'll have one comment uh, if possible. We have some expert pediatric cataract surgeons here among the, uh, and then we'll have uh, the next last speaker, Dr. Daria. Uh, uh, any comments? Uh, uh, may I ask a yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Sian. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, uh, my question is for uh, Saurabh, and I would like to uh, learn your opinion, Saurabh, uh, about the use of toxin in combination with transposition procedure. And uh, we, we know that some of those patients may have been... Uh, I don't know if... Um... I think my voice was gone. Yeah, so, yeah, in the middle, but we heard uh, the question, yeah. Okay, so uh, I would like to learn your opinion about the use of toxin in combination with transposition. And I must say that I always uh, start with toxin injection in this group of patients as... Uh, both for symptomatic relief and then also to see, you know, if there's a very large deviations, they have secondary contracture problem. Yeah. And we know that these patients act, uh, actually have uh, um, uh, the convergence ability. So when you uh, let them to use their convergence effort, sometimes they may heal even with only toxin. I had a patient with uh, intractable diplopia who had, after three sets of toxin injections, he started diffuse and he was cured in total. So I, I'd like to learn your experience on those. Uh, thank you, Sayan. I completely agree. I think toxin can be absolutely valuable. I think we're going to do a toxin transposition. You really want to, I think I did do the toxin two weeks before the operation. Because I think doing the toxin on the, on the table, you're not really getting, as you say, in some cases, you just have a tight muscle and you toxin them. And it, it also gives you a chance to see if the other muscle is functioning. Maybe the MR has some function in it or just a 
Tai Teller, absolutely. So I think both as a temporizing measure as well as an adjunct, it, it is very useful. The problem is when, you know, suddenly you have people who want an operation and you just put a toxin and then, then you, I can't do anything for three months really to be re really sure of the effect. So we did a study looking at large angle sensory exotropes and we looked at them, you know, the effect of toxin at the same time as surgery. And we found long term, it didn't really make a difference. But I think in this group, which we're talking about, I think it can make a big difference, especially if you realign the mechanical forces and you give them some stereo and the brain can do the rest. So I think it's a very valid uh, use really of doing toxins. The problem with the INO group is, you know, getting them to come to hospital again and again and looking at the Jill Adams paper, the reasons that only five of them carried on with toxin was the difficulty of coming to hospital again and again to have the appointments, which is just one of the things to consider. But yeah, no, very, very valid uh, point of view. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Farooq, uh, you wanted to say something? Uh, Dr. Farooq had, a, had, had his hand raised and for the quick shot and then we'll go on to Dr. Tadia. Yeah, Dr. Farooq. Thank you. Um, actually, this is a comment and, and uh, to, to Dr. Sasekala's fantastic talk. Very comprehensive. It's just actually it was a in 10 minutes. I don't know if you could give any better overview on, on how, how to handle. There's obviously it's just a very complex problem depending on various problems. If it's a straightforward cataract versus many other things going on. Um, obviously, things do change. Um, one thing to Potentially underlying um, is, is through the IITA studies that we're now with the TIP study, that we're really understanding that um, the kids are not the same um, less than seven months, six months, and, and, and after six months and seven months. And, and I think um, obviously the IOL calculation is a big issue and that's a very different topic. Um, but even considering putting the IOL in the eye or watching for glaucoma is very, very different. Uh, I just want to kind of underline that as well as an addition, uh, although it was mentioned a little bit. Great talk. And, and for the Botox, if, if I may ask to, to Sehan, um, do you, uh, what percent do you do it in the clinic and what percent do you do it in the OR um, and, and how do you navigate through uh, the algorithm? Obviously, you have a different expertise. You do this much more common than, uh, than most, if not everybody, and, and maybe some tips in that. And, and one should be consider um, taking the patient to the OR uh, especially for obliques or a little bit tough to get uh, muscles. Um, any comments on that, please? Uh, thank you, Farouk. First of all, I don't use uh, toxin for the oblique muscles, starting from the uh, last uh, question. Sure. And uh, for those who can cooperate, uh, I, I, inject, I do the injection immediately after the examination. And in the uh, examination room in the outpatient clinic, and uh, so as I use it commonly, I always have my toxin in the uh, refrigerator. So uh, I, I tell about the, the, the patient about the, the problem and then uh, the, some drops were instilled and then I do the injection just after the uh, examination. So uh, the only group that I do the injection in the operating theater are the uh, small uncooperative children and uh, and the ones that I use toxin in combination with surgery. So uh, if I, I'm doing a recession plus toxin and then uh, that's the way. So otherwise I, I never do it as an open skyway or uh, it's not necessary to go through the um, exam, uh, the operating theater uh, if you don't need any anesthesia. Thank you. Do you have, do you uh, have any? Uh, Dr. Pradeep, we'll have the last, uh, one and then maybe if we get time in the end, Dr. Pradeep okay. has said and then. Yes, Dr. Ruit, I have a question for the Dr. Saurabh for yeah. the residual exotropia. And Dr. Saurabh, you are planning for the bilateral LR assistant or the step surgery? So I think we knew that this lady would need more than one operation. So I think the next step will be a bimedial resection. I think I've already done the LR recession. I found in my hands any more than eight millimeter LR recession. And they end up with the abduction limitation. And I don't want to add an abduction limitation to a person already with abduction limitation. So we've done bilateral LR of eight already. And I think we do a bimedial resection of 6.5 or 7 when she, when she comes back. Great. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Subhash, we'll go on to your talk. It's the last talk. Uh, not the uh, least, Dr. Subhash. Uh, Dr. Varsa wants to take, you can take comments. I will shortcut my talk. No, no, at talk, we'll, we'll have questions yes. at the end. It'll be better. We can yes. we can have uh, yes. maybe more questions then. Dr. Yes. Subhash, yes. on advances in amblyopia, he's a director professor at the Guru Nanakai Hospital at New Delhi. 
and extensive experience in managing amblyopia and strabismus. So uh, he's been the past president, secretary of the Strabismology Society of India. So Dr. Subhash is going to talk to us on advances in amblyopia. Thank you, Dr. Rohit, for your uh, nice introduction. Thanks, AIUS and APOS. So basically, mm. all of us are well aware about definition of amblyopia. So it is correctable if appropriate measures are applied at appropriate time. It is very important. For diagnosis of amblyopia, evidence of reduced visual activity, presence of amblyogenic factors, and there should not be any alternate cause for loss of visions. Treatment of amblyopia, there is questionable compliance, failure rate is high, treatment is challenging. Basic strategies are you present a clear retinal image to the amblyopic eye by eliminating the cause of visual deprivation and correcting visually significant refractive errors makes the patient to make use of amblyopic eye and you observe for recurrences. Various treatment modalities are effective correction only, patching, penalization, pharmacological therapy, near visual activities, video games, mobile games, effective surgeries, smart glasses. However, none of them is foolproof. So when to start amblyopia therapy, it is uh, always, uh, it should be uh, tried at the earliest, but better late than never. Which comes first, amblyopia or surgery? Classical teaching is amblyopia should be treated prior to surgical intervention and surgery should be preferably done within six months of successful amblyopia therapy. However, Lem et al. Uh, they suggested that performing surgery before completion of amblyopia therapy does not adversely affect motor or sensory outcome provided amblyopia therapy is continued post operatively Basically, most of the research on the treatment of amblyopia has been done by pediatric eye disease investigator group and Basically, they have focused on evaluating the comparative effectiveness of different amblyopia treatment regimes, and their results have dramatically changed the amblyopia clinical practice pattern for many eye care providers. So, basically, in ATS 5, uh, they aim to evaluate effectiveness of effective correction in moderate amblyopia, and they concluded amblyopia resolved in 27% of the patient, and improvement of more than two lines was seen in 77% of patients with effective correction only. So, what is the clinical implication of this study? So, refractive correction is pre-occlusion treatment phase of amblyopia. In some cases, occlusion and penalization may not be required. And secondly, the child starts with better visual acuity and hence better compliance. So, it is reasonable to start amblyopia treatment with proper refractive correction alone for young children with anisometropic, starbismic, and combined mechanism amblyopia and a follow-up should be done after six to eight weeks until improvement in amblyopic eye visual equity plateaus. Then occlusion, uh, there is no shortcut or substitute for occlusion in treatment of amblyopia and it forces the patient to use amblyopic eye. It inhibits inhibitory impulses arising from sound eye and it is best instituted in early infancy. Then ATS 2A and 2B work uh, done regarding the duration of patching and in ATS 2A it was concluded full time patching versus six time patching in severe amblyopia and the results were equivocal in both uh, the groups and in uh, moderate amblyopia they compared two hours patching with six hours patching and they concluded there is similar improvement in both the groups. So what is clinical implication of these studies? Full time patching is not always needed for a successful treatment outcome. Prescribing lesser amount of patching may promote better overall compliance with treatment. When patching is prescribed, it is reasonable to prescribe two hours of daily patching for moderate amblyopia and six hours of daily patching for severe amblyopia. And some children with severe amblyopia will respond to as little as two hours of patching. And in young children, using an adhesive patch should be strongly considered so that picking is not <laughs> likely to occur. There is no consensus over duration of patching, different authors have recommended different duration of patching. Full-time occlusion has been supported by many authors in the past. However, the popularity it commands among clinicians is not always shared by patients and parents. And major uh, failure to therapy is because of poor compliance. And hence, the recent trends are in favor of part-time occlusion because of better compliance. One-fourth of successfully treated amblyopic patients will experience a recurrence within first year of treatment. Hence, when children reaches a point where he or she is ready for suggestion of treatment, patching hours should be weaned before treatment is stopped. Carry home messages, don't stop the occlusion therapy abruptly. Various indications of penalization are moderate amblyopia in operative patients and isometropic amblyopia maintenance therapy. And advantages of penalization are there is no risk of uh, occlusion amblyopia, better correlated because of 
osmosis and comfort and chances of binocular stimulations are there so should we go for patching or penalization this issue was discussed in ats and in ats 1 they compared uh, the patching versus atropin penalization for treatment of moderate amblyopia in children of 3 to 7 year of age and they concluded both are appropriate modalities for initial treatment of moderate uh, amblyopia then in ats 4 daily uh, atropin was compared with weekend atropin and uh, they concluded weekend atropin produces an improvement in visual acuity which is similar to daily atropin and in ats 8 they compared weekend atropin augmented by planolens with weekend atropin along for moderate amblyopia and they concluded augmentation of weekend atropin with planolens does not substantially improve the visual acuity then ats uh, 9 and 11 were also conducted so what is the clinical implication of various studies using atropine atropine penalization has similar treatment effect as to and 6 hours of prescribed patching and hence now it can be used as first line treatment from lipia or for patching failure cases daily atropine administration is not necessary twice per week schedule is also effective and there is no reason to believe that atropine needs to be administered only on weekend days or Uh, that needs to be sequential weekend atropine penalization has shown to be effective in treating both moderate and severe amblyopia so however in indian circumstances we have to keep in mind the limitation of ats strict inclusion criteria hampered the study by including a limited number of patients methodology was not strict that i make making the results subject to many questions ethnic variation to treatment always remain a factor then is atropine safe in tropical countries and compliance was not monitored ob objectively in pedic group and therefore it makes harder to interpret the results then another important question is can amblyopia be treated in adults the answer is yes because regardless of persons of age the visual system which consists of eyes brain and visual pathway can be retained due to brain's plasticity and the visual skill that needs to be retained is binocular vision in ats 3 Uh, aim was whether amblyopia can be successfully treated in older children and they concluded treatment can improve visual equity in older children then these perceptual learning uh, and adaptive training uh, they have been tried but uh, their major drawback is uh, yet to gain widespread support tried in small number of patient long term follow up is lacking and they are most of the studies are lab based then <clears throat> levodopa carbidopa was thought to be a promising agent in augmenting conventional occlusion the speed up recovery of visual functions improves the uh, compliance decreases the duration and cost of treatment ats 14 and 17 were conducted regarding uh, uh, role of levodopa carbidopa and now the question is should we use levodopa in treatment of amblyopia pedic has shown that certain treatment modalities don't work and levodopa has been used for uh, resistant cases of amblyopia for years however the most of the recent studies found no improvement for amblyopia through use of levodopa and then dr hoyet et al has stated in reference to levodopa as an urgent therapy for treatment of amblyopia it should pursue us that it is time to move on 25 year of study has not produces a convincing body of data to justify its clinical use then in ats 6 near x was uh, done to determine whether performing near activities while patching from lipia and anses improvement in visual acuity and they concluded performing common near activities does not improve the visual outcome in treatment of amblyopia however there are a lot of other studies which are contrary to the recommendations of ats 6 the visual impairment is life long in amblyopia and the child dislike patch eye glasses drops using amblyopic eye so we have done a study regarding role of television games in treatment of amblyopia then why did we choose the television games because it is easily accessible in every household for the infants it enjoys in our daily life and fondness with which children watch it it is an effortless method of providing stimulus to amblyopic eye in children we have noted that there was improvement in distance visual acuity and near visual acuity in both the groups but was found to be better in television group uh, television game group and Though ours was a small pilot study, we recommend use of near visual activities in the form of television games along with full-time occlusion and treatment of myopia. And we have published in Journal of Star Business. Then in ATS 19, examiner laser surgery for an isometropic. Uh, this is ongoing study. We have done a thesis regarding role of LASIK in adult and isometropic uh, myopia. 
and basically home at all concluded that success rate in amblyopia due to an isometropia of more than 6 diopter was only 25% with conventional modalities and is directly related to degree of anisometropia so probable candidates for refractive surgery may be anisometropic uh, cases of anisometropic amblyopia more than 6 diopters conventional therapy failures com poor compliance estigmatism of more than 1.5 and poor visual acuity at the start of treatment but this should be tried as a last resort in our study uh, basically uh, we recommend lasik as an alternate uh, surgical modality in cases of adult and isometropic amblyopia where conventional therapy has failed then is there any role of mobile games another thesis was done from our centers why mobile games were uh, chosen because they are easily available in every household popular mode of entertainment entertainment and because loss of binocularity is one of the defining feature of amblyopia so now focus is shifted from monocular interventions to intervention that directly uh, target the binocular function this has led to increased interest in development of amblyopia treatment that directly address the binocular dysfunction by promoting binocular vision and reducing inhibitory interactions within the visual cortex so <clears throat> we recommend uh, uh, in our uh, thesis mobile game exercises as a form of near visual activity along with tours of vision allowed improvement in visual equity then video games have been uh, studied by others also in pedic uh, in 2015 they compared effectiveness of 1 hour uh, per day with 7 days week binocular game play to 2 hours per day uh, patching in children with, and they found no statistically significant difference in the groups at uh, 16 weeks dr dadia could you and in ats 18 binocular i, I that treatment was not as good as two hours of uh, prescribed daily patching then uh, i would like to summarize uh, regarding use of this binocular treatment of amblyopia a report by american academy there is no level of evidence to support the use of binocular treatment as a substitute for current therapies of amblyopia including patching and optic treatment then ats 21 and 22 are also uh, undergoing then amblyopia with eccentric fixation this is a new area of research uh, though conventional occlusion uh, uh, has been recommended by uh, wooden et al but there are certain uh, reports now that in these cases uh, if you go for inverse occlusion that is also equally effective then is there any role of omega fatty acids in treatment of amblyopia Uh, based on their antioxidant anti inflammatory neuroprotector and hepatic trophic stimulus and neuron differentiation effect of okay, dr dia could you conclude found, please uh, one uh, half minute okay uh, sure we did not found any uh, useful effect smart glasses uh, Uh, patching is most effective treatment, but has undesirable effects. And these smart glasses are ultra safe, proven efficacy. They are most advanced glasses for programmed intermittent occlusion. Good compliance prevent inverse amblyopia, and there are no side effects. But only thing is uh, uh, cost. So I would like to conclude. Conventional occlusion is still treatment of choice, although part-time occlusion is gaining acceptance after ATS reports. Penalization should be considered as an alternate line of therapy. Leave it to price. promising augmenting agent though uh, uh, long term results are not known but recent uh, results don't recommend uh, use of leotropa near exercises like television and mobile games are beneficial and lasik should be tried only in desperate cases of an isometropic amblyopia and smart glasses are area of future research thank you thank you thank you dr dadia excellent presentation a good rapid overview of amblyopia management dr varsha you had a comment we'll take one or two comments and we'll close dr varsha Uh, I was just uh, uh, interested in knowing whether anybody is uh, using injection bupi vacan uh, because madam was talking lot about uh, botox. So any panelist uh, is having any? We we tried the bupi vacan, uh, but unfortunately didn't find very great experiences with that. We even tried it uh, as has been recommended bupi vacan with botulinum toxin, and I personally thought that uh, the few cases we did. that probably the effect is more because of the botulinum toxin than because of the bupivacaine so not very uh, encouraging uh, experience dr sehan or uh, saurav anybody has any idea of yeah, experience i, I, I would you yeah, know i would agree with you rohit i mean the problem is it was described by alan scott as using 3% bupivacaine 
and we can't get that in the UK. Yeah. So I got 0.75% and you have to inject almost 1.52 ml of it, really. So you end up like a block. And as you quite rightly say, you know, it didn't really, I didn't really have a very good uh, uh, you know, uh, experience with it. I also have no experience with that because of the same reasons as Saurab. And the problem with Bupivacaine that it, uh, the effect is, uh, requires a very long time to develop. Uh, so that's also another problem. Dr. Leela had a comment. No, I just wanted to ask Dr. Sehan, a wonderful talk, uh, the session was very nice. And Dr. Sehan, uh, any ex uh, of late we have been seeing a lot of uh, non-accommodative acquired isotropia and we have been using uh, Botox in them. Do you have any experience and have you seen any permanent effect in these cases? Uh, thank you for uh, making this point. So uh, I, I also replied in the Q&A section that uh, I use botulinum toxin in those who had uh, acute uh, acquired isotropia because of long screen use, which has become a common problem in our time. So in those, uh, I, I have uh, good results. But, but for those who had uh, this problem in three years and four years, which is the, you know, the, the, the common type of acquired isotropia, toxin is not a, a, a my first choice. Uh, but for the other ones, uh, I always try toxin because these patients uh, usually have a good binocular function. But I must say that most of these patients also have uh, underlying monofixation syndrome problem. So that's why most of them do not have a high level of stereo uh, ability, at least uh, in my cases. So uh, despite a uh, good effect of botulinum toxin, uh, I had patients that I had to go on with surgery afterwards. But I also have patients who had a stable results. And, and the result is also uh, dependent on the uh, patient's way of life because some of them insist on uh, spending eight hours on, an, uh, on a mobile and so on. So. Thank you for making this, bringing this point. This, it, this has become a common problem of our time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. So, uh, yeah, Faru. Yeah, go ahead. Um, quick comment about amblyopia, such a uh, vast topic as we, we've all seen and, and uh, more to come and more to learn. And I think we're kind of scratching the surface or so even after uh, centuries of trying to take care of it. Um, I, I, a few comments that actually uh, does puzzle me. Um, just like the CVI, I think there's this great potential of neuroplasticity that we haven't tapped into yet. And uh, for example, we had a patient of, uh, who was a 46 year old, very reliable, actually NASA engineer um, that lost one eye um, um, to, due to glaucoma. So no light perception. So he's a full-time patching in the right eye. The other eye baseline vision was 20 over 50. Um, while we were discussing levodopa, somebody heard, we kind of started levodopa on this patient and in, in three to six months, his, his vision improved to, to 2030 and it was stable. So where do you put that? I mean, this is a very late and, and, and I think that one of the challenge, what I was trying to kind of bring is, and we all see this, there are patients that actually you, you have to patch full time to really gain a vision from 2030 to, 20, to 2025. And there are patients that actually have 2300 vision and you start doing patching for two hours and all of a sudden they get better. Where do you put these patients? Um, the comment that I'm trying to make is not everybody's the same, understanding that this is a little bit more complex and not assuming and not really starting with a cookie cutter approach is the way to go. It's good to know what's in our armamentarium and learning through different things. And, and unfortunately, I think, and I've been part of some orthopedic studies too, the, the limitation is how long we kind of follow the patients. The limitation is the selection bias that we just don't know that if you're even choosing the similar patients, again, lots to learn. And, and uh, these discussions will, will hopefully make us learn more, but compliance is the biggest issue, I think. True, Farooq. I mean, amblyopia is something, as you said, we're scratching the surface and, and levodopa is actually supposed to just increase the responsiveness of the nervous system. So it's supposed to work speed up the response. 
Of course, in your case, I, I would argue the other way that many cases have been reported that, you know, one eye, amblyopic eye, the other eye gets uh, traumatized. There have been reports that the previously amblyopic eye does get better. So I would say that, you know, the devil's alternative that after, you know, it was likely to get, five years, get after better. Five years of, so after five years of NLP, and the, okay. the only thing that changed in three months, six months, months the other, then you know that this is something okay. a little bit different. And yeah, true. Uh, like I said, something that was supposed to happen very gradually, maybe levodopa accelerated the process of sure. the you know visual system being more compliant to you know the effect that we're trying to do. Possibly, but as you rightly said, uh, there is still a lot we need to learn about amblyopia and and you know management. So vision development and maintaining vision and is in itself a huge topic to talk about. So any any comments before we close? I think we are. Uh, uh, we've overshot time tremendously. Dr. Namrata is here, the secretary of the AIOS, and I thank Dr. Namrata on behalf of no, all you, the panelists. It, it, it's okay, we have nothing after this. So yeah, thank yeah. you, Rohit, for doing <laughs> this. And uh, thank you, all the speakers, uh, for spending your uh, Saturday evening, at least in India, uh, for your time morning. and for your presence and for your contributions. Thanks, Atan. And thank you, Rohit, for organizing this pleasure and a great learning experience any any comments before we wrap up yeah love anyone still doing full time patching as a first choice not as a first uh, choice do dr love uh, uh. Uh, the uh, thing is in amblyopia i am an ardent supporter of full time patching and uh, i would recommend uh, that uh, full time if you will compromise on the patching you are compromising on the results but the thing is, uh, the recent, uh, these ATS reports and due to practical problems, uh, we are shifting to the part-time patching. So uh, basically only thing is compliance and other issues are concerned. Otherwise, uh, in those patients who can afford and uh, uh, in which uh, you can prescribe and child can compliance, the full-time patching should be done. So Actually, concept... we should have one hour session only on him. Yeah, true. I, I, I guess. So, Dr. Namrita is here. She'll, she'll, um, we'll ask her for another session on just amblyopia and so much to talk about. So, I think uh, we'll, we'll call it uh, a night for us and uh, good day to all over the world, afternoon, evening, mornings. And it was an absolute pleasure to be a part of this session. Amazingly insightful talks. I think each one of them gave us so much to take home. It was an amazing set of uh, talks, hugely enlightening discussion. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you, AIOS, for giving us the opportunity and APOS for uh, helping us to get these outstanding speakers who gave us some great insightful talks. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, uh, stay safe. Everybody, good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Thank you.